for Blue Cross Blue Shield in both the individual and small group market. And at this point, I'm going to um, name Michael Barber as the hearing officer for today's proceeding and turn the meeting over to Mike. Mike. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as you heard, I'll be serving as the hearing officer for today's hearing. The purpose of the hearing, as the chair said, is uh, is to take evidence and argument on um, Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Vermont's 2022 individual and small group rate filings. The docket numbers for these cases are GMCB-005-21 RR and GMCB-006-21 RR. Uh, representing Blue Cross today are Michael D'Onofrio and Bridget Acey. Uh, representing the Office of the Healthcare Advocate are Jay Angoff, Kylie Kuiper, and Eric Schulteis. I also want to recognize the board's attorney, Laura Beliveau, who will be conducting the direct examination of the board's contract actuaries, as well as, um, actually, I'm not sure if he's on yet. Um, Because we're holding this meeting remotely, uh, before I go any further, I want to make sure that um, everyone who will be participating um, can hear and be heard. So um, I'm just going to go around and call on people. And when I call your name, if you could please uh, just take yourself off of mute and make sh and confirm that that you can hear OK. Uh, so Mr. Chair. Crystal clear. Board member Holmes. Yes, I can hear. Board member Lunge. Yes. Board member Yusufer. Yes. Board member Pelham. Yes. Uh, Ms. Beliveau. Yes. Ms. Acey. Yes, I can hear, thanks. Mr. D'Onofrio. Yes, thank you. Mr. Angoff. I can hear. I hope everyone can hear me. Can. Ms. Kuiper. Yes, thank you. Mr. Schulteis. Yes, thank you. And Ms. Sears. Yes, court reporters here. Great. Um, so we are recording today's proceedings. Uh, we also have a court reporter here, Kim Sears. Um, to transcribe the proceedings and we will be providing uh, the parties with a copy of the transcript as soon as we receive it. It looks like we have um, 38 people attending this morning via Teams. Uh, because we are holding this uh, meeting remotely, we also designated the board's offices in Montpelier as a physical location where members of the public can go to hear and, and participate. Uh, for members of the public who are present, uh, we will be taking public comment at the close of the proceedings today. I can't say when that will be, um, not for a long time, I, for sure. I think someone's, uh, oh, yep, never mind. Um, so if you do not want to sit through, uh, hours of testimony um, uh, to provide a public comment uh, later today. We, we will have a meeting tomorrow, uh, tomorrow afternoon from four o'clock to six o'clock that is dedicated exclusively to uh, hearing from the public on these filings and the individual and small group filings uh, from MVP. Information about that meeting can be found by going to the Green Mountain Care Board's website and clicking on the rate review link. Um, and additionally, you, you, you can submit uh, written comments to the board via our website or by uh, regular mail or by emailing uh, Christina McLaughlin at the board. Uh, before we begin, I just want to remind the parties and the board members to exercise caution uh, with respect to information in the exhibit binders that's been marked as confidential as these matters can't be discussed in a public setting. 
if it becomes necessary to uh, discuss these confidential materials, we will need to go into an executive session and we have a separate phone line for that purpose if we need it. Um, generally speaking, the redact the the confidential material is marked in the binders with uh, either highlighting or unexecuted um, marked redactions. Uh, so moving to the binders, we we received um, exhibit binders on July 15th with 26 exhibits. As I understand it, all of those exhibits were stipulated to with the exception of uh, two Healthcare Advocate exhibits, uh, exhibit 24 and 25. And then on July 20th, we received three additional exhibits, 27 through 29, which I understand have also been stipulated to. Before we go any further, does anyone not have all 29 of these uh, exhibits? Great. Uh, so at this time, I assume neither party objects to me admitting uh, all of these exhibits, again, with the exception of 24 and 25 into evidence. Is that correct? No objection. Mr. Angoff. Jay, you're on mute. Sorry, no objection from the HCA. Thank you. Then I will admit uh, ex the exhibits with the exception of exhibit 24 and 25 in the evidence at this time. Um, and I believe we are going to deal with exhibits 24 and 25 during uh, during testimony, I assume, cross. Is that right, Mr. Angoff? I believe that's what we agreed to at the pre-hearing conference in this matter. OK, is there anything uh, that we need to. Discuss before we move to opening statements then. Michael, this is Tom. Um, you're coming in a little bit choppy every now and then, so if I turn my camera off, we have found that that uh, improves uh, the um, the voice. Uh, but so if, if if I disappear, it's because it's coming in choppy. If that's what it takes to have you here, that that's the important thing. OK, then let's move to opening statements. Uh, either Mr. D'Onofrio or Ms. Acey, do you want to proceed? Yes, thank you. Good morning, my name is Bridget Acey, and I, along with Mr. D'Onofrio, represent Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont in this matter. Good morning, Chair Mullen and members of the board. The past year and a half has been a challenging and difficult time marked by uncertainty, anxiety, and change. Throughout this period, Blue Cross has played a stabilizing role in Vermont's healthcare system. We helped providers stay solvent with cash advances. We offered payment flexibility to keep people insured, and we adapted our policies and programs to make sure our members could access care throughout the pandemic. We approached the pandemic the same way we approach our everyday work, by focusing on our commitment to Vermont and to our role as a partner with regulators and healthcare providers, pursuing a common objective, bringing high quality, affordable healthcare to Vermonters. Our rate requests in these markets this year reflects that same commitment. We have worked hard to bring the board and our members rate requests that are affordable and actuarially supported. If the individual and small group markets are considered together as they were in past years, our request is for an overall rate decrease of 1%. I want to emphasize some of the key points that you will hear from our witnesses today, Paul Schultz, Ruth Green, and Dr. Kate McIntosh about the rates we are requesting for 2022. First, we worked in partnership with the healthcare advocate in successfully advocating for unmerging the markets to make sure Vermonters will see the full benefit of the increased subsidies available under the American Rescue Plan Act. 
the small group market will see a significant decrease in their rates, averaging 6.2%. The business community has welcomed this news as evidenced by the Chamber of Commerce's letter asking the board to approve our rates. Further, if the board approves the rates in this market as recommended by Lewis and Ellis, the average net premium paid by Blue Cross members in the individual market will also decrease. Mr. Schultz will explain the details, but the bottom line is this is very good news for Vermonters, especially for those whose incomes before ARPA put them at or near the subsidy cliff. Approving the filed rates with the modifications recommended by Lewis and Ellis is the best way to promote affordability. Second, our rate request is the product of our continued efforts to promote cost-effective, high-quality care. As Mr. Schultz will also explain, Blue Cross has shared the board's concern about the rising cost of pharmaceuticals. Building on our long-standing efforts in this area, this month we launched our innovative Blue RX program in partnership with a new pharmacy benefit manager. The anticipated savings reduced the filed rates by 5.6%. Further, as both Ms. Green and Mr. Schultz will explain, Blue Cross has taken two other steps that directly benefit rate payers in this market and will be funded out of reserves. We have changed the way we allocate administrative costs in a way that reduces the amount for the individual and small group markets and thus reduces rates. In the short term, this change will draw on our reserves. We will also fund COVID costs for 2022 out of reserves. We expect to spend 11.9 million from reserves to cover COVID testing, treatment, and the change in administrative cost allocation. The healthcare advocate may point to Blue Cross's gains in this market last year to argue that the board should cut Blue Cross's contribution to reserves or otherwise reduce the rates in a way that neither actuary supports. However, our filed rates already account for last year's gains. We are using 11.9 million from reserves for the direct benefit of ratepayers in these markets. We kept our CTR target at 1.5%, our long-term target, even though at that level, we do not expect to recognize gains in these markets in 2022. We have done our part and we respectfully ask that the board recognize that in its review of the proposed rates. Mr. Schultz will also explain why cutting our CTR in the individual market would primarily benefit the federal government by reducing subsidies and would potentially make insurance more expensive for low-income Vermonters. Cutting CTR does not promote affordability, but it does draw down our reserves, reserves that should be used for the benefit of our members. The third point I want to emphasize, and the point where I will end, is that there are simply no significant disputes here. The board has heard from three actuaries, ours, the board's, and DFR's. The proposed rates are actuarially supported, and our modest CTR request is wholly appropriate given our solvency position and considered in light of the filed CTR for comparable insurers. We appreciate the fact that the healthcare advocate has focused its outreach this year on assisting more Vermonters to assign to sign up for insurance in light of the ARPA subsidy and eligibility enhancements. We share that objective and we hope to expand and increase our market share. But as Ms. Green will explain, we cannot grow without adequate reserves to protect against risk. Again, the proposed rates combined with ARPA's increased subsidies add up to good news for Vermont consumers. That is the most important message we can convey today. We urge the board to approve our requested rates with the minor modifications suggested by Lewis and Ellis and our proposed adjustment reflecting hospital budget submissions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Acey. Mr. Angoff. Yeah, good morning, Mr. Hearing Officer and board members. Um, since Monday, I've been struggling with the best way to, to uh, think about and talk about 2020. And what I've come up with is this. The carriers, in this case, Blue Cross, the carriers are trying to have it both ways. On the one hand, there's no question that 2020 was a unique year. 2020 was a year in which the carriers paid out much less than they had projected. And it's not fair to the carriers to have that as the baseline 
from all future rate increases because it was so low. On the other hand, it's also not fair to the public, to the insureds, to allow the carriers to keep all the money that they have received because the board approved rates based on their representations, their projections as to what would be the case in 2020. Now, uh, on Monday, I pointed out what I believe is the second most important document uh, in both proceedings, and that the second most important page, and that is the page from the uh, state health care exhibit, exhibit 15 in this proceeding, which showed what the loss ratios are on individual and small group business. You may remember that uh, MVP's loss ratio in New York was a was a 105. That is, they paid out a dollar five for each dollar they took in. In Vermont, in the individual market, it was 89. They paid out 89 cents for each dollar they took in. Blue Cross on the individual market in 2020 paid out 82 cents for each dollar they took in. So I said that's the most that that's the second most important page of the rate filing, which I pointed out, and I'm a little embarrassed that I did not point out the most important page of the rate filing. But member Yusufer did, and that is page ten of the rate filing, which shows not in loss ratio terms, not in insurance terms. But in simple terms that a business person would understand, which is how much money did the carriers make last year, in 2020 rather, in the individual and small group markets? And what it shows there on Exhibit 15, page 10, line, nine, page 10, line 11, is that in the individual market in 2020, you remember MVP made $2 million in Vermont lost a bunch of money in New York, but MVP made $2 million in Vermont. Blue Cross made more than $14 million in Vermont in the individual market. In the small group market, Blue Cross made about $11 million in Vermont. So the total that Blue Cross made in 2020 in the ACA market, the individual and small group market, was $25 million. That's not bad for a nonprofit company. And if you go to the page before this, before that page nine, and you just look at the, the uh, premiums earned line, do the arithmetic, that results in a rate of return on premium of more than 8% for Blue Cross for 2020. Um, which, which again is not bad for a nonprofit company. So I just ask that the board keep those numbers in mind in, uh, in listening to the testimony uh, in this proceeding. I believe I haven't gone through and look at, looked at every single year of Blue Cross's financials, but I believe Blue Cross, ironically, in the worst year for many of us in history, Blue Cross had its best year in history. And I just think that they ought to share some of that, not all of it, but they ought to share some of it with Vermonters. Now, I'll make one more point, which is this. You remember last year, there was a lot of discussion about what Blue Cross's uh, uh, RBC ratio would be at the end of 2021. And Blue Cross did these projections, which showed, they said, the most plausible range, they did five different assumptions, the most plausible range of their RBC ratio at the end of 2021 would be between 435 and 523. Now, I know that the RBC ratio, the current RBC ratio is non-public, so I'm not going to talk about this in opening statement, and I assume that we'll want to go into closed session to, to uh, discuss the RBC ratio, and I've got several questions about it. But to, to su suffice it to say, Blue Cross's RBC ratio 
is not today between the 435 and 523 that they told the board it would be last year. So uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, hearing officer and board members, and I look forward to the testimony. Thank you. Um, just so everyone, I think I've informed the board members about this, but just to remind you, we're going to do the order of testimony a little bit differently this year. Um, so it's going to be uh, Paul Schultz followed by Jackie Lee. <clears throat> so um, Bridget or Mike, uh, please call your first witness. Thank you, Mr. Barber. Um, I'd like to call Paul Schultz on behalf of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont. And just for identification for the record, I am Mike D'Onofrio, also representing uh, Blue Cross. Um, is everybody ready? We just uh, swear in Mr. Schultz. Of course. Mr. Schultz, could you please raise your right hand? <clears throat> Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, go ahead, Mr. D'Onofrio. Thank you. Paul, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me, Mike? I can, thank you. Please state your name and employment for the record. My name is Paul Schultz. I am Chief Actuary at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont. Did you prepare and submit pre-filed testimony in this proceeding? Yes, I did. And would you please identify that testimony by exhibit number in the binder? Yes, my July 6 pre-filed testimony can be found at exhibit 18. And my supplemental pre-filed testimony as of July 12th can be found at exhibit 21. Um, was all of the testimony contained in those two exhibits um, accurate and true to the best of your knowledge? Yes. And as you sit here today, um, has anything occurred between now and the submission of that testimony that would change that? No. Okay. Um, I'd like to ask you a few questions um, quickly about the filing. Uh, were you responsible for preparing Blue Cross's 2022 individual and small group rate filings, which are the subject of this proceeding? Yes, the filings were prepared under my supervision, and I am familiar with all aspects of the filings and the underwriting and the underlying rate development. And did you certify the filings? Yes, I did. At the time of filing, I certified that they met actuarial standards of practice and that they complied with all applicable state and federal laws and regulations. And that certification still holds true today. And were you responsible for preparing all of the information and responses that Blue Cross has provided to the various um, inquiries from Lewis and Ellis, the board's actuary, throughout this proceeding? Yes, those uh, that information as well was prepared under my supervision, and I am fully familiar with its contents. And same question with respect to the questions that were posed by the board itself and um, by the healthcare actuary through the board. Were you responsible for, the, for preparing all of that information as well? Uh, I was not directly responsible, but I am familiar with those items uh, and I'm prepared to speak in depth on some of the topics that they contain. Okay, would you please summarize the proposed rates reflected in this year's filings? Yes, as filed, Blue Cross requested a rate decrease of 0.9% on a combined basis. That consisted of a decrease of 7.8% for the small group market and an increase in gross premiums in the individual market of 7.9%. Could you just explain the term gross premiums? Sure, gross premiums are synonymous with filed rates. Um, and how, do, how does the term gross premiums interact with approved rates as opposed to filed rates? So one, once rates become approved, those will be the gross premiums. So as, as filed, gross premiums matched our filing. Uh, ultimately, what, what, what non-subsidized rate payers pay will be based, of course, on approved premiums. Thank you. Um, please summarize the key drivers that resulted in the rates proposed in these filings. Sure. 
especially pharmaceuticals, once again, are exerting a strong upward impact on rates. Uh, in this year, they accounted for about 4.2% of upward impact on rates. Uh, that's inclusive of 0.6% for a life changing therapy for one member. Um, especially pharmaceuticals uh, are life saving drugs in many cases or life altering drugs. And in many cases, uh, they improve long term affordability, but they are very expensive. Uh, and in the absence of state or federal legislation that would curtail the cost of these drugs, we must include those high costs in rates. This is an instance where we are uh, preferring access to care and prioritizing access to care over affordability. Uh, there were two significant events that have led to decreases in rates and are leading to the historic decrease in premiums that we filed this year. First of all, as Ms. AC mentioned, Blue Cross has long shared the board's concern with the ever rising cost of pharmaceuticals. The latest in a long series of actions we've taken to attempt to curtail those costs was the launch earlier this month of Vermont Blue RX in partnership with a new pharmacy benefit manager. Um, those efforts reduced premiums by about 5.6%, uh, which it's about $15 million based on current enrollment. Secondly, we noted a significant shift in morbidity from the 2019 to the 2020 population. When we compare those populations, we can see even after adjusting for the pandemic, the 2020 population used far fewer medical services than did the 2019 population. Uh, that was offset partially by the fact that the 2020 population much more heavily utilized prescription drugs. On a net basis and in conjunction with a favorable risk adjustment settlement, uh, morbidity improvements from 2019 to 2020 decreased premiums by a further 4.6%. And are you able to quantify that 4.6% in dollars approximately? I, I don't have that in dollars since 5.6% is was worth $15 million on today's membership, 4.6%. Uh, should be worth in the neighborhood of $13 million. Thank you. Mr. Schultz, have you had a chance to review Lewis and Ellis's analysis of the filing, which is exhibit 16 in the binder? Yes. Could I direct you to page 23 of that exhibit? Yes, turning there and I have it. Um, do you see the recommendations made by Lewis and Ellis on that page? I do. Does your supplemental pre-filed testimony, which is exhibit 21, you don't need to turn to it. Um, uh, does your pre-filed testimony regarding these recommendations still accurately reflect Blue Cross's position with respect to these items? Yes, it does. Um, and what is Blue Cross's position with respect to each of these recommendations? Uh, we agree that all of these recommendations should be made. Should now, changes should be made. Thank you. Take a take a look at the first one, the first recommendation, and just read that into the record so everybody, we're sure everybody's on the same page. If updated information regarding unit cost trends are known at the time of the board order, LD recommends updating the assumed unit cost trends in the 2022 premium rate calculations. The impact of such a change cannot be estimated at this time. And again, Blue Cross agrees with that recommendation, correct? Yes, we do. And have you estimated um, the update? Have you used the updated hospital budget information to um, uh, to revise anything about the proposed rates in light of that recommendation? We have, and that is, I believe, Exhibit 29. Thank you. Um, so that work is summarized in Exhibit 29, correct? That's correct. And can you just explain what you did as reflected in, in Exhibit 29, how you performed this analysis? Yes, so the hospital budgets that um, hospitals submitted on July 1st have been posted to the Green Mountain Care Board website. 
so we combed through those budgets and we pulled out the requested commercial rate increases from each hospital. Uh, uh, we know that submitted hospital budgets are not often approved as filed by the Green Mountain Care Board, at least in total. And so we make assumptions as to what actions the Green Mountain Care Board will take uh, relative to the hospital budgets. Uh, what we assumed this year is that the very high budget increases requested by the University of Vermont Health Network would be reduced by one and a half percent by the board. Uh, we came up with that number by looking at past years where the health network also submitted uh, kind of outlyingly higher rates. We also submitted that, we, we also assumed that for other hospitals, the board would collectively reduce those budget requests by a half a percent, again, keeping with past practice. So we applied those numbers to the submitted commercial rate increases uh, and applied the result, uh, fed that into our unit cost trend models, and then allowed those to feed through to premiums. And what we found is that because the hospital budget submissions are so much higher uh, than they were in than we were in the, as we assumed in the rate filing, that even with those fairly significant Green Mountain Care Board assumed cuts, uh, rates nonetheless increase by about 0.2% from what we had in the, in the original filing. Would you please summarize where the proposed rates end up as a result of that work? Sure, so after including all of the L&D recommendations, including the hospital budget uh, changes that I just discussed, the overall increase that we're requesting, uh, shouldn't say increase because it's in fact a decrease of 1%. And that is comprised of a 6.2% rate decrease for small group and an increase in individual gross premiums of 5.2%. And are those requested premiums that you just described um, reflected in Exhibit 29? Yes, they are. You can find those on the revised Exhibit 9B within Exhibit 29. And do those figures that you just explained represent Blue Cross's final rate request for the 2022 ACA markets? Yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. I want to ask you a few questions about the um, American Rescue Plan Act, which I'll refer to as ARPA. Okay. So do you recall that in your July 6th pre-filed testimony, so your first round of pre-filed testimony, you addressed the impact of the Vermont legislature's decision to split the individual and small group markets and the increased federal subsidies made available to participants in those markets thanks to the ARPA? Yes. Um, okay, and in light of the market split and in light of those, the changes in um, subsidy amounts and subsidy eligibilities made by ARPA, which participants in Vermont's ACA markets will, will end up paying the gross premiums that you spoke about earlier? Uh, only people spending above the subsidy thresholds will pay the full gross premium. Uh, those numbers are about $95,000 for a single individual and $265,000 for a family of four. Uh, that represents less than a third and perhaps significantly less than a third of the individual subscribers enrolled with Blue Cross. Um, Mr. Schultz, in that answer, you said you, you said uh, Vermonters spending those amounts. Just to make the I'm record sorry. clear, could you clarify what you meant? Yes, I, I meant to say Vermonters earning those amounts. Okay. Um, so, how did the split of the two of the individual and small group markets impact gross premiums in the individual market? They increased gross premiums in the individual market. In the case of Blue Cross, uh, the split increased premiums by about six percent. Now, are you familiar with the term net premiums? Yes, I am. Net premiums are the, that would be the difference between the gross premium uh, or the, the approved rates and the subsidies that are available through the federal government and, and from the state of Vermont. Okay. 
On um, how are those subsidies that you just mentioned calculated? The federal and state subsidies on what They're basis? Cal I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry. I should have just stopped talking. Please. They're, they're calculated on the basis of a benchmark plan. Uh, the benchmark plan is defined as the second lowest cost silver plan offered on the exchange. And at this point in time, are you able to definitively identify which plan will be the benchmark plan for these rates? I can't, and that's because there are two plans, one offered by Blue Cross and the other offered by MVP that are very close in premium based on the Lewis and Ellis recommended rates. So depending on what action the board takes in both dockets, uh, will determine which of those two plans becomes the benchmark plan. Now, even though you're unable to identify which, which specific plan will be the benchmark, are you able to make any conclusions about the net premiums that Blue Cross members will pay? Uh, yes, we can. So uh, we, we can't make an exact calculation, um, both because we, we do not have the, the final approved rates from the Green Mountain Care Board at this time, and because we don't have income information from members who directly enroll with Blue Cross. Um, but nonetheless, we, we can do some calculations and we can determine that individual rate payers who enroll with Blue Cross will on average also have a decrease in their net premium and perhaps a substantial one. So, so given the interplay between the two carriers rates in, in the way that you just described, um, along with the federal and state subsidies that you just testified about, what can you conclude about um, any ordered reductions to gross premiums in the individual market that go beyond l &E's recommendations? So here too, we can't do an exact calculation because of those two unknowns. We don't know what the final ordered rates are going to be, and we don't have income information on directly enrolled members. Um, but we, we can make some assumptions. So we can use the recommended Lewis and Ellis rates before applying any sort of changes for hospital budgets, because those, those are known in both filings. And we can make an assumption about the directly enrolled Blue Cross population. Uh, so for simplicity, we assumed that half of that population would be below the threshold, that's the new subsidy thresholds, and half of the population would be above the new subsidy thresholds. And those thresholds, again, are $95,000 of earned income for an individual, $265,000 for a family of four. So based on those parameters, we can estimate that any further reductions to rates of every dollar of further reduction, 80 cents of that would go to the federal government in, in the form of reduced subsidy payments to Vermonters. The remaining 20 cents would go to the higher income Vermonters earning above the subsidy thresholds uh, who would have their gross premiums reduced. In the meantime, the lower income Vermonters, those who are eligible uh, for subsidies all the way up to those new levels that I discussed, would at best have their net premiums unchanged. And for most further reductions, many lower income Vermonters would actually pay a higher net premium. So, so in your view, how would reductions of that type, and by that I mean reductions beyond those recommended by uh, Lewis and Ellis, um, how would that affect affordability of these rates? So that it would make, afford make things less affordable, both for current policyholders who are lower income um, and also for future policyholders who would have their policyholder reserves depleted primarily for the benefit of the federal government. Um, and Mr. Schultz, the, the information and analysis you just testified about is set out in your pre-filed testimony, right? That's correct. Um, if you would take a look at Exhibit 18, your July 6th pre-filed testimony, just very quickly, I just want to make sure everyone knows where it's available. Um, I'll direct you to page seven, line seven, and ask if that information and analysis begins there. Yes, that's right. And then in exhibit 21, your supplemental pre-filed, 
Um, does the kind of the parallel information appear there at page three, line one, or at least begin at that point? It, it does. So the information in uh, Exhibit 21 is updated for the Lewis and Ellis recommended rates. The Exhibit 18 information was based upon rates as filed. So the, the Exhibit 21 information is the more current. Thank you. Um, so in, in light of the testimony you've been giving over the past few minutes and the analysis laid out in your um, pre-filed testimonies, what rate action should the board consider here in the individual market? I believe the board should approve rates as recommended by Lewis and Ellis. Um, if they do otherwise, those further rate reductions make rates less affordable for many lower income Vermonters. I'd like to um, move to a different topic to, uh, I'll call them historical results in these markets. So if you could turn to exhibit one, page six in the binder, please. I'm there. Um, please explain what the table at the top of that page represents. Sure. So this table shows historical financial performance for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont in the ACA market. Um, and it includes 2020, uh, which Mr. Angoff addressed in his opening remarks. So I, I want to describe um, what this table shows us, and I'll talk a little bit as well about how it is more informative than the information you'll find in financial statements. But first, I'll address the columns. Um, so again, I'm at the, the top of page six of exhibit one. Uh, year and member months are self-explanatory. Filed contribution to reserve also means exactly what it says. That's the contribution to reserve that was included in Blue Cross's initial rate filing for the year in question. The approved contribution to reserve is the expected CTR that we calculated after Green Mountain Care Board rate action. And that number can be lower than the filed CTR for, for one of two reasons. One is the Green Mountain Care Board in some years directly reduced the CTR, and that would be reflected in the approved contribution to reserve. Secondly, the Green Mountain Care Board in certain years uh, diverged from their actuary's recommendations and made cuts to other assumptions that were not actuarially supported. Um, the cuts were not actuarially supported. The, the assumptions, of course, were. Um, so that leads us to the, the calculated approved contribution to reserve, which is really what we expected the result to be. Uh, then we have the actual contribution to reserve. Now, these numbers are going to be different from the numbers that you find in our financial statements, uh, and that's for one very good reason. In our financial statements, there are uh, items that sometimes are paid in a certain calendar year that arose because of things that took place in a previous calendar year. Um, for example, the uh, back in 2015, we received a favorable adjustment to 2014 transitional reinsurance of $4 million. We took that $4 million out of 2015 results and put it in 2014 results because that's when it actually arose. Another recent example, uh, is the, the risk corridor settlement that we recently received, um, which again, even though we received that during 2020, we allocated it back. Did I change my shirt? Some, someone, needs to mute, uh, someone needs to mute their line. We're getting some extraneous conversation. Sorry to interrupt. I'll refrain from making a comment on the shirt. Um, <laughs> So the risk corridor dollars did not, were not reflective of 2020 results. We did receive that money in 2020. It flowed through our financial statements in 2020, but that money arose in 2015 and 2016. And so for this exhibit, we allocated it back to those two years because those are the financial results that were driving that settlement amount that we received. Uh, similarly, uh, we're currently involved uh, in a in CSR uh, litigation. We expect to receive a settlement, but we haven't yet received those funds from the federal government. 
Nonetheless, those funds are included in this chart, and that impacts the 2017 results and the 2018 results. Even though it, for financial statement purposes, those funds will be reflected in the year in which they are received. But it's more informative if we want to assess actual financial performance, it's more informative to do that on the basis of when these items occurred rather than when the cash actually changed hands. Thank you. So does this table reflect uh, final 2020 information? It does not. This reflects 2020 information as known at the time of filing. Since that time, we received final information on 2020 risk adjustment, um, and that was more favorable than what we had included in original 2020 financials. That money will flow through uh, 2021 financials because that's when uh, it, it's actually going to be received or we became aware of what the new amount was. Um, but really, that was a 2020 item. So when we incorporate that additional $3.7 million into the 2020 results, we end up with an actual CTR of 6.4% rather okay. than the 5.2% that you see on the page. Thank you. So we'll, we'll address the 2020 CTR in a bit more detail in a moment. Um, first, can you just quickly explain why the actual CTR for 2020 significantly is, exceeds the approved? Sure, there were two factors. Uh, obviously, the pandemic took place and that did have the impact of reducing claims uh, during 2020. Secondly, and, and actually the larger of the two factors was the morbidity shift that I had discussed earlier. Okay, so we'll come back to that in a minute. I just want, first I wanna ask you, um, you mentioned it a moment ago, does this table include the anticipated income from the risk corridor litigation and the CSR litigation? Um, that uh, th that Blue Cross was involved in? Yes, it includes both items. Okay. What can you conclude when you compare the approved and actual columns of the table? Uh, so I can see a few things. First and foremost, I can see that my team was incredibly accurate in projecting future costs when we look from at the period from 2017 to 2019. For those three years, we were never off by more than three quarters of a percent uh, for any single year. Um, if And I can also observe that we had erred on the side of rates that were more affordable than what actual results would have dictated. So how have how have the board's um, rate reductions since 2016 impacted Blue Cross's RBC? Uh, because we've been so accurate in projecting rates, every cut that the board made to our CTR uh, has had the impact of creating inadequate rates and depleting RBC. And so when that sort of shortfall results, um, who, when rates are inadequate, who covers that shortfall? Uh, Vermont ratepayers do. Um, when rates are inadequate, it reduces our RBC, um, which has been ordered to be within a certain range by the Department of Financial Regulation, our solvency regulator. So in as much as RBC is depleted, it must be replenished in future years through higher rate increases. So in this way, we can see that rates that are inadequate this year uh, payment for that must be borne by future ratepayers. So does that dynamic enhance affordability? It does not enhance affordability. All, all these uh, rate cuts below actuarial levels do is to shift costs from current policyholders to future policyholders. And does that dynamic provide Blue Cross with any sort of competitive advantage? It does not. Uh, Blue Cross needs to be in a financially stable position in order to invest in the types of innovative solutions that will actually bend the cost curve by improving health outcomes uh, and ultimately lowering cost. So when reserves are compromised, the capital to invest in those projects is either reduced or eliminated. Uh, and we may not be able to in invest in those types of projects that reduce costs, benefit ratepayers, and ultimately improve our competitive position. 
So let's now circle back to 2020 for a moment. As you noted, Blue Cross's actual operating gains far exceeded the target CTR for 2020. Mm -hmm. What happened? Yeah, I'll highlight two of the major items. Uh, first and foremost, of course, was, was COVID-19 happened. Uh, and we have calculated the impact of COVID-19 was uh, on a net basis throughout all of 2020 was to decrease claims by about $5.8 million. Uh, the second thing that happened was, again, the, the population morbidity shift. We can see that members who left Blue Cross in open enrollment from 2019 to 2020 were very expensive. Uh, as a result, the remaining population for 2020 uh, had much lower morbidity than did the 2019 population. Uh, that morbidity shift had an impact of lowering claims by about $11.6 million in 2020. Thank you. Um, so, so in light of in light of the operating gains that occurred in 2020, isn't it appropriate to cut the 2022 CTR, um, given that the actual 2020 CTR exceeded the approved 2020 CTR? No, it's not. And the reason for that is that Blue Cross has already taken action uh, in that regard. As I uh, testified in my July 6 testimony. Uh, there are two items that Blue Cross is funding out of policyholder reserves and not putting in premium for 2022. The first of those are the expected COVID costs, the direct COVID costs that we expect in 2020. Um, the second of those is that we allocated less administrative cost to these lines of business uh, for 2022. The combined impact of those two items that we have not put in premiums is $11.9 million that we're returning uh, to ratepayers. So any further cuts to CTR would be both duplicative and harmful to Blue Cross's solvency and therefore to future ratepayers. Mr. Schultz, could you um, flip to um, page nine of exhibit one? And I want to point you to section 1.8. Okay. Which is, that's the section that addresses the Vermont statutory rate review criteria, right? Yes. And do you see there's a there's a quote from 8 VSA section 4062A3, kind of just below the middle of the page? I see it. Um, would you just actually just read from the beginning of section 1.8 through the end of the quote, please? Okay. Uh, when reviewing a proposed rate, the Green Mountain Care Board must consider whether a rate is affordable, promotes quality care, promotes access to health care, protects insurer solvency, and is not unjust, unfair, inequitable, misleading, or contrary to the laws of this state. And in your professional opinion, are the rate, the proposed rates, the current final proposed rates, um, reflecting LNE's recommendations inadequate? They are not. Excessive? They are not. Unfairly discriminatory? No. Reasonable in relation to the benefits provided? Yes, they are. Unjust, unfair, inequitable, misleading, or contrary to law? No. Are they affordable while promoting quality care and access to care? Yes, they strike the best balance available among those interrelated criteria. And do they protect Blue Cross's solvency? Yes. Um, just a couple more questions, uh, Mr. Schultz. Um, how are you able to conclude that these rates strike that appropriate balance among the affordability, quality, and access criteria? Well, I can reach that conclusion by taking a look at our cost of insurance. Uh, these premiums are composed of three elements. Uh, first are Taxes and fees, those are set by government. We have no control over those. Uh, second are claims costs, which are essentially the amount providers are paid to provide care to policyholders. Um, so Blue Cross does participate in all of the state's initiatives uh, for healthcare reform and to attempt to bend the cost curve. And we develop our own programming as well. But ultimately, this is a financial mechanism. 
where Blue Cross, Blue Cross takes in uh, premium payments from policyholders and then moves that money to providers uh, for the cost of the care that they provided to those same policyholders. So that leaves us with the cost of insurance, which I would define as administrative costs, uh, contribution to reserves, and profit. And when we look at those three, three things, and of course, Blue Cross is a nonprofit, we can see that our cost of insurance is among the very lowest in the industry. Um, what's medical loss ratio? Uh, medical loss ratio, and it's in sort of the simple definition, is claims as a percentage of premiums. Uh, the ACA has a somewhat more complicated definition um, that, that tends to have a slightly higher result than, the, than sort of that simple uh, definition. But the ACA MLR, or medical loss ratio, uh, measures what cost of insurance uh, carriers charged in the market. And they've defined that the, the MLR, which is essentially the flip of the cost of insurance. If we ignore taxes and fees, an MLR of 80% equates to a cost of insurance of 20%. Um, so what the rules are in the ACA market is that an, if an issuer has an MLR of lower than 80%, meaning they have a cost of insurance of higher than 20%, that's considered to be excessive and all those funds must be returned to ratepayers in the form of a rebate. So what is um, what is the recent and projected level of ACA MLR refunds? So based on a Kaiser Family Foundation study of the market, uh, they found that issuers paid $1.4 billion of refunds in 2019 and nearly doubled that to $2.5 billion in 2020. Uh, furthermore, they expect issuers to pay 2021 rebates, again, that exceed $2 billion. Uh, Blue Cross, in contrast, has never paid a rebate uh, in the ACA market, and we don't expect to pay a rebate in, in 2021 or 2022 either, and that's for the simple reason that our cost of insurance is so low. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. Uh, Mr. Hearing Officer, may I have a moment to um, consult with co-counsel and determine whether I have any more questions for Mr. Schultz? Yeah, why don't we take uh, take five minutes and reconvene at um, three after nine. Thank you very much. Have some break. It's 9.03. Um, just want to make sure the court reporter is with us. Ms. Sears, are you? Yes, I am available. Great. Uh, so we're back on record uh, in Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont's 2022 individual and small group rate filing hearing. Uh, Mr. D'Onofrio, do you have any further questions for Mr. Schultz? Thank you, Mr. Barber. I have just one question. Uh, Mr. Schultz, could you please flip back to page six of exhibit one to the table? Okay. I'd like to point you to footnote two. Um, if you could read footnote two into the record. And then my question is, does that um, refresh your recollection and cause you to change any testimony you gave earlier about the risk corridors payment? Sure. Um, so footnote two reads risk corridor receivables uh, and it lists the amounts for 2014 through 2016 respectively, uh, totaling uh, about $10 million. These amounts are not included in the actual operating gains and losses in this table. And that, that does refresh my, my recollection. So we, we removed uh, the risk corridor amounts from 2020. Uh, we chose not to add them back into this table because it, the table would then not reflect the actual financial performance 
um, back in 2014 through 2016. And what I mean by that is that the performance is what it was. It, it reflects these numbers that were on the page. Um, but the federal government, by virtue of the risk corridors program, um, footed the bill for a portion of those gains or losses in the three years. Thank you. Um, I have no further questions. Thank you, um, Mr. Hearing Officer. Thank you. Mr. Angoff, do you have questions for Mr. Schultz? Yes, I do. Good morning, Mr. Schultz. Good morning, Mr. Angoff. Um, I'm afraid you understand the risk Carter litigation and the CSR litigation better than I do. Can you explain the difference between those uh, two, uh, two litigation matters? Um, I'll, I'll do my best. So risk corridors had to do with one of the initial three R's of the federal ACA program. Uh, risk corridors were a temporary program uh, that um, basically were in the, the federal government was would share in some of the gains or some of the losses that took place in the ACA market. Uh, it's very similar to a risk corridor program that has existed for many, many years with Medicare Part D. Um, unfortunately, what happened with that program is that in, insurers kind of nationwide had underpriced premiums uh, in, in the years in question. Um, so this result is would have resulted in significant losses for the federal government. And I'm, I'm kind of summarizing as best I can. I wasn't directly involved in the litigation, so I, I, I probably can't opine on what the, the federal government was trying to do. Um, but, but they were arguing that the, that the risk corridor program needed to be uh, net neutral, so not I increasing the costs to the federal government. And so they failed to make risk corridor payments. Uh, they made no payments at all in 2015 or 2016, and they made limited payments in 2014. Um, there were a number of lawsuits about this, as you as you might imagine. And uh, in our case, the lawsuit was, was recently uh, settled in our favor and we received a payment of about $10 million uh, during 2020 uh, that was for those risk corridor payments that were due to us for the years 2015 and 2016. Uh, CSR is a little bit different. CSR, um, the, the Trump administration decided to stop paying CSR in late 2017. Um, CSR, you know, before we had uh, what's commonly referred to as silver loading, um, CSR payments were made so that uh, we could increase benefits for lower income members without increasing the premiums because the federal government was funding the cost of those enhanced benefits. Uh, so when the federal government stopped making payments, um, issuers in, in 2017, uh, weren't collecting, you know, they were still make, they were still providing the benefits that they had promised, but they were no longer getting this money from the federal government. Uh, so again, this brought out another round of lawsuits, um, and we expect to receive payment from the federal government for our, um, excuse me, for our uh, uh, risk court, I'm sorry, for the CSR payments that they failed to make to us for both 2017 and 2018. Uh, because for both years, those payments were, were not in our premiums. Thanks. That's very helpful uh, with this in connection with the CSR litigation. Do you have an estimated amount of what Blue Cross um, is to receive? I, I don't have it on the top at my fingertips. Uh, I, I believe it's Ms. Ruth, uh, Ms. Green will be able to testify to that exact amount. I, I think it's in the range of, again, uh, $8 million or something like that. And so is, is that is the CSR litigation recovery amount, is that reflected in this year's rate filing? The CSR recovery amount is reflected in our projection of RBC, which informs the contribution to reserve component of this year's rate filing. OK, and the 10 million that you mentioned in connection with the risk Carter litigation, where, if at all, is that reflected or was that reflected? That is also reflected, well, that was reflected in our RBC as of December 31st, 2020, and therefore it is also reflected in our projections of RBC. Uh, and again, those that our solvency position informs the CTR that we request, which was one and a half percent this year. Okay, so, so 
it, so is, is, are those amounts, either of those amounts uh, reflected in the rate base in your rate filing? No. Um, you, uh, when you were discussing with uh, Mr. D'Onofrio, the, uh, the net premiums that would be paid by uh, Blue Cross members, all, all your answers assumed, didn't they, that the board would approve both your Blue Cross's and MVP's rate filing as, uh, as amended by l &E, correct? Yes. Um, could you please turn to, oh wait, let, let me, let me just clear this up. We were, uh, you were talking with Mr. D'Onofrio about, uh, the table on page six of, uh, exhibit one. You recall yes. that? Okay. And he brought to your attention, uh, footnote two. And I just want to make sure that I understand and the board understands the the amounts that are listed in actual operating gains in the right hand column. Those amounts do not include the risk card of receivables that are set forth in footnote two. Correct. That's correct. Okay. Um, could you please turn to exhibit 15 page 10. Okay. Okay, and you see there down on line 11 in a row 11 underwriting gain. Yes. You see that? And opposite that in column one and column two, you see 14, a little over 14 million for individual and a little and almost 11 million for small group. Do you see that? I do. Okay. First, could you explain what under what an underwriting gain is? Uh, so in accounting terms, the underwriting gain is is basically um, revenues less expenses. Okay, and it, it doesn't include investment income, correct? Um, that that is correct. It does not include investment income. Okay, and is there a difference between underwriting gain and underwriting profit? Uh, I'm not familiar with the term underwriting profit. Have you ever heard the term underwriting profit? Uh, not to my recollection. You, you've never heard the term underwriting, okay. Um, uh, is this, uh, is the $14 million plus in the individual market, is that, uh, that was your underwriting gain in 2020. How, if at all, is that reflected in your individual rate filing uh, for 2022? Uh, it's reflected in several ways. Uh, certainly not all of it is reflected. As I pointed out earlier, there are some key differences between accounting results and what I might call experience results. So the numbers on this page do include that $10 million risk corridor settlement that we were discussing earlier. Uh, so that $10 million payment had nothing to do with 2020 operating results. So that $10 million uh, replenishes RBC that was lost back in 2015 and 2016. We had some losses and the federal government was kind enough to repay us for a portion of those losses, which is great because that means that future ratepayers don't need to make up for those losses, the federal government in part did so. Uh, so that's great news. So there were also a few other prior period items in here. For example, um, there's always claims run out activity uh, is the term that I'll use. So there are claims that took place in 2019 that we did not pay. And in many cases, we were not even aware of by the, by the end of 2019. Um, we didn't pay them until 2020. So 
we include an estimate of what those claims are going to be a year end, but in as much as claims come in different from that, that will impact the accounting result. But again, that doesn't really impact the 2020 operating result. So uh, it, it's a it's a little difficult to compare uh, the numbers in the accounting results to what we do in the in the rate filing. In the rate filing, we begin with actual experience, and that includes all of the runout claims and so forth. We begin with a view of what actually took place for the coverage that we provided in 2020. That's our starting point. So because it's our starting point, many of these gains are reflected directly in the 2022 premiums. I'll refer you back to my testimony about the, the uh, morbidity change that we experienced. We assume that that morbidity change won't just disappear. Uh, we believe that the morbidity change that took place in 2020, we have evidence that that same population persisted into 2021. And we have assumed that it will again continue to persist into 2022. And so we have reduced premiums for 2022 by 4.6%. And that's I don't have the exact number, but that's in the neighborhood of $13 million um, you for, said, for what we've observed there. I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry to uh, the other thing I want to point out, that the final way we've reflected is I gave testimony about the amounts that we're funding through reserves. We're funding $11.9 million through reserves. And the reason we're able to do that is because we did experience these gains, including that risk corridor settlement in 2020 which served to increase reserves. As a result, we are able to offer rate relief of another $11.9 million to 2022 policyholders. So I, I would I would say to you, Mr. Angoff, that these gains are fully reflected in the um, 2022 rates that are before you. So that, are, are you saying then that, that, that that 14 million does not go into surplus? It does go into surplus. Okay, let me ask then, you. Go. I'll stop there. Yes, it no, does go I'm, into surplus. I shouldn't be interrupting you. If you go ahead, it, it does go into surplus. And again, we are using eleven point nine million dollars of that surplus to directly decrease these twenty twenty two rates. Okay. Um, you said that of that fourteen million plus ten million is a risk card or settlement. Did I get that right? It's ten million of the combined market. Uh, recall that Vermont had a combined market. Uh, up, up until uh, this year, well, until 2022 by this year, I mean, the, the rates that are in front of us. So the 10 million was for both individual and small group. I don't have a split of what would be individual and what would be small group. That, that's okay. Could you show me where that that amount or those amounts are reflected in the supplemental health care exhibit? Object to the form. Could you, Jay, could you clarify what you meant by those amounts? Yeah, Mr. Schultz said that the, uh, 10 million of that 14 plus 14 million plus uh, are risk card or settlements. And I'm, I'm just asking him if he can point to the place in the supplemental health care exhibit, which shows where those risk card or settlements, the total, uh, according to Mr. Schultz, 10 million are reflected. I'm not an expert in the financial statement, so I'm, I'm not able to answer that question. I'm, I'm sure that Ms. Green will be able to offer testimony on that point. Okay, I will ask Ms. Green. Uh, could you turn to back to exhibit one? And go to page four. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then in the little chart, you see trend component. The first line is restatement of 2020 to 21. Restatement of 2020 to 21. Does that mean that you assumed a higher tr trend for 2020 to 21 than turned out to be the case? Uh, we we don't know yet because 2021 hasn't entirely taken place. So what it means is that we are using a lower trend assumption in this year's filing than we used in last year's filing. Okay. And then 
additional additional year of medical utilization of 1.5 percent. What is the year for which that 1.5 percent applies? So this is a comparison. You know, this is trying to get us from last from the 2021 rates to the 2022 rates. And what we mean by an additional year of trend is that it is just that we rather than trending everything to 2021, we're trending it to 2022. So this is the, the additional year from 2021 to 2022. Um, Mr. Hearing Officer, I've got uh, a whole line of questions about the RBC ratio. I know some of that is non-public. I can either uh, go into that now in executive session or I can skip ahead and then we can come back if you want to do the uh, RBC non-public discussion in the same uh, at the same time as some other matters might be non-public whatever is more convenient for you and the board. Some of the RBC uh, numbers are non-public and some of them are public. So I'm assuming that your questions relate to the confidential numbers, which are by and large forward looking. Yep, they, they relate to both. Uh, and it would be sort of, I think it'd be sort of a nuisance to go in and come back out. Um, maybe the best thing for me is to skip ahead and then come back to the RBC discussion, and we can do that in executive session with other matters, but whatever you prefer. Yeah, I, I think uh, because I'd like to get to the commissioner's testimony before one, because the Oliver Wyman actuary is only available until one. Um, yeah, I'd like to not break at this point for an executive session because I think we'd have to do it again. So uh, if you could save it in, in the executive session, we can make sure that Mr. Schultz and any other necessary witnesses uh, are there. That, that's fine. Um, Mr. Schultz, could you please skip to page 26 of exhibit one? Okay. Got it. Okay, and there you see the uh, the heading inpatient facility claims. Yes. Okay, and then in the third paragraph, beginning using the array, you see that. I do. Okay, and then in the second sentence, the second sentence says that you that certain time series methods, such as those assuming no trend and those assuming the trend is dampening are not included because they're inappropriate. Why would you not include uh, methods assuming that there's no trend or assuming the trend is dampening or decreasing? Objection, and I'm not even sure if it's an objection, Jay. I just wanna point out that your quote of that sentence omitted some language. So I just wanna make sure the witness is aware of the full language of that sentence. That's fine. I was just trying to shortcut things, but Mr. Schultz, why don't I not short shortcut things and why don't you just read that sentence? Sure, certain time series methods, such as those assuming no trend, those assuming the trend is dampening, or those for which there is not sufficient historical data, and there's a footnote about that particular comment, are not included, as these are inappropriate for use in trend development and or for the data available. And so, and my question is, uh, doesn't have to do with uh, methods for which there's not sufficient historical data. My question just focuses on the first two phrases, trend methods assuming no trend, and those assuming the trend is dampening. That's in that sentence, uh, you say that uh, those methods are inappropriate for use in train development, and I would like to know why that is. Sure. So if, if we're trying to uh, come up with an assumption 
it is not a valid way to do it to assume that the answer is zero and then come up with your assumption. If, if we've assumed the answer is zero, then the answer is zero. Uh, these, these particular statistical models are not just applied to medical costs. They can be used in a variety of practices. In some practices, and, and what these statistical methods attempt to do by and large, these time series methods, is to differentiate between uh, seasonality, which are the, the minor ups and downs that you see over the course of a certain time period, and an actual trend, which is, as we know, it's, a, it's an overall increase or change in the cost of services, could be an increase or a decrease. So among the various tools that exist for time series, some of them assume, some of them say, what if there's trend but no seasonality? Others say the exact opposite. What if there's seasonality but there's no trend? And it's it, it's just a it's um, simple fact that if you assume there's no trend, the answer you're going to find is zero. So that that lends nothing to our analysis. Um, you it's obvious that if we assume it's zero, then you're going to come up with zero. If we assume it's five, it's going to come up with five. We don't we don't do that. We take a look at data and we study that data in great detail. And as a result, we form a, a trend assumption based on the data. We, we don't form the assumption first um, and, and then move on from there. Would you agree with me that trend can be negative? Absolutely. OK, and you see in the uh, the second, the, the paragraph, not immediately following that paragraph, but the one after that. In the first sentence there, you say many time series project highly negative trends, producing projected negative claims. And then you say they're unreasonable in this context. Do you see that? I, I do not. I'm sorry. Um it's it's the the, par the paragraph beginning due to 2019 results ah okay thank you i do see that yes so why would a uh here you've got a time series projecting highly negative trends producing projected projected negative claims you're saying they're unreasonable why should they be any more unreasonable than any other type of uh trend ser uh, time series projection uh, for two reasons, they don't fit the data well as we continue the projection, and secondly, they kind of reduce to absurdity. If we if we assume the trend is going to decrease by, you know, eight or nine percent every year, soon enough we get to a place where nothing costs us anything, um, and that's that's simply uh, an absurdity. Is there any place in your discussion of trend in this rate filing in which you give? at which you give a methodology that results in a negative trend any weight in your trend analysis? Um, the, the one I can think of is that we, we do assume that uh, there will be a dampening of pharmacy trend. The, the ultimate result is certainly positive, but we assume a, a dampening uh, for a couple reasons. One is contractual and the other is that we assume that brands will will lose their patent and that uh, the, the number of generics will increase relative to the number of brands. So th there are certainly components of our trends uh, that are negative. I don't believe we have any uh, final results that themselves are negative. What is the year over year trend? Year over year trend compares one year to the next. So if we're, we're just looking at raw information, what what is the, the PM PM, the per member per month? claims in one year compared to the following year. OK, and you. Uh, you generally do not give. Uh, well, let me ask it this way in, in on page 27 in that. Uh, that table there when you show the year over year trend as being a negative 0.4 percent. Mm -hmm. um, how much weight do you give that in uh, coming up with your outpatient facility claim estimate of training? Uh, we, we took the weighted average of the, and we, we gave equal rate weights um, to my recollection of the year over year trend, the 36 month regressions, which are the following two numbers, which are just over 1%, and the time series, which are 
very close to zero. So we we took a we took a, a straight average. We we didn't weight it in any way of those of those items, uh, and that informed our zero point three percent selection. Okay. By the way, when when you talk about a selection, um, what do you mean? We're we're choosing a trend. We're we're choosing a trend assumption. A, a trend assumption is not a calculation. There's no formula that says you you plug in uh, A and B. Uh, do some mathematics and you end up with C and that's your answer. Uh, it, it's, an, it's an assumption that is informed by, very heavily informed by the data, uh, but we, we assess the data in a number of ways and use our actuarial judgment to select an answer that we believe is, is the best answer. Okay, and you're certainly not arguing, are you, that your answer is the only reasonable answer for, for trend? Correct. Okay. Um, We all agree, don't we, that 2020 was a very unusual, if not unique year, correct? I agree. And what happened in 2020, we don't expect to see continue to continue on in the future, do we? Let's hope not. Okay. So why then do you assume in your trend analysis that mental health services, which obviously increased during the pandemic, are going to continue at the rate that they've been during the during the pandemic that they're going to continue with that rate in the future uh for two very good reasons one is that we can observe experience prior to the pandemic and we also see very significant increases in mental health uh during that pre-pandemic time period and secondly we can take a look at emerging 2021 data and we can make the observation that not only are mental health services increasing at the rate that we have in this filing, they're actually increasing at about twice the rate we have in this filing. Uh, and and we, we speak to that in our COVID modeling. Our, our best estimate is that mental health services uh, will continue to increase at a very, very high pace throughout 2021 and likely into 2022 as well. However, we do not fully reflect that expectation in our premiums. Instead, we reflect this trend, uh, which was informed largely by data that existed pre-pandemic. Do you think it would be unreasonable for the board to conclude that mental health services went way up during the pandemic, but like so many other things, after the pandemic, they're gonna to return to pre-pandemic levels? I'll object to the form calls for speculation. Could you restate the question, Mr. Angoff? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll state it in a different way. Do you believe it's unreasonable to conclude that mental health services will uh, go back to their pre-pandemic level after the pandemic? Yes. Okay, could you turn to uh, Page 29, please. Okay. Okay, and you see there for all, uh, all professional utilization except excluded categories, the trend is a 0.5%, right? I see that, yes. Okay. And, but for mental health services, it's 13%. Yes. And that produces an overall 1.8%. Right. With the small facility component, yes. Right. Okay. But you're applying, aren't you, that 1.8% to all outpatient services, whether or not they include mental health services, correct? Uh, as a means of simplifying our calculations, yes, that's correct. Okay. Could you turn, uh, please, to page 30? Okay. Okay, you see that you've got that chart there and you assume it, uh, in the paragraph below that chart, you assume a trend of 6%? Yes. That, okay, and how do you arrive at that 6%? Uh, we, we took a look at um, a variety of measures, which we summarized in the chart. Um, 
and we excluded certain outliers from among the many statistical analyses that we did, all of which are not summarized in the, in the chart, um, but are inclusive of what we summarize in the chart. Uh, and we concluded that it would be better to, to pay more attention to the longer term results as being indicative of longer term patterns as opposed to using some results that appeared to be heavily influenced by short term fluctuations. Would you agree that it would also be reasonable to take an average of those six numbers uh, and use that as your trend? I'm not sure. I would I would have to go back and do the analysis to see if I if I thought that was a result was reasonable. Okay. Um, but taking an it, average. Mm -hmm. Taking an average is an acceptable of, of various uh, methodologies is an acceptable actuarial technique, correct? It is, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it leads to a reasonable answer. We again, actuarial science is not a rote add this plus that and take the average and you get the answer. It doesn't work that way. Actuarial sure. and sci actuarial science involves professional judgment. And we need to come to the conclusion that the result that we get from doing analysis is reasonable. We, we can't just form that conclusion based on whether or not it's a reasonable approach. We also have to form a conclusion about the reasonability of the result. Sure, but, but another, you, you agree, don't you, that another actuary could come to a different conclusion as to what the trend would be and that could be reasonable. Yes, another actuary may conclude that a higher or lower trend is reasonable. Could you turn please to page 33? Okay. Okay, and then you're talking about uh, brand cost trend in the, and in the middle of the page, uh, there's a paragraph beginning with vaccine costs. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. I do. Okay, and you, uh, you say you uh, you include a 20% cost trend. Can I ask you what the basis for that is? Yes, the, the basis is actual year over year experience for each of the past three years. And then you see uh, two paragraphs down, you say we select an overall cost trend for devices of 25%. Could you tell me how you selected that? Um, yes, yeah, so this one we we took a, a little bit closer look um, because some devices are experiencing very, very high trends. Um, so we took a closer look at market share, uh, which devices are emerging as the preferred devices. Uh, and in, in doing that detailed analysis, we could see that uh, some of the more expensive devices are being preferred over um, over their less expensive counterparts. Uh, so in we then projected the, you know, Made made some drew some conclusions about what market share would persist into the future, um, and the math on that led us to make an assumption of twenty five percent for that very tiny component of prescription drug trend. Okay, but again, there's no formula you followed, right? No, that there is there is no formula. There is we must apply a methodology, of course, and that methodology is reasonable. But there is no road formula. That's correct. Okay, could you turn pl please to page thirty five? Okay. And you see there, you say you select a 0% trend for vision trend. You see that? Uh, yes, I do. Okay. Looking at the numbers, would it also be reasonable to select a, a modestly negative trend? Uh, yes, that would, it would be reasonably to select, reasonable to select a modestly negative trend for, for vision. Yep. Okay. Could you turn pl please to page 45? Okay. Okay, and the, there's the subhead impact of selection. You see that? I do. Okay, and then could, could you could you read the second sentence for me? Well, for, read the, sorry, read the first two sentences. Subscribers will make financial decisions that are right for them. Typically, this manifests itself in healthier subscribers selecting low-cost plans, while less healthy subscribers select richer benefits. Okay, and could you explain why that is? Uh, 
typically if you are, if one if a reasonable person is aware that they're going to have high medical costs uh, in a, in the upcoming period, they will choose a richer benefit package so that they they will it's a trade off, right? They're choosing between do I want a higher premium so that I have lower out of pocket costs or do I want higher out of pocket costs while paying a lower monthly premium? And if a, if most most people who are aware that they're going to heavily utilize medical benefits uh, tend to make the choice of paying a higher premium so that their out of pocket costs can be lower. OK, and so. Isn't the uh, isn't the corollary of that that people who are healthier uh, are going to be less likely to uh, have generous health insurance plans? Yes. And the extension of that is, isn't it? People who are healthier are going to be less likely to buy insurance. Yes. OK, then. With this new system, with the new uh, subsidies that are coming into law in 2022, where for the first time people, at, uh, you, you said what the income levels are, but they're obviously higher than they've been in the past. Is it reasonable to assume that those people are going to be much healthier than the people already in the system for whom it made economic sense to buy uh, insurance without those heavy subsidies? Uh, it's reasonable to, to assume. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mike. Object to the form. If you understand the question, you can answer. I, I do understand the question, and uh, while I would dispute that they're necessarily much healthier, I would agree that they would be healthier. Okay. Um, Mr. Hearing Officer, that's all I have on non uh, non RBC related issues. So I'm. Happy to proceed however you and the board see fit. Uh, my preference would be to proceed to board questions, move on to Ms. Lee's uh, testimony, um, and have Mr. Schultz um, continue to stick around for uh, a likely executive session. So I'm going to move to board questions at this point. I'm going to start with board member Holmes. Do you have questions for Mr. Schultz? Mr. Oh. Hearing Officer, I, I apologize to interrupt. Just to clarify, if if appropriate, I'd like the opportunity for perhaps some short redirect after the board questions. Yep, I thank you. Forgot to mention that. Yep. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Sorry for the interruption. Uh, member Holmes. Yeah, actually, at this point, I think most of my questions were answered. If, if any questions come up when um, the other board members ask, I would like to be able to ask, but additional questions, but right now I'm set. Thank you. Uh, Member Pelham. Thank you. I as I uh, follow this, uh, oh, what a tangled web we weave. It's uh, it's amazing <laughs> to me that here we are looking for a nine tenths of one percent reduction and it's only valued at about one point five million. And there's this elaborate process we're all engaged with <laughs> to uh, bring that into some kind of landing. But uh, so I, I do have a few questions here. Um, and um, by the way, I want, uh, Paul, I want to thank you and your counterpart at MVP. That's it's fascinating to watch the clarity with which both of you know your, your, your subject area and, and can convey it to us. So my first question um, has to do with exhibit one, page eight. And there's a quote there having to do with the VH, the Vermont Health Connect billing system. Mm. And it says, shifting the billing for Vermont Health Connect from Diva to the- <coughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Pelham. Mr. Pelham, Pardon I me? can't hear. Can you speak toward the um, computer for me, please? I'm, I'm, you're breaking up. Okay, so I'll read from my notes rather than from the binder. Okay. So it says, uh, shift, can you hear me better now? Yes. I, yes. Okay, so it says shifting the billing for Vermont Health Connect from Diva to the carriers is moving the cost for this service from the state to ratepayers and will become an additional component of health insurer administrative expenses. And so that inherently is the definition of a cost shift. And as uh, um, you folks have said in past filings, 
the cost shift is a significant force um, in 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 in, uh, in in premiums. Um, later um, in Exhibit Six, page twenty-five. <coughs> um, the, the finances associated with that statement are profiled and it has uh, for VHC billing in the middle of the page that <clears throat> that uh, this would add at three dollars and eighty two cents per member per month. Mm -hmm. um, and as I multiply that out um, and, and, and in, in this exhibit, they only applied it to the individual filing. Um, it was not applied to the um, small group filing. So. The whole burden was put onto the onto the individual filing um, at three dollars and eighty two cents, whereas later on there's a section that applies it to the entire both filings and it uh, uh, ends up at a dollar seventy five cents. Um, so if just applying it to the individual group is three eighty two times uh, 15, 15,818 members. Um, and you get seven hundred and twenty seven thousand dollars is the cost of this. Um, and if you use the other methodology, applying it to the entire membership, uh, it's a do it's a dollar seventy five times the entire membership. You get the same seven hundred and twenty seven um, <clears> thousand dollars. And so um, in, especially in the context of of this process and maybe even in the context of the co-payments that have already been approved by DIVA, um, that are embedded in, in these plans, it's, it's a significant amount of money. And so I'm just wondering in your negotiations with Diva about this, whether or not there was any um, a conversation to have Diva, you know, I, I guess there are efficiencies by, of having the carriers, you know, do the billing. Um, and uh, so that that's why the movement was entertained. But what that means is that Diva saves money. Uh, because they've shifted it off to you folks, and you folks are now shifting it on to ratepayers. And I'm just wondering if, if uh, um, or maybe we folks, who knows where all this ends up. But um, so I, I'm just wondering if you had any conversations with Diva that somehow um, they would help financially while they would, you know, rid themselves of the operational uh, responsibilities. They would help you financially uh, to offset this cost shift. I personally have not had those conversations. I wasn't part of the the transition team at all. Um, Ms. Green may be able to answer that. I think she was more directly involved in, in what happened there. OK, thank you. Uh, so my next one has to do with um, capitation. Um, and uh, so if we go to exhibit one again, page seven. Um, you know, your, your, your how you profile engagement with healthcare reform and capitation was a little confusing to me. So on exhibit one, page seven, there is a, uh, I'm quoting here so that the, the uh, recorder can hear me. Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont has supported and participated in the state's all payer model uh, healthcare reform efforts since its inception. We are the only insurer that has enabled participation for the majority of our members in all types of coverage, including the individual and small group markets and large group uh, insured and self-funded customers in risk-based arrangements. We are currently working to expand fixed prospective payments with, will with willing partners. But then later on exhibit one on page eight, um, um, <clears throat> it reads, although measurable progress toward the state scale um, a goal was achieved by the attribution of several thousand Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont large group members in one to one care. An analysis of 2019 results indicate one care's performance did not result in savings relative to the medical expense. Because the performance to date in this arrangement gives no clear basis for projecting savings in the near term, this filing does not include any adjustment to projected expenditures relating to the one care program. So there's those, I think there's a little bit of conflict there, maybe, maybe not. Um, but I would like that explained or your answer to be viewed in this context. If you go to, um, um, and I'm not going to turn here, you can, you can do it if you want. But uh, Exhibit 9, page 4, um, has uh, the uh, capitation amount. This is the development of the index rate. 
has the uh, capitation amount at $5.48 of a total um, index rate of $719.44 for the individual filing or seven tenths of 1% you know, associated with capitation. Mm -hmm. And again, for in exhibit nine, page five, for the small group capitation, it's at $9.54 on a base over a base of $602.11 for 1.58%. So I'm kind of trying to figure out where this filing takes us down the road of healthcare reform. And um, I see the foundation that exists already is pretty meager, you know, at uh, less than 2% um, across uh, both the filings. And the, uh, the the narrative that says this filing um, <clears throat> does not include any adjustment to projected expenditures related to the One Care program. So I'm wondering if you uh, you know where does that leave us? Does this kind of imply that healthcare reform, in terms of a capitation rate, which is in terms of capitation, which is fundamental to healthcare reform, it's one of the pillars of healthcare reform is kind of on the slow boat here, and uh, we shouldn't have uh, um, any great expectations about Blue Cross Blue Shield, you know, pushing the envelope and trying to um, uh, encourage um, more willing providers, those are your words, or Blue Cross Blue Shields were willing providers. Um, and uh, can you discuss a little bit about why there are so few willing providers in your experience? Um, okay, so there's a lot in there. Uh, let me start by saying that fixed prospective payments and capitations are not necessarily equivalent. The capitation that we include in this filing are capitation arrangements we have primarily with certain uh, PCPs, which are different from the fixed prospective payment uh, arrangement that we do have with one hospital through One Care Vermont. Um, uh, so I, I will say Blue Cross is fully committed to health care reform, uh, including payment reform as well. Um, and we are working with a, a whole host of, of different organizations in, in varying efforts to move forward with payment reform. Now, payment reform doesn't necessarily mean capitation in, in every cause. There, there are a, a number of different ways to peel the onion, if you will. Um, there are shared savings, shared risk arrangements. There's there's pure capitation is kind of the the one of the far ends of that. Um, so we we are certainly attempting to move those efforts forward, but it is true that uh, we you know it takes two to tango. We we need willing partners in that, and we we have found some willing partners, um, but you know e even at the time of the of the um, downturn in hospital services, we, we reached out and spoke to facilities about, you know, would, we, would you want to set up a fixed prospective payment mechanism? Um, and none of them took us up on it. So we, we do have one facility through One Care who is involved in fixed prospective payment. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure others will get there over time. Uh, but it's, you know, it's, it's a different world for the providers as well. And we're, uh, we're not in a position to say it, it has to be this way. Uh, we're, we're working with our providers in, in partnership to try to, uh, you know, we're working toward the same objective. We all want to bend the cost curve. We all want to provide quality care. We all want to make sure patients have access to care. Uh, and so we're, we're working with them in partnership in the best way that we can. Um, I, I don't know, uh, you know, I'd purely be speculating if I, if I tried to tell you, yes, I think we'll get to a certain place in payment reform by a certain date. Um, that's, that's a bit beyond uh, the powers of my, uh, of what I'm able to project, but, um, but, you know, we are making strides in that area. We're pretty excited about some of the new opportunities that, that uh, we'll be able to introduce uh, over the next year or so. Um, and we'll, we'll continue working with One Care Vermont and with other, with other organizations in this state uh, to try to get toward more of these payment reform models. I mean, I, I do understand that there are other, aside from capitation, other um, value-based approaches, um, but it seems that all of those are built on the infrastructure of fee-for-service. And capitation is the one that really disconnects 
us from fee for service, and that's why I emphasize it. Um, be, um, and and I do understand that there's a critical mass that we got to get to um, in terms of capitation in order to have uh, to experience the benefits that 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 it offers. But it just seems you know in this filing and and for the coming year we're in a very small corner of the world here. And uh, um, I'm wondering if you have any suggestions for the Green Mountain Care Board as to what we could do to make your partners more willing. Wow, that's a that's a big question. Thank you for the opportunity. And I, um, I, I don't know that off the top of my head, I'm prepared to to give you a, a, a solid list. But what, you know, one thing that is extremely important to Blue Cross, and I would suggest the Green Mountain Care Board should keep in mind as well, is that just getting the capitation can't be the end game. There must be a way to return any savings back to policyholders. If we're living in a world where rates are capitated and in fact less care is used because we're more efficient and we're providing higher quality, um, if all of that difference between the capitated rate and the actual expenditure that was you know, then we'd like to believe will be lower. If all of that accrues to providers, we're not at all satisfied with that arrangement. There must be a mechanism that at least a portion and preferably a significant portion of that difference can be returned to everyday Vermonters who are paying premiums. So that that I would say is our number one concern as we're talking about payment reform. Well, thank you for that. I just worry that we're two, three, four years down. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. That we're two or three, four years down the road of healthcare reform, and these kind of statistics I presented should kind of show where we are. And it just worries me that that ratepayers and your policyholders at some point are, are just going to say, well, "What's this all about? It's not happening." So I agree, I fully agree with you that. This has to trickle through, um, to, you know, to ratepayers. Um, so my next question has to do with um, <clears throat> income from uninsured plans. Um, on Exhibit 15, uh, page 16, which is the um, supplemental health care uh, document, you can see in the column for um, uh, the, the line item is called income from uninsured plans. A in calendar year 2020, a 35 in terms of income to Blue Cross Blue Shield of 35 million eight hundred ninety seven thousand eight hundred eighty nine dollars. Do you see that number? I do. Yes. Okay. So that was the revenue. Um, Later on in exhibit 23, page 21, which is a profile of expenditures, you find that exact same number as a reimbursement by uninsured plans to the administrative expenses of Blue Cross Blue Shield. Those expenses including uh, cost containment, claim adjustment expenses, and general administrative expenses. And so I, I look at that and I say, how do we know whether or not the uninsured plans, and by uninsured, it's not uninsured individuals, it's just where you folks provide the administ administrative uh, uh, um, efforts, you know, but the, um, the, the person that you're, that the company you're working with is actually, they pay the claims. Mm -hmm. So, but I'm, I'm wondering from this accounting approach, um, how we can know whether or not the uninsured plans are subsidizing the administrative expenses of other parts of your Blue Cross Blue Shield's portfolio, or whether or not we're subsidizing them. Um, I, I do note that um, in 2019, the income from fees for uninsured, again from the same the same document, a prior year in a prior year, was 33 million four hundred and twenty four thousand, um, which was the same, pretty much the same amount in in in, in calendar year 2018. So I'm just wondering, there's obviously a relationship because it's it's this is plugged in as a reimbursement um, and I and therefore could flow through to this filing and you know through a back door. And I'm just wondering what your expectations are 
for uh, income from fees for the uninsured in uh, in 2021 and 2022? Yeah, good, great question. I, I actually have two answers to it. I unfortunately cannot show you how we can observe that through the financial statements. I, I'm not sufficiently familiar uh, with all the detail of the financial statements to be able to point you to something. Um, but I, I do know from the work that I've done uh, as chief actuary at Blue Cross that the ASO business, because we sell ASO business, um, the fixed costs that are allocated or that need to be allocated to this to these insured lines, including ACA, which is by far our largest insured line, are lower. So in other words, if that ASO business went away, we would have to find a new home for all the fixed costs that the ASO business supports. And for lack of other options, that new home would have to include the ACA filing. So if you know, I, I I hope that I hope that answers you. I know it's not a full answer to your question, but I, I hope it, it, it le at least gives you the the idea um, behind what you were asking, and, and that is that because we have all that ASO business, we are able to offer lower administrative fees to the ACA market. So um, <clears throat> is there within Blue Cross Blue Shield an accounting procedure that does separate uh, these? these types of businesses so that for the uninsured plans uh, that it's a tub on their own bottom and here's the revenue and here are the associated expenses so so one could know whether or not who, if there's any kind of cross subsidization going on we we do that accounting yes and I, I i would say there is no cross subsidization these you know these these things uh each line of business stands on its own now whether that line of business performs well or not may be a different matter um but you know, I, I would say there's certainly no cross subsidization, and I, I would further say that the existence of the ASO business means that we we don't have to allocate all of the fixed costs to our insured business, and that is helpful to our insured ratepayers. Well, the reason why I ask this question because it's a big number. I mean, 35, 36 million dollars, mm -hmm. dollars is is a big number, and uh, so um, that's why I was poking around there a bit. Um, I'm looking at it again on, in exhibit one, page 50, uh, was the presentation of um, the total administrative uh, costs um, on, a, on a statutory basis and on a gap basis. And in uh, the uh, one of our inquiries, we asked if we could have that profiled for um, uh, 2018 and 2019 as well. Mm -hmm. And I notice that when you kind of put those three years together, and I'll just pick the total administration on a statutory basis. In 2018, it was $40 million. In 2019, it was $27.9 million. And in 2020, it was $37.3 million. And I'm just wondering about that volatility. Did that have something to do with your rebenchmarking or your fixed cost and variable costs? You know, I mean, that that's a... That's, that's 2019 is, is a significant outlier from the, it's the other two years that surround it. And I'm just wondering um, what, uh, what might explain that. To my recollection, 2019 was the year that we had uh, uh, pathway two AHPs in the market. And so we saw a pretty, pretty significant movement uh, away from the ACA market and into those AHPs for one year only. Uh, and so I, I'm, I'm sure that's part of the difference. Uh, off the top of my head, I, I don't know that I could give you a full reconciliation. Okay, thank you. Um, so as I'm sure you know, um, because it's, it's uh, in, in, in full bloom in your filing, um, about the, uh, you know, the upcoming process to to redo Vermont's benchmark plan with, with CMS. And so the legislature has uh, basically said um, uh, that we need to assess whether the benchmark plan is appropriate, I'm reading here now, is appropriately aligned with Vermont's healthcare reform goals regarding population health and prevention. And in, and in addition, they're asking that uh, certain additional benefits um, 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 be considered, and those include uh, hearing aids, for example, vision, et cetera. And I'm just wondering, from an actuarial point of view, um, 
what your thoughts are, uh, especially given that the legislature is expecting a report in this coming January, so it's a very short turnaround time, <laughs> what, what your thoughts are about how that process might affect, you know, and obviously building off this year's plan designs, how it might affect plan designs in 2024, for example. Sure, uh, interesting question. And I, I think really the root issue at hand there uh, is is one of trying to balance access and affordability. Um, we we can certainly we have the information that we need to to study the issue to to study you know what what would the cost be if we were to add a hearing aid benefit for example, um, and and we will do these analyses and and uh, the the work group that's been convened uh, will work with actuaries to do those analyses, and at the end of the day it it comes down to. Um, access to care versus affordability. If we if we want to if it's if it's worthwhile to improve access to hearing aids at the cost of an additional whatever the dollar figure comes to uh, in terms of premium, then that's that's what um, you know the 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 board and stakeholders other stakeholders will have to wrestle with uh, as as we try to determine what should be in and what should be should be not in. Um, but you know, we, we do have the actuarial tools that, that that will allow us to put a cost estimate on there, um, and that if if benefits are enhanced, then those costs will be added in in the next in the in, you know in the, sub, in the applicable uh, filing. If uh, if other benefits are reduced elsewhere, then similarly we would reduce those estimates and allow those to flow through premiums as well. So that that's the analysis that that my team will be doing as actuaries. And the the really, frankly, the hard decisions are going to be at the stakeholder level um, in trying to decide is it is it worthwhile to ask Vermonters um, to pay a bit more in premiums to to decrease affordability so that we can increase access to care. It's a it's a tough you know it's a tough decision to have to make, um, but but I it, I think it's great work to be doing. So I um, mean, and, and it it does seem to open the door to. Um, an opportunity to make sure that our benchmark plan, that the low value benefits uh, are maybe uh, view, you viewed as a target to pay for some of the I'm higher sorry. value benefits. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Pelham, you broke up. Could you start again, please? Okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm facing you. I don't see you, but I'm, I, my, my face is toward you. Um, the, uh, it just might be an opportunity to to look at, at, because the benchmark plan, I think was put together in 2013 or 2014, to look at low value benefits that are sucking up actuarial um, value uh, in order to support some, uh, some higher value. One of the ones that I keep harping on is that our benchmark plan doesn't have a pre-diabetic program. You can get nutrition counseling but you can't get any physical exercise or therapy. And, uh, and we have a plan that does it, which the, the, the blueprint operates with so a, a CDC sanctioned pre-diabetic plan. So uh, those kinds of trades I think are, are, are possible. And my final question is just, is it just a very broad one um, because I'm not an actuary, but it's about uh, medical trends, for example. So let's take the medical trend for unit cost. Um, that is developed based on Blue Cross Blue Shield's data warehouse, data in your data warehouse. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's um, based on claims that are paid based on contracts that you negotiate with pro providers. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering if there's any sense that a rising tide lifts all boats. You know, if the Green Mountain Care Board you know, is is generous, then uh, that's good for Blue Cross Blue Shield and it's good for the providers. If we're kind of tight wads, that squeeze gets felt by um, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield and and, and the providers. Because uh, you know, it's just an interesting dynamic that the data that we're using to measure trend is data that you folks have negotiated with, with your providers. And so it's, uh, it's 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 not as independent and free market as one might like these these transactions to be. So you can take that as a statement, but or, or. 
or <laughs> if you have a response. I it's it's just something I worry about that it's it's uh, in this process. It's 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 the, the most of most of the medical trend is based on relationships you've all you've developed with with your providers, and so you look in the rearview mirror and uh, actuarially, and you say, well, this is what we've done. And, and therefore, based on that trend, this is where we should go. Um, and I, I'm just wondering if there's any qualifier to that. Yeah, so, okay, Th thank you. I, I wasn't quite sure where to go with my response, but that, <laughs> uh, now I think I can, I can give one. So, you know, we, we don't only look backwards for unit cost trends. We, we look forward as well, and we do that in a couple of ways. One is by uh, examining the recently submitted hospital budget information, um, which, as we know, uh, it goes a long way toward um, defining where we're going to be with all of our hospital providers. Um, for providers that aren't part of the Green Mountain Care Board budget review process, we don't strictly look backwards. We do take into account um, uh, forward-looking information as well. By way of example, and I, I didn't mention it earlier, but um, we, we did negotiate a uh, contract with Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center that started um, on July 1st, and that result was favorable to what we had in the initial filing. So in making the adjustments I talked about earlier for hospital budgets, we also included the results of that negotiation and one other New Hampshire facility as well. Obviously, Dartmouth is the, is the big behemoth over there and the one that's really impactful to claims. And so that successful negotiation relative to what we had initially put in the filing uh, did help to keep the uh, that impact lower. It was a, that point two, in other words, that I mentioned earlier was inclusive of what we negotiated with Dartmouth Hitchcock. Um, so, you know, for, for that, for unit costs specifically, while it's certainly informed by where we've landed in the past, um, and in particular at time of filing for the Green Mountain Care Board facilities, that's exclusively informed from by where we landed in the past. We do update it for information that we learn um, over the course of the year, including information that we've learned between the time of filing and today. Well, thank you for that, and thank you for your, for your time today. Thank you, Mr. Pellum. Okay, now we'll move to board member lunch. Thank you. Hi, Paul. I hope you're doing well today. Thank you, Robin. Um, I hope you are too. Thanks. Um, I have a follow up on the Vermont Health Connect billing issue. So the $3.82 PMPM, PM, um, just to make sure I have this right, is the, the total amount for the VHC billing. It's not it's not inclusive of other admin billing related costs. Right, that's what we expect to spend um, specifically for the VHC billing in 2022. So that, that doesn't include startup costs, but it, that's what we that we, that's what we expect to spend in 2022. Okay, and the startup costs were included in last year's filing. Is that right? Am I remembering that right? I believe that is true. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to, and you can let me know if this is a better question for Ruth, um, but related to the Vermont Health Connect um, direct enrollment and the availability of ARPA subsidies for those who shift from uh, directly working with Blue Cross to enrolling through Vermont Health Connect, in the uh, information you indicated there were 400 and 4,682 members who were directly enrolled as of May 31st. Does that sound right? Sounds right, yes. It's on, if it's helpful, it's Exhibit 13, pages 9 to 11. Thank you. Um, and also in that same exhibit, you indicated as of June 18th, 226 members had switched. Do you have an update on that? Uh, Ruth will have the best update on that. The latest number okay. I'd heard was something over 500 members. Okay. And your assumptions that you made in your ARPA modeling were, were I understand they were rough, but that about half of those members uh, potentially were eligible for subsidies? Um, so let me clarify that in the, yes, in the ARPA modeling, yes, we, we, did a calculation assuming that half would be eligible for subsidies. We we have no idea, quite frankly. 
Sure. Um, if if I had to guess, you know, those dollar amounts, uh, two hundred sixty-five thousand for a family of four seems pretty high to me. So I I my best guess would be that that more than half will be eligible for the subsidies, but we quite frankly don't know. We we just we just don't have the information. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I had a question related to um, the land framework calculations. Is that also a better question for Ruth in terms of uh, in Exhibit 13 page? Hold on just one second. Five. Uh, we had asked you to put your claims into the Learning Action Network framework. Mm -hmm. And there's 49.5. 8% in all pair models with upside and downside risk. I'm assuming that's the One Care Vermont ACO program. Yes. Okay. And the 0.1% in fee for services linked to quality and value. Could you tell me what that is? Um, I, I'd be guessing, quite frankly. So I. Um, okay. I think someone else will be able, probably Ruth, Great. will be able to speak to that better than I can. Perfect. Um, that sounds fine. I just wasn't sure which of you had prepared that. Um, so I wanted to switch to the telehealth area. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I was curious to hear a little bit more about how telehealth was included in your utilization impacts. From the filing, it looked to me like that was largely embedded in the mental health utilization trend. Yeah, that's I mean, so that's that's a that's a valid point. Um, I, again, what we've experienced recently are mental health utilization trends far in excess of what we actually put into the filing. Yes. Um, so if, if you compare the filing to our COVID modeling, you'll note a, a much higher trend in the COVID modeling based on emerging results that I, I think are far more inclusive of the of the telehealth uh, impact. So I, 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 you know, it's 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 not an even split. So I, I can't tell you that telehealth didn't impact the filing uh, in terms of what we're assuming for mental health. But by and large, as I testified earlier, that assumption was strongly informed by pre-pandemic experience. Um, so I, I, I'd say that um, that we're we're not we're not we're certainly not explicitly increasing the file rates for that. Sure. Um, and I, I don't think it's in there implicitly in a, in a great way either. Um, I do agree that broadly um, what's happening in telehealth will flow through future rates and in, in the way that, you know, that the according to the underwriting cycle that we normally see. Um, we, we think there are, well, we know there are some some benefits and perhaps some costs to telehealth. The, the ease makes it much easier to access care and so utilization may increase. You could see some duplication of services um, if there needs to be follow up after the telehealth visit, um, such that it did not actually replace some other sort of care. Um, but uh, you know, and and frankly, since it's being paid at par right now, you're, you don't really have the cost savings either to go mm -hmm. along with it. So you, you might you might be um, you know again you might be increasing access to care. Um, at, at the price of a little bit of affordability. And we'll continue to monitor that. And as that information flows through actual experience, as, as you've seen uh, earlier in the filing with the morbidity change, we will allow that to flow through to future premiums. Um, we did not make an explicit assumption in the filing about um, telehealth increasing uh, or decreasing cost. We assumed that zero was our best estimate at this time. Um, and that uh, you know we'll, we'll continue to assess it and see how it flows through experience and, and let it work through rates in, in, in that way. Okay, thank you. Um, and do you, this also may be a Ruth question, so forgive me, but um, are you anticipating making any change to payment rates as a result of DFR's order on audio only uh, reimbursement, which allows for 75% reimbursement for audio only? So I, I can, Speak to that, I think just at a high level, I certainly don't want to get into contracting and I'm not involved in that contracting anyway. And so I, you know, couldn't comment on it even if I wanted to, but I, you know, we, we will comply with DFR's order and we're, we're prepared to, to make sure that we are in compliance. Um, sure. You know, as I understand it, that applies to audio only yes. services. Um, so again, there are some trade-offs there. 
uh, as Dr. McIntosh will could, could testify later, um, there are some concerns about the efficacy of audio only for many issues. For, for some issues, it's perfectly fine, but but clinically, and of course, Dr. McIntosh will be able to speak to this because she, you know, she's she's a, she is a clinician, unlike myself. Sure. Um, there are some questions about the efficacy, so we, we do have some concerns about the potential for uh, duplication of care. Um, and we have some concerns about the, simply the fact that, you know, you used to be able to pick up the phone and call your doctor, uh, and now you're going to be charged for that. So it'll, it'll be interesting to see how it all plays out. Um, I think one key piece of, of DFR's mandate is that we'll start having different coding for mm -hmm. audio only. Right now, unfortunately, yeah. we do not, and so we're not able to fully study it um, and form conclusions about whether we expect it to be uh, helpful or harmful when it comes to cost. Uh, yeah. So this is another one of those things where you know we'll we'll start having the coding in 2022 that will allow us to study the issue. So once we have the coding, we get a little bit of experience. We'll be able to do some analysis and then form some conclusions for for some future rate filing. Great, um, thank you, Paul. So uh, my last couple of questions have to do with the ARPA modeling around the premiums. Um, are you generally familiar with the process that happens with QHPs after the Green Mountain Care Board sets premium rates? Not sure what you mean by the, the process. Are you aware that the commissioner of the Department of Vermont Health Access has a certification requirement for qualified health plans? Yes. And as part of that process, the commissioner may or may not accept every plan that has a premium set by the board? Yes, I'm aware of that. Okay. And uh, are you aware that uh, at least once in the past that the Department of Vermont Health Access has not accepted all the plans? I am. Thank you. Um, in um, so the so, but your modeling sort of assumed that in that process, uh, the Diva Commissioner would accept all the plans that the board approves. Yes, my recollection is that they've they've always done so for plans that are already in place. <clears throat> in other words, I I can't recall an instance where they have removed a plan that was already in the market, such that Vermonters who were in that plan had to had to find another option. They they have right. But, um, right? I'm sorry, Robin, yeah. go ahead. But uh, for example, if the Diva Commissioner were concerned about maximizing subsidies through by a choice of a second lowest cost silver plan, the DIVA commissioner could certainly make a choice about which plans to accept in order to determine which plan would be the second lowest cost. That is true. Um, should the other question I had related to your review of MVP filings. Um, so in your pre filed testimony, you indicated that you had reviewed MVP filings as part of your ARPA subsidy in a general way. Mm -hmm. Um, and you test, uh, I guess you probably need to say yes or no for the record. Yes, I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> um, and uh, are you aware that l &E's recommendations related to MVP would impact both small group rates and individual market rates? Yes, I'm aware of that. Okay. So uh, should the board, uh, for example, choose to reduce a, a factor that would impact both individual and small group market rates, Not that could potentially, under your modeling, be harmful to individuals with subsidies, right? Yes. But that could also help potentially small businesses and small business employees by further reducing those rates. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, uh -huh. I think that is all I have. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Robin. Okay, now we'll move to Board Member Yusper. Uh, thanks. Hi, Paul. Um, first, a question on um, the morbidity shift, um, the $11.6 million that you talked about, um, which is pretty significant. And um, I guess, could you talk about your shift in membership. So I think there was a decline of maybe about 5,000 members. And are you able to map um, the people that actually left to to validate that they really were the high cost users? Yes, very insightful question. And that's exactly what we did. Um, 
we we took a look at um, the the members who in, who did leave us from 2019 to 2020, and what we saw is that those members were unusually expensive. Uh, we've we've done the same analysis in past years. We did the same analysis for 2020 into 2021, um, and 2019 into 2020 was a significant outlier. Um, the members who left us were were far more expensive, and then we know that by looking at 2019 claims. So it's all pre-pandemic claim information. Um, the 2019 claims of those members who left us during 2020 open enrollment were were very very high relative to the average. Uh, around, to my recollection, um, more than 20 percent higher than the average, some closer to 25 percent. Okay, thank you. Uh, going to uh, exhibit one, page six. Okay. The table that shows the cumulative losses, and you had 7.4 million, and I believe as we were talking, there was one adjustment you had um, that wasn't reflected in here that was about 3 million or something that would have reduced this. Is that correct? Um, yes. Yeah, so we, we uh, yeah, it was $3.7 million for the 2020 risk adjustment uh, true up. We had assumed that we would be getting around uh, $18 million in a risk adjustment transfer from MVP. And in fact, we got a little over 21. Okay. And then to the footnote, for the risk quarter receivables that are not included. Mm -hmm. um, for apples to apples, shouldn't that be included as well? So that that nine million? Well, it, it depends on what you want to use the table for. Um, so if you want to use the table for what has this uh, business, what's been the bottom line impact to Blue Cross, I think it's important to include that 10 million as well. Yes, yeah, so I do. If, Right. OK, so if, if we add that in, then we end up that over time, uh, Blue Cross has had, uh, you know, Blue Cross reserves have increased by about $3 million over the full history of the ACA market. Of course, that's well short of the increase that would have been required to maintain RBC. Um, I decided to keep it out of the table because I wanted to use the table to see, you know, kind of how did we do? How do actual results compare to what we thought? So the, the table as constructed kind of shows us how accurate is our actuarial work. And that that's what I was, you know, that was the main purpose of what I wanted to convey in the table. But I, I do agree 100% that if you want to use the table to say, well, what's been the bottom line impact to Blue Cross over time? We, we did lose the $7 million, but the government was good enough to, to refund us um, a total of $10 million of that. So in total, uh, our reserves will have gone up by about $3 million. And, and isn't that really what the purpose of kind of that risk adjustment is, right? Because if you had the less healthier population, I mean, we're just kind of um, looking at the marketplace and making sure that, you know, there's adjustments for that, correct? Well, let me let me clarify. So the, the um, the 3.7 million that we didn't include in 2020 is because that 3.7 arose after the time we submitted the filing and therefore submit put this chart together. So right. the risk adjustment true ups for all the previous years are part of the chart. That's kind of part of the, the, the annual process. Okay. We, we make an estimate of what we think we're going to receive. At the end of the day, we get a number that's in part based on uh, MVP's population and uh, that's part of the experience. So that's always in here. Risk corridors are a little different risk because risk corridors basically said, you know, it was the federal government saying, tell us how you did in this market. And if you did well, we want a piece of that. And if you did poorly, then we will actually refund you a portion of, of the amount by which you did poorly. And so that, that was kind of completely, to me, it was separate. It was sort of a below the line adjustment. So if, if I want to see how, you know, how did I do relative to, to my prediction, I'm not going to include that because it's kind of below the line. The fact is we lost that money. Um, and then the subsequent fact is the government was was kind enough to to repay us for some of those losses. Does that make but sense? Yeah what, we just, yeah, what we just said was three million is what the gain would have been for this book of business from 2014 through 2020. Um, with all the adjustments that the Green Mountain Care Board has imposed. It, it, yeah, if if we include the the 10 million. So I, I, I'd say it a little bit differently. I'd say there was a $7 million loss over seven years. 
but we were refunded $10 million of that loss. The reason 10 is bigger than seven is because we did have some gains in there over time as well. Um, but the federal government refunded 10 million of the experienced $7 million loss. And then on top of what impacts RBC would be gains on investments or losses on investments, correct? Just Absolutely. The for the RBC. Um, okay. And then um, in your testimony, um, you stated that RBC depleted must be replenished in future years by ratepayers. Yeah, that's that's really the mechanism that we have at our disposal. You know, being a being a nonprofit, we're not able to um, really raise capital in in other ways. Um, there are a few recourses available to us in case of an emergency. We we may be able to get a surplus note by way of example, um, but by and large, uh, the means that we have at our disposal to increase surplus is by charging premiums. Okay. Um, and then on exhibit 15, page three, which I believe is all admissible. And Mike, if you can just check. Yes, that's not marked as confidential. Okay. Um, can you can you look at the RBC table and tell us what the two biggest impacts were? that brought down RBC from 2019 to 2020? Yes, so we have an impact of change in pension funded status due to Allianz investment losses that reduced RBC by 163 percentage points. And the impact of change in pension funded status due to impact of year-end actuarial assumptions uh, further reduced RBC by 59 percentage points. I think in dollars that translates to about 45 million or so. I think it was 35 for the 163 and, and then another 10 or so for the. Sounds about right. OK. Um, and I know a lot more of this discussion will be in the private session, but um, last year there was testimony to state that the pension plan would not impact rate holders um, yet. We just talked about if we deplete the RBC, it must be replenished in future years by ratepayers. So I, I know we're going to get more into that discussion, but um, you know I do think it's important to be on record to show what happened to the RBC, um, both from the ACA market piece, which we just said was a benefit of about three million dollars over a five-year time period, and this is about a forty-five million dollar hit to RBC um, for those two components um, that drastically reduced um, where the RBC is. And had, had those not reduced, I think we may be in a different position as to what we would do with RBC, because we certainly wouldn't be asking the ratepayers to replenish that, which is ultimately what's going to happen. But um, I know we're going to get more into that when we talk with Ruth and when we go into um, separate section, but I, I did want to make sure that was um, highlighted, but um, I'm done. Thanks. Okay, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, good morning, Mr. Schultz. Good morning. Um, are you the right person to ask a question about the um, question of um, the contractual arrangements with Optum versus your previous uh, pharmaceutical benefit manager, or would that be left for Ms. Green? Uh, I, I think detailed questions would would have to be uh, done confidentially. Um, and I, I believe either one of us could answer at a high level those questions. I, I'm not sure if, if Ms. Green has the detail on them or not. Depends well, on the so question, you can I guess. answer it at a high level. I'm going to ask you the question, and then you can tell me if uh, it should be deferred. Sounds good. Okay. So, do you have concerns about uh, the impact of um, this change um, on Vermont pharmacies? Uh, no, I do not. Okay. In your testimony, you talked about uh, the fact that uh, the 
the savings were primarily driven by rebates. That, that's correct. Yeah, that's correct. And that's why I gave the answer to the pharmacy question. The, the savings are indeed primarily driven by enhanced rebates and that uh, that's neutral to the pharmacies that impacts the manufacturers themselves, uh, which I think is who we would most like to impact. In order to participate in the uh, um, plan, pharmacies can't uh, reject specific prescriptions, correct? They have to fill all? I don't know that contractual detail, to be quite honest with you. OK, would it surprise you to um, learn um, that uh, I was given copies of um, the actual pharmacy reimbursement for the same drug diet, diazoxide, um, 50 milligram, same days of disbursement. Um, the uh, Starting costs were about fourteen ninety seven. Under um, your previous PBM, that pharmacy was reimbursed um, one thousand one eighty six fifty one. Under your current um, PBM, that pharmacy is being reimbursed seven zero two twenty eight, which they claim to be a loss, and they are making the argument that a handful of Vermont uh, pharmacies will be closing this year because of these type of things. Would that, would that surprise you? Am I getting false information? I I have no idea, to be quite honest with you. I, I can't speak to that level of detail for that specific drug. I, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure how specific drugs may be reimbursed for, for one PBM relative to the other. I do know there, there are certainly changes um, that are made in those contractual arrangements. So I would imagine that, that some for some drugs, they're, that they may well be uh, reimbursed more. And for others, they, it's likely that it's less. So I, um, but beyond that, I really can't speak to the specifics. Okay. Are you aware if there's any type of clause in the contract that would um, prohibit um, Optum um, in their own mail order business from being reimbursed higher than a Vermont pharmacy? I am, I am not aware uh, of that. Specifically, no, I'm not aware of it. Okay. So, uh, yeah, any further questions about like contract details? I think probably would be best for an executive session. I, I was planning on dropping it there, anyways, um, on that topic. Uh, and I had hoped not to have to ask any questions today, but. Um, <laughs> In the words of the immortal great Yogi Berra, it's deja vu all over again because we've had this conversation at past re review hearings and once again I'm forced to bring it up. Um, you've made the assertion that any um, past um, reductions in your rate has just been deferred reductions and, and has to be put in future rates. And so is it your testimony that Blue Cross has maximized their ability to um, coordinate care? We we have we have uh, we're constraining costs to the best of our abilities and working in conjunction with our providers. So have you maximized your ability to um, manage those with chronic illnesses? I give the same answer again. We we are we are doing the best we can with the tools we're able to work with. Do you believe that um, you have maximized your complete efficiency and effectiveness, and the ability to um, uh, deliver insurance to uh, Vermonters? I think there's always room for continuous improvement. Chairman. There we go. I love that answer. So given that answer and the fact that you have continually lost market share in each of the years that you've come before us in this particular group of business, how would one assume that you have reached true maximum efficiency and effectiveness and that any rate uh, um, reductions result only in deferred rates to Vermonters? Well, I would revert back to the answer that I gave about whether this, you know, 
it helps us in terms of, of competitive position if we if you, our rates are reduced. We need to have surplus available in order to make investments. We need to have surplus available in order to serve Vermonters when they want our coverage. And Ms. Green will testify to this in greater detail, but last time our rates were this close to parity, we had an 87% market share. If our market share went up that much this year, RBC would be depleted dramatically and very quickly. And, and Ms. Green will be able to testify to the details. So I agree with you, Blue Cross is working hard every day to make sure that we're delivering cost at the, at the most affordable way to Vermonters. We've included millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars in this rate filing through Vermont Blue RX, through making decisions to fund certain items out of reserves um, to make sure that we get that premium relief to Vermonters. So I, you know, I, I'd agree that yes, it's something that we work on every day and we will continue to do so. But I also want to point out that we need to have the capital available in order to make those investments. If all we're doing is treading water just to stay afloat, we don't necessarily have the resources that we need to invest in the types of initiatives that we need to, to actually bend the cost curve in Vermont. Rate reductions don't change the cost of care in Vermont. We, we need to initiate programming, work with providers in a way that allows us to do so. And to do that, we need capital. So when capital is depleted, that actually stands in the way of us working on the types of initiatives we need to work on in order to actually bend the cost curve and deliver premium relief, not just on a one year basis, but ongoing into the future. Did any regulatory decision by any governmental body um, force you to place your investments in the pension where you place them? Uh, I'm not close to that, but I'm going to say no. The answer is no. There is no enforcement of us putting our investments in any one place. OK, thank you. I guess one more point before I cease my questions, and that is. Um, you seem to um, be making the argument both in your pre-file testimony and your testimony this morning that um, any reduction will leave federal dollars on the table. Does the end justify the means? Well, let me specify any reduction in the individual market. Now that we have a market split, will leave federal dollars on the table. Um, you know, I, I gave you the facts and I think you'll have to make that decision. If you're asking me if I were to make that decision, I would value lower net premiums for lower income Vermonters over lower premiums for high income Vermonters and uh, a, a 80 cents on the dollar benefit to the federal government. Um, that's just Paul's opinion. Uh, and, you know, we as Blue Cross are recommending that the board actually make that decision as well. We think as a company that's the right place to be. Um, you'll have to make your own mind up. But yes, I would advise you that we should we should value the net premiums of those lower income Vermonters over helping the federal government. What has Blue Cross's historical um, practice been when it comes to um, taking the approved rates and um, uh, putting them into your pricing um, tables accordingly by each of the different uh, um, plans, whether they be bronze, silver, gold, platinum. Um, is it a flat across the board change that you make? No. Each plan is rated on its own. Thank you very much. No further questions. Mike, I have one follow up. Yeah, and then Jess, if you had any, I think you deferred. Go ahead, Robin. Uh, so Mr. Schultz, would you value lower net premiums to Vermonters uh, higher or lower than lower net, net premiums to small businesses and small group employees? That That's kind of an impossible question to answer. I, I don't know that I have an answer, but I, I will point fine. out that there are different, they're in different dockets now. So to the best of my understanding of the rules, what you do in one doesn't have to be the same as what you do in another. 
except you did verify earlier that some of the factors apply to both markets, didn't you? That they are independent factors. Yes, we, we came up, we developed factors and the same trend, for example, might apply to both markets. But they are, you know, each each filing stands on its own merits. I'm not, you know, <laughs> I'm trying not to say go whack our small group rates and leave the individual alone. That's I'm certainly not making that argument. We we feel that we've already provided tens of millions of dollars of rate relief to this market and that you don't need to, to take that step on our behalf because we've already taken it. But however, I, you you also just testified that if the board made a decision that was outside of an actuarial recommendation, that that results in an underfunded premium. And so I would just note that there are actuarial factors which apply to both markets in both your filing and MVP's filing. And that consistency where that is actuarially recommended uh, seems uh, prudent. So I have no further questions. Member Holmes, do you have any questions? Um, I guess I just want to circle a little bit back to the conversation around declines in RBC must be paid by ratepayers. I think you're hearing a lot of board questioning around this. Um, and I understand the need for capital to make investments, and I understand the need for a surplus. I just want to uh, ask you whether or not that increase in the surplus or that um, attempt to build much needed capital could also be generated by more effective utilization review by your clinical team, elimination of low value care through you know, utilization management and care management, um, better, stronger fraud, waste and abuse monitoring, um, negotiating with providers um, and contracting to ensure that there's less variation in pricing across hospitals, across providers, ensure that care is delivered in the right place. Um, improvements in administrative efficiencies, whether that's staffing ratios, um, introduction of technology, things like that, and also growth in investment income. All of those things would also increase surplus, right? And to some degree are also in the control of Blue Cross Blue Shield. Yes, you seem to be suggesting that we should um, file rates or have the rates approved that are in fact in excess of what we need and then go about these things and generate gains. And I, you know, I, I think I can answer that in, in one of two ways. One is that we do embark on those activities and they are already included in the rates. So we are assuming, for example, that our fraud, waste and abuse efforts will be able to return to the very high level that they were in, in 2019. Um, there's no guarantee of that, but that's included in rates. We have uh, introduced Vermont Blue RX. And so we, through that programming, and you know, it's not just contracting, but contracting and programming, we will be able to reduce premiums. And that is already reflected in our rates. And so, you know, I <laughs> we we do put it in there, right? It's it's already in there. And can we do more and create gains? Um, that's kind of the second way I'll answer it. Sometimes we do have gains, and we've, you know, people, you know, it's been our gains in 2020 have been pointed out as if it's some um, some sort of horrible thing. And I, I want to point out that because we have those gains, we're able to reinvest that in lowering rates in two different ways. One is we had gains. We concluded that they were in part because of a morbidity shift. And we're assuming that that same population will persist through 2022. So that's part of why we're decreasing rates. Um, the other part is because we had those gains, surplus increased. And we're able to invest the $11.9 million that I mentioned earlier in terms of keeping things out of these premiums that we expect to have to pay in 2022. So I, that 2020 gain is not some sort of horrible thing. And no, we I have don't. demonstrated that we, you know, this, this is our track record. If we have a gain like that, we put it into rates. We return it to rate payer. That's the only reason we exist. That's the only reason policyholder reserves exist. They're for the rate payers. They mitigate future rate increases. We're, we're, not, we're not giving money to Wall Street. It, it all goes to policyholder reserves. And, yeah. and you can see in this filing particularly that we are using that money wisely to decrease premiums for 2022. And I think that's exactly the result all of us want. I, I understand. I just It sounded from your testimony that the only way 
to replenish reserves um, and ensure capital and surplus was through premiums. And I guess I was wanting to articulate that I think there are multiple ways to do that. I don't disagree that a CTR is important, but there are multiple ways to uh, replenish reserves. That's all I had. Mr. Genafio, did you have redirect for Paul? No further questions. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, the plan that uh, the parties and I had discussed was that we take um, Jackie Lee's testimony next. Uh, I don't expect that would take very long, um, but you know, I I was given uh, kind of the new issue with respect to DFR, the recent report, the potential that that's going to come up. I, I'd like at least an hour and a half for the commissioner and Zach Smith from Oliver Wyman. Um, so I don't think, well, I think Jackie's testimony would probably be quick. I imagine I don't think it's going to be half an hour quick. So I would propose we hear from the commissioner um, about the solvency report and uh, and then probably take a lunch break. Does either party have any objection to that plan? Uh, no, ju just a question. Go ahead, Mike. I, I was just going to say we have no objection. Go ahead, Mr. Engel. Mr. Hearing Officer, just a question then. When would we get to the discussion of uh, the RBC issue with Mr. Schultz and then Ms. Green? May, may I offer a suggestion? Since that's likely to come up in Ms. Green's testimony as well, uh, perhaps, and Mr. Schultz, I believe, is with us for the day, um, we could do that in a single executive session, you know, kind of perhaps after Ms. Green's uh, public testimony. Yes, I think that makes sense uh, with the understanding that we are not going to have uh, Zach Smith from Oliver Wyman with us any longer at that point. So if there are questions for him regarding the confidential RBC stuff, we might need to go <laughs> into a, a, a mini executive session there before we before we break. Mr. Hearing Officer, my, my only concern is that we have enough time to go over the RBC issue carefully, and maybe it makes sense, and maybe it would, would cut time if we did Ms. Green and Mr. Schultz together regarding the RBC issue. I think that was what Mr. D'Onofrio proposed. And my, did I misunderstand that? That's correct. Good. Well, that's a, I think that's a great proposal. OK, so why don't we break for eight minutes, reconvene at 11, and I see, uh, I did see the commissioner was on. Commissioner, are you still with us? Yes, hi, everybody. Hi. So I think we're going to break for seven minutes, come back at 11, uh, and we'll hear your testimony. Is that make sense Sounds to everybody? Great. OK. Thanks. everyone but uh bridget or mike are you one of you on
Maybe you can ask them again, Mike. Yeah, thanks. Bridget or Mike, are you are you with us? If you're speaking, you're you're on mute. I see Mr. D'Onofrio putting on his glasses and everything. If he could just acknowledge that he's there so the hearing officer can continue. Can continue. I, I apologize. I didn't realize that question was to me. I'm here. Sorry about that. Worries. Are you prepared to begin? Uh, yes. OK. And Ms. Sears, you're with us, correct? I am. Thank you. OK, so we are back on record in uh, the hearing uh, regarding Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont's 2022 individual and small group rate filings. We just finished the testimony of uh, Blue Cross's actuary, Paul Schultz, and now we are uh, going to hear from Commissioner of Department of Financial Regulation, uh, Mike Pichek, and um, there is an actuary from Oliver Wyman uh, also on the line. Um, is it Zach Smith or Zachary Smith? Zach is great. Thanks. Uh, and at this time, I'd ask that you uh, please both raise your right hand uh, so I can give you the oath. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. I do. OK, Mr. Commissioner, you can proceed. Well, uh, thank you very much, um, Mr. Hearing Officer, and good morning, everybody, and, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I just have um, some brief uh, remarks to lead into our testimony, and then um, certainly um, interested in, in answering questions that, uh, that everyone has. Um, the hearing officer introduced Zach Smith just to reiterate, he's a senior consultant at, Actu at Oliver Wyman. Uh, he's been working with us for a number of years on projects relating to the rate hearing and not related to the rate hearing. He's very familiar with um, Blue Cross Blue Shield as a result of that. Um, and again, we used Oliver Wyman in connection with our solvency opinion this year. Uh, this is something that we've uh, recently done. Uh, and it really just speaks to the fact, um, you know, we started doing it when there was great uncertainty um, in health insurance uh, caused by uh, different changes that were happening at the federal level under the previous uh, federal administration. And uh, we continued that through COVID because obviously there is um, a tremendous amount of uncertainty and upheaval uh, as a result of uh, COVID uh, as well. So we're very thankful that um, they uh, participated with us again in our solvency opinion and provided some analysis as well. And hopefully the board finds that useful and valuable. Um, also at the top, I just wanted to mention um, in connection with um, the pandemic, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield has been a um, real partner with us throughout the pandemic, as have many other industry stakeholders. But since Blue, Blue Cross Blue Shield is being discussed today, um, we've developed you know, a number of emergency rules, bulletins. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield was always very helpful in that process. A number of those rules and bulletins, you know, did result in um, a financial impact for them and other carriers uh, in terms of providing COVID specific relief to Vermonters. Um, and that work uh, was critical during the pandemic, particularly the early parts of the pandemic. And like I said, they were a, um, a willing and able partner and really appreciate that. And, and some of that impact is being seen um, in the financial results and in the returns that we'll talk about today. So I think it does have a, a direct relevant impact. Um, I'll just mention again, you know, just a really high level about RBC risk-based capital. I think the board is very familiar with it at this point, uh, but that obviously is one of the main measurements we use to determine the financial position um, of an uh, entity, whether it's a health insurer or some other type of uh, health in, or some other type of insurer in Vermont. And and it's different based on whether you're a health insurer, or a property casualty insurer, or a life a, a life insurer. Um, and uh, different factors are taken into consideration. But it is a uniform approach that our department and all the other insurance commissioners across the country use to determine, you know, the solvency risk, the solvency position uh, of uh, an entity. Um, 
any other questions the board has, happy to talk more about that. Um, but I think as you saw from the solvency opinion that we provided, you know, Blue Cross Blue Shield um, is below uh, the, the 590 to 745 range that the department established a number of years ago when um, Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, started. And then the department uh, sort of, uh, you know, did its own independent analysis about what's an appropriate RBC range for the company based on uh, its unique uh, considerations. Uh, so it is below that range. Um, you know, I think uh, all things being equal, if it was where it currently sits um, and there weren't a few things around the corner that were going to have a favorable impact on their financials, we would have even greater concern uh, about its uh, current position. It, its RBC is lower than it has been in recent history. It's certainly lower than last year. Last year, looked like maybe a start of a nice trend where it was sort of moving up to the range and, and uh, you know, albeit at the lower end of the range. Um, but as um, you can see from the financial opinion and the solvency opinion, there are a few items that are certain, they're certainly going to happen. It's just a matter of timing uh, that will have a favorable impact uh, to Blue Cross Blue Shield's RBC. Um, and that will likely uh, occur in 2020. Two and the, during the rate filing, 2021, but impact 2022 rate filing. So, you know, there are other things though that are much less certain that associate with the rate. Um, and I just want to again caution or stress, I should say, that uncertainty. Um, some of that is directly tied to the pandemic. You know, there is again across the country and even in the region an uptick in uh, ongoing infections. Uh, the new Delta variant is the most, uh, you know, the most uh, current, the most, uh, you know, transmissible variant. But there potentially could be others that provide even uh, more challenges to to um, states and uh, and the healthcare industry as a whole. Um, certainly, uh, there were changes uh, in people's um, participation in healthcare. Uh, in morbidity uh, due to deferred or foregone care that may impact um, health insurers uh, into the future. We just don't know about that. Um, and then there's also some uncertainty um, in the margin within the rates that are filed before you uh, today. Um, I think uh, everyone understands that there was a favorable impact in 2020 uh, in terms of financial impact to Blue Cross in 2021, uh, whether based on actual data we have to date or, and, and on projections, it does appear like there will be a negative impact uh, in 2021. And, uh, you know, that was, again, directly due to some COVID uh, impact. But the favorable impact in, in 2020 that Blue Cross Blue Shield believes is due to improved morbidity, you know, has been carried through into the rate filing. Um, if that turns out not to be an improvement in morbidity, but an improvement in, you know, some other temporary or some other, um, you know, one-time impact, uh, then the rate actually might be on the lower end of what it needs to be because, um, you know, that improved morbidity uh, wasn't as significant as Blue Cross Blue Shields believes that it is. And, and again, they followed that into the rate uh, and it's reflected into the rate. So that is some degree of uncertainty there as well. Um, I think it's a, an approach that benefits Vermont consumers. Uh, so it's an approach that we don't have a concern with. Um, but I think, again, the board should just be aware that there is a degree of uncertainty as to how that plays out. And um, and some of that is, is based on factors that are beyond our control. Some of it are based on factors that are not, uh, we're not able to project at the moment and factors relating to the pandemic. Um, but you know, again, uh, because that was followed through into the rate, um, we don't take any objection to it. So the bottom line is, you know, with the rates that are filed and with the financial projections that we have um, in front of us, we do believe that uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield will be uh, above their range potentially in 2021. Uh, but when you factor in uh, some impacts that are likely to happen or expected to happen, I'll put it that way, uh, in 2022, uh, they will be back within the range, uh, somewhere in the low, medium uh, end of that range. So 
the 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 rate that's filed here um, you know takes into account its need to keep up its surplus requirements it takes into account some of the trends that they're seeing both favorable and not so favorable um, and uh, and like we said uh, takes into account the fact that they've seen improved results recently that's followed through into the rate uh, and these COVID impacts that they are experiencing whether due to um, you know, emergency bulletins or regulations that our department put in place to try to help Vermonters and protect Vermonters or whether it's due to other uh, pandemic related impacts, you know, those have been picked up by the surplus, which uh, certainly is an appropriate use of the surplus. So, you know, I think as we say every year, you know, we, you know, based on, based on the filing, based on Oliver Wyman's review, uh, the rate is, um, appears adequate. It does not appear excessive. Uh, and again, any diversions from the rate as filed, certainly we would want those to be actuarially supported um, because if they are not actuarially supported, um, it could result uh, in Blue Cross Blue Shield not meeting its surplus target for the year um, and uh, could, again, in the long term impact uh, Vermont consumers. So I'll leave it there and, and certainly happy to expand upon anything that I touched on or answer any questions as well. Thank you. Blue Cross, do you have any questions for the commissioner? Mr. Hearing Officer, we have no questions at this time. I'd appreciate being able to reserve the right to circle back if anything arises in further testimony. Um, but at this point, we have no questions. Mr. Engel. Yeah, I do have a few questions and I want to make sure that I don't talk about anything publicly that is supposed to be non-public. If you think that I'm getting close to the line, please stop me. I'll, I, I think I know what the line is, but uh, if I get too close to it, please stop me. Uh, good morning, Mr. Commissioner. Good morning, nice to see you. You too. Um, you said that Blue Cross is going to be above the maximum RBC uh, range and that is above the, 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 the maximum of your target uh, range in, at, at year in 2021? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, I, I would add one um, bit of caveat to two caveats to that really one relating to 2021 and one relating to 2022. Relating to 2021, there, like I mentioned, there are certain known impacts you know, there is a, a CSR payment, there's a alternative minimum tax payment. We know those are gonna happen as a matter of timing. If only those things happen, they will, um, the company will only be within the range. If some of the other expected things happen, and again, these are forecasted things uh, happen in 2021, uh, they would be likely above the range. But again, looking comprehensively over the next 18 months, uh, it's expected that uh, they will then again, see negative impacts in 2022 that would bring them uh, back within the range, not above the range. Okay. And uh, one of the uh, conditions that reduces the RBC ratio is the impact of year end actuarial assumptions in connection with the change in, pen in uh, pension funded status. Do you understand? You may not be able to answer this but do you know what that means do you know what the what the uh difference in the actuarial assumptions is that uh causes the uh drop in rbc yeah for sure so i mean i think we mentioned that in 20 uh you know 20 they had a favorable statutory income so mostly derived from uh improved underwriting so that was like 13.2 uh, million uh but uh, there was a reduction in capital, uh, and that reduction in capital uh, ended up being you know, about 29, you know, 29.9 million or something like that. So, with that positive 13.2, uh, came a, a loss, a realized loss from the pension uh, that actually made the capital go down again by about 29.8 or 29.9. Uh, so, that was realized in 2020. Uh, which obviously did have a, a significant impact uh, on the RBC. And then there's another element uh, 
that has to do with deficiency reserve accrual, which very substantially reduces uh, statutory RGC. Could you explain what that is? Yeah, so I, I believe what that is, and and I'm happy to have Zach uh, add in if he has anything on this point. But what I believe that is is looking ahead into the future year and understanding what they uh, believe um, will be a negative impact from uh, COVID and other factors, and they are accounting for that uh, currently uh, in their financial statements. Okay, and the um, just one or two more questions. You. Obviously, you know as well as, if not more than anyone, how Blue Cross's business has decreased substantially over the past five years, and MVPs has increased substantially. Could, could you explain why that is, just in layman's terms? Yeah, for sure. So, uh, you know, I think just again, hold, to take a broader view, I mean, there's a lot of Blue Cross Blue Shield's business that is beyond the plans that we're talking about today. Um, whether that's in, uh, you know, uh, self-insured plans through employers, whether that's through supplemental plans and, and the like. So um, when you look at it holistically, you know, they have been quite stable, I would say, uh, over the last five years. When you do look at the small and individual group, um, they have been losing market share uh, to MVP. Uh, you could account for a number of reasons why that is. I think probably consumers and small businesses move because of pricing. I mean, that's going to be the main motivating factor. Uh, so just in layman's terms, you know, they might find the pricing to be more advantageous in MVP. And, and that's why you're seeing market market share um, move away. Uh, other factors certainly could be consumer or sorry, customer assistance. But Blue Cross Blue Shield certainly has a very strong record, in our opinion, uh, on those types of customer assistance issues. So there are other factors as well, but again, I would think price would be the main the main reason. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. That's all the questions I have. Do any board members have questions for the commissioner? Um, I have a question. Um, am I? Um, my question is that, you know, I understand that um, Blue Cross is at 480 RBC as of 1231. Um, yet they had, you know, two major adjustments due to the pension, and they would have been at 702 had those not occurred. And, and clearly those were extraordinary. Um, so how do, how do you think about, I know you said, you know, they're kind of at the low low end, and if we didn't have all these other things coming forward, some additional credits that didn't happen in maybe the year we thought they would, you know, you would be um, pretty concerned. Um, yet the big hit to their RBC was these pension issues that really weren't, you know, the underlying performance of the business. So, you know, how do we think about um, rate payers having to pay for that? Um, because had they not been in the number, we would have been at 700. So, you know, on the higher end, towards the higher end of the range. Um, and we're not. Yeah. And with some of these one time yes. adjustments, we would have been above that. So. Yeah, no, it's a great question. So. So I, I think the way I would think of it at the moment is um, I would say nothing is certain at, in terms of that pension issue. I would say it's a matter of at this point, um, timing. And why I say that is, you know, some of those losses obviously had to be reflected in uh, the current 2020 financial statements that had an RBC impact, no doubt. Uh, but uh, it's not a, a, a it's not, the issue is not over. I mean, there is active uh, litigation that, um, you know, I won't go into in great detail, but there's active litigation from uh, the Blue Cross Blue Shield National, uh, you know, uh, pension group. There are a number of other pension groups across the country that have filed litigation against Allianz, um, the Teamsters, Labor Union, the M MTA, uh, Teachers Associ Teachers Pension Funds. So there is ongoing litigation that um, you know is uh, is a live issue, and we'll see how that results. It probably be, will be a number of years until it's resolved. There's a lot of money uh, being discussed, but you know on that litigation uh, issue, I would I would prefer to be on the plaintiff side of the position than the defendant side. I'll just say that. 
And um, we'll see how that plays out and we'll see what kind of result uh, settles uh, from that. So I think that needs to be factored in. And then, you know, basically instead of that being here and now in real dollars, we have to sort of wonder what it will be in some future year, but hopefully that impact will be felt by the company and uh, and that ultimately should benefit uh, ratepayers as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't have any additional questions. Do any other board members have questions for the commissioner or, or Mr. Smith? Sure, I'll jump in, Mike. Um, commissioner Pichek, um, I'm sure that uh, uh, Jesse Lucier reported back uh, after Monday's hearing that um, I expressed some frustration over the length of time it took for the report that was prepared on um, possible rate rebates. You know, Governor Scott uh, tasked uh, DFR on January 7th. Um, is it a, was the release just last the end of last week due to um, a delay that Oliver Wyman created, or was there internal um, discussions about the uh, conclusions? Yeah, so I, I would say the the reason was was neither of those. I mean, uh, you know, we we did uh, you know get the directive from the governor on 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 January seventh to look into this issue, and uh, we put out um, a request for data from to the carriers. They uh, responded. It was a lot of work for them to respond. I will will say that Oliver Wyman did a tremendous amount of work in February, as did our department, and um, as is alluded to in the report. We came to some initial conclusions on March 1st, which is when the governor wanted uh, us to report back to him. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, on March 1st, the, the report um, said there was just too much uncertainty. We certainly saw that all of the carriers had benefited in 2020 from COVID, from a direct COVID impact. But there was sort of wild speculation as to what would happen in 2021. I believe the overall range uh, in terms of the impact was on the low end a negative, a slight negative impact, uh, up to a $50 million favorable impact. So the range was was extensive and we couldn't make any de definitive determinations at that time. So what we said that we wanted to do was get some actual 2021 data um, and then uh, you know take some of that uncertainty off the table and then see if we could make any definitive decisions at that time. So we decided to wait until June to to re-examine the report. Uh, we were able to get actual data through the end of April. Um, that data came in, you know, end of May, early June. Oliver Wyman, again, worked really, um, really uh, significantly uh, for, for quite a period of time, weekends, holidays, nights, all that sort of thing, and as did members of our team as well. Um, and we wanted to get it done as quickly as possible. We wanted to get it done before the rate hearing because we thought it might have some value to the board um, and to the discussions. Um, and basically when it was done, um, that was as soon as we possibly could have done the analysis and, and made some definitive conclusions. So uh, certainly I wish it could have been earlier, but it would have been it would have been irresponsible and unwise for us to make any definitive conclusions before um, we got that data in 2021 and had time to analyze it uh, this month. One of the things I'm hoping that you can elaborate on a little bit is um, having read the report. Um, maybe you could explain to me how it's OK to in some circumstances say that a rebate um, is appropriate and in other circumstances say that uh, because of uh, anticipated rate filings that the Vermont consumer will benefit that way. If your opinion is that the Vermont uh, consumer would benefit in future rate filings, why wouldn't that have been consistent across all plans? Well, I think every every you're saying you're talking about all carriers or all plans of Blue Cross. Uh, all carriers. All carriers. Yeah, so every carrier had a different experience, you know, from from the pandemic. Um, for example, uh, MVP, but which those you heard, that you came you know, to the conclusion um, that um, there there was some some surplus created. Um, so, for example, um, you have a different recommendation for um, an MA plan and with this particular carrier than you do for the individual and small group. And I, I'm just it, it seems to I'm, I'm struggling with what I see as some inconsistency there. 
Yeah, sure. So we don't view that as inconsistency. The you know the the uh, supplemental plan that you mentioned, uh, you know, it had uh, in Oliver Wyman's determination a, a positive, a favorable uh, impact from COVID. There was also profitability in that um, plan above and beyond the target, above and beyond the COVID impact. Um, so it was a profitable market segment that had uh, identified COVID impact. Uh, so we thought. Um, Consumer relief was certainly warranted there and uh, addressed uh, Blue Cross to um, uh, incorporate that into their upcoming filings that we'll see in the next month or two. Uh, in the small group individual marketplace, uh, there was also a, a favorable you know, financial impact. There was disagreement between, to a degree, there was disagreement between Oliver Wyman uh, and Blue Cross Blue Shield as to whether that was improved morbidity, uh, whether that was improved health outcomes. Uh, or whether it was more attributable to a one-time COVID impact. Blue Cross Blue Shield was of the opinion that that was due to improved morbidity rather than a one-time COVID impact and reflected that into their rates. Now, if we were to, to say, you know, we disagree and we think it's a one-time COVID impact, the rates would be higher, although there would be a one-time consumer credit that would be allowed to, to consumers. So, uh, if Oliver Wyman is right that maybe there was a bigger impact than uh, Blue Cross filed for, you know, then it's a de facto premium credit because Vermonters are going to benefit from those lower rates. Uh, if Blue Cross Blue Shield, you know, turns out to be correct that it was improved morbidity more than a one-time COVID impact, uh, then no um, premium relief was warranted, and and you know, and the the right decision was made as well. So I think you know. Each of those marketplaces is a little bit different, and the situation is a little bit different. But um, but we think they are consistent outcomes within Blue Cross and within uh, within uh, all of the other carriers as well. Yeah, I just like to add uh, a couple of points to uh, to the points that Mike made. Um, you know, regarding the Medicare supplement business, most of the COVID costs were generally borne by the federal government. And not by the plans, which is uh, you know unique to Medicare supplement and other, other Medicare products, and you know was not the case in the in, in the individual small group marketplace where most of the COVID costs were borne by Blue Cross. Um, so, therefore, you wouldn't see the you know a significant portion of um, the co expected cost increase in 2021 are due to. Uh, the return of deferred care from 2020, which is limited by the limited benefit of the Medicare supplement plan, as well as ongoing treatment uh, costs, diagnostic testing costs, and vaccine costs, which were largely which would largely be borne by the federal government. So that's why we believe that the Medicare supplement gains from 2020 were largely locked in, and, and therefore. Our recommendation to provide a credit was consistent with the expectation that there wouldn't be significant um, losses to counter or some losses um, to counteract the gains, some losses in 2021 to counteract the gains from 2020. In the individual small group market, um, as the commissioner mentioned, our, our largest concern um, in trying to parse out the impact due to COVID and the impact due to the favorable morbidity was the fact that this favorable morbidity was largely being, um, there was only two months worth of data of a sort of normal um, run rate, just January and February, 2020, in order to really try to parse out that favorable morbidity. Um, you know, obviously we didn't have, uh, you know, as sophisticated data as Blue Cross did, um, but we just wanted to kind of be a little bit more conservative in the belief that there was a significant improvement in the overall population morbidity and therefore attribute more of, you know, our belief was that potentially more of the, um, the impact of COVID might have been more favorable than what Blue Cross has estimated in, uh, in their own modeling. However, like Mike mentioned, if the, the impact due to COVID over the two-year period was more favorable due to COVID, and this morbidity improvement, um, you know, is less than Blue Cross had estimated. Then, you know, presumably 
the 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 marketplace in 2022 will have increased more than be than projected, and therefore the rates you know could be higher if you had believed that the morbidity, if the COVID impact was more of a one-time thing, and the population morbidity, uh, you know, wasn't as favorable as estimated. This is a picky question, Commissioner, but um, in the report, um, there's language that said that uh, you'll be looking at other um, supplement plans and it says Medicaid. Should that have said Medicare supplement plans? Yeah, Medicare supplemental, Medicare supplement. So are you looking at like United Health and, and plans like that? Yeah, exactly right. So, you know, the, the report, the, you know, we set out, when we set out to, to find the parameters of the report, we looked at basically the, the carriers that, that provide, um, you know, the provide the most care in Vermont, the ones based here, or Cigna, for example, or MVP that do on business here. And, and when the report led us to the fact that um, the Medicare supplement uh, appeared to have a favorable COVID impact, that made us say, well, wait a minute, what are the other plans here that we didn't include in this initial report? And that would be United Health uh, Group and um, Aetna, I think, are the two big uh, Medicare supplement uh, plans. So we uh, we do have their rates and we plan to have Oliver Weinman work with us to um, assess out whether there was any additional, uh, whether there's any additional COVID impact or COVID relief that's not already accounted for in their rates that should be warranted. Thank you. Those are my only questions. I think I just have one quick question, uh, Commissioner Pichak. How are you doing? <laughs> that was good. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. I have okay. a second. Fair enough. Um, I, I want to thank you for the careful analysis that both you and Oliver Wyman did. It's really helpful. Uh, my question is actually more long range uh, than specific to this particular filing, but I think your answer would be important. I'm wondering if you see uh, Vermont's efforts, and indeed, actually, as we heard testimony this morning, Blue Cross Blue Shield's efforts to move towards more fixed perspective payment as a mechanism to reduce payer risk and uncertainty um, and potentially reduce pressure on CTR, potentially reduce administrative costs if there's fewer, you know, claims transactions happening, if it's rather a fixed payment. Is that a mechanism to reduce premiums going forward and uh, reduce CTR needs, reduce administrative costs? Yeah, so it's a great question. Uh, so, I mean, on the risk piece of that question, you know, uh, certainly, um, the more risk that is shared, it's not solely on the payer, the, the, the less volatility the payer is going to experience, the less need for maybe for as much capital uh, requirements as there have been in the past, maybe the, maybe less need for the same contribution to, to reserves or surplus that there was in the past of 1.5 target, maybe that's a lower target. Maybe, you know, maybe that, you know, anyway, so there, so all of that is true. I think the administrative cost certainly is a good um, uh, a good example as well. There's just less claims management, and that obviously is expensive um, and time-consuming. Uh, so I think all of that is a fair representation of what um, you know. What I think the upside is um, over the next few, you know, let's call it five years, uh, as you move to more uh, fixed uh, fixed uh, payment structure. Um, so you know, I think there. So will they will they reduce premiums? I mean, I, I, I you know. They won't. I think it's fair to say that hopefully it will have a favorable impact on the rates. That either they won't go up by as much as they would have otherwise, or they will stay flat, or maybe they'll go down. But I think it'll have a favorable impact on the rates certainly. So, with that in mind, is there a plan, or is there a trigger amount of contracts that are in fixed perspective payment that DFR would see and then revisit the RBC range that you've just recently estimated for Blue Cross Blue Shield downward? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, so I'm trying to remember if I don't think we said in the report that we would do it every three years. Maybe we did the initial report. I thought it was every five years that we were we would reexamine Blue Cross generally, even you know, separate from this issue that we're talking about now, just to see what its risk profile was and what it and what its appropriate, you know, range would be. Um, so I think I think it was five years. So that's probably coming up in about two years. So I think, you know. Whatever, regardless of what percentage they're at at that point, I think that's an appropriate time to um, look at the risk profile generally, and that would be part of the um, analysis as well. 
Um, but I wouldn't, I don't, I, maybe there's a, a target in terms of percentage of, of um, business that is on the fixed schedule that, that we can think about a little bit more, but certainly at some point in time, the risk profile will change and that should be reflected in the, in the RBC um, range and the analysis that we've done. And then my final question is, um, given what we know about, you know, fixed perspective payment having this, for example, potential impact on slowing, pre you know, premium growth, but also having a uh, potential to improve delivery system reform efforts, you know, in terms of shifting, you know, care towards preventative care and, and away from some of the volume driven, you know, uh, potentially uh, curative care. Um, I'm wondering, are there any things that DFR can do to incent more fixed perspective payment contracts? And just in your portfolio, your regulatory levers, is there anything? We're thinking about what the Green Mountain Care Board can do. I mean, so my, my question is, what can DFR do in this regard? Yeah, um, it's probably a question that we should think about um, in a little bit more detail and, and happy to respond to the full board in a written response following up on this. But, um, you know, I, I would say at this point, we are, um, our department is engaged on the issue with uh, the impacted carriers um, and certainly encouraging and willing to work with them on any challenges they face that are within DFR's jurisdiction. Um, so, I wouldn't say we have been, um, you know, creating incentives or or sticks or carrots or whatnot, but we certainly have been engaged. And when there is a challenge, we certainly are willing to work and try to alleviate that. Again, if it's within our jurisdiction, I think oftentimes these issues aren't, but there may very well be um, broader opportunities for us to to be more uh, to be more engaged in the marketplace and, and happy to happy to think about that more and respond. I would really appreciate that. Thank you very much. And I think questions? just to sorry, I think the just the the board. You know, I think the last piece where where you mentioned, you know, actually seeing the reduction in, in cost of care is the is the critical piece there at, at the second part of your question because. Um, you know, we mentioned how it might impact insurance premiums by shifting the risk and, and whatnot, but unless you're getting those better health outcomes, you know, the, the cost is still there. It's just moving to some other part of the healthcare structure. But, uh, you know, I, I think, um, you know, not in my first answer, I was just focusing on the insurance piece, right? So, uh, you know, that that is the risk, I guess, and you're well aware of that. But um, but again, that's the hope is that it actually pushes down, uh, not not just shift the risk and, and sort of have a have a sort of a you know, on paper impact, but that actually improves the the health outcomes and the and the risk, the health risk of the population at all. Any further questions from the board members? Um, Mr. Nacrio, you had wanted an uh, opportunity to follow up. Do you have any questions? I don't. Thank you for circling back. OK, then uh, I'll excuse the commissioner and um, Mr. Smith. Thank you for your testimony. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I guess we are close to <clears throat> a reasonable lunch break. Um, like I mentioned before, I also don't expect Jackie's testimony to take a long time. I would assume, unless one of the parties telling me differently, we could do that, uh, get through that probably before one. Um, does anybody, including board members, have a preference for breaking now or seeing if we can get through Jackie's testimony and then break for lunch? Depending on, on how the uh, parties respond, I, I would rather get through Jackie. That's fine with me, Mr. Chair. Same, that, that works for me. Thank you. And why don't we do that? Ms. Bellavo, are you 
prepared for that? Yes, certainly. Um, everyone can hear me OK? We can. Jackie, could you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. OK, thank you. Go ahead, Ms. Belva. Good morning. Uh, can you please state your name for the record? Uh, Jacqueline Lee. And where do you work? I work at Lewis and Ellis. And what is your position at Lewis and Ellis? I am a vice president and principal. Great. Um, can you please turn to exhibit 22 of the binder? OK, I am there. And do you recognize exhibit 22? Yes, this is my pre filed testimony. OK, can you uh, briefly describe the information contained in this document? Yes, uh, it gives a background of my professional background, a background about Lewis and Ellis and our experience doing rate reviews, our experience in the state of Vermont specifically, and our experience with healthcare reform issues. It also dives into our standard of review, um, how we go about our review process and um, how we get information from the carriers. Um, and then um, outlines that we issue a formal report um, to the board um, that becomes part of this um, hearing today. OK, is the information in this document accurate and correct to the best of your knowledge? Yes, it is. Okay. Is there any information in this document you would like to change or clarify at this time? Uh, no, there is not. Uh, do you wish to adopt this pre file testimony as part of your testimony today? I do. And can you briefly explain your role in LE's review of this filing? Yes. Um, we work as a team on reviewing the filings. Uh, Kevin Ruggeberg, uh, who is an FSA at our firm, also helped do the primary review. Uh, with uh, working with Blue Cross and their actuaries to get answers to our inquiries. Um, Dave Dillon does an overall peer review of all of the filings, and I fit in as a, an additional level of peer review where I'm more hands on between both carriers to ensure consistency between the two filings um, in this market and just ensure that we have um, we are able to answer any questions about the rate filing for uh, the board or for this hearing. And then how do you submit your recommendations to the board? We provide a report that is based on the uh, URT, which is a uh, reporting tool that is federally prescribed um, for carriers to provide as part of their filing. We utilize that as the backbone of our report to ensure that there's consistency and co comparability between the two filings. And you make specific recommendations to the board? Yes, we do. Um, now your report is exhibit 16. Could you please turn to that? Yes, I am there. And uh, do you have any changes you wish to make to your report at this time? I do not. Can you walk us through your standard of review, please? Yes, for our standard of review, it is outlined on page three of our report. Um, we follow um, what the board has been um, prescribed with doing, which is reviewing the rates. We stick to the actuarial components where we focus on the whether the rate is excessive, inadequate, or unfairly discriminatory. All of those have been defined within my pre-filed testimony. Um, that we previously addressed. And do you review for affordability? We do not. Uh, can you uh, elaborate on that a little bit? Sure, we do not uh, do a review of affordability. Um, that is one of the requirements of the board, um, but that's just not an actuarial item um, and not prescribed uh, within the actuarial standards of practice, so it's outside of our scope. Thanks. Uh, using your methodology and standard of review, did you make any recommendations to modify this proposed filing? Yes, we did. 
there on page uh, 23 of exhibit of exhibit 16. Uh, we had four recommendations that have been outlined. Um, can you uh, please discuss your recommendation about updating hospital budgets? Yes, um, each year the hospital budgets as part of the hospital budget process with the Green Mountain Care Board submits um, budgets for approval and that occurs within our kind of time frame of this filing, but it is not known in advance when the carriers are submitting their rates nor um, when we are creating our report. There's a window of time between the our report submission and the hearing that this comes out and they are actually ultimately approved after um, the rates are are approved or ordered any orders are made by the board. Uh, so we always um, defer to if we get any new information after the report is submitted, our report is submitted that we would be able to make those recommended changes based on those submissions. And we have recommended that at this time too. Great. Um, and you have reviewed the other pre file testimony in this proceeding. Yes, I have. And you've listened to the testimony today so far. Yes, I have. Great. Um, having reviewed the pre file testimony and listened to the testimony today so far, do you wish to amend or add to uh, your recommendation about updated hospital budget information? Um, I don't have anything formal at this time. We did agree with Blue Cross's methodology. Um, one of the key points of the su submissions from the hospitals is that they are not typically um, approved as submitted. And so one of the actions that Mr. Schultz took when he was doing his review with his team of the new hospital budgets was to uh, remove any excess requests to be more in line with what the board has submitted. So we are performing that analysis and we will be providing an addendum to our report post hearing uh, to address what the historical um, declines have been or differences are between what was submitted and what was approved. And we will work with the board to determine what um, what we think was, you know, an actual is sound adjustment to for this at this for this particular component. Great. Now, um, moving to uh, risk adjustment transfers, uh, could you please discuss your recommendation concerning that issue? Yes. Uh, again, this is another uh, common recommendation that we make in each year. Uh, the CMS puts forth uh, on June 30th of each year, with the exception of 2020, um, the actual 20 calendar year 2020 uh, risk transfers between the carriers in all throughout the nation. That information is obviously comes after the submission by the carriers. Um, so what we do is we request that that information be considered and incorporated within the uh, within the rate filing and and Blue Cross has agreed that that should be included as a change. And um, having reviewed the pre filed testimony and listened to the testimony today so far, do you wish to amend or add to your recommendation about the risk adjustment transfer? I do not. And now could you please discuss your recommendation concerning the update to the bronze CDHP cost sharing? Yes, um, again, after filing the IRS made a determination regarding the that impacted the standard bronze CDHP plan that resulted in a very minor change to that plan alone and does not have an overall impact on rates. And that recommendation remains unchanged at this time. Great. Um, and uh, now can you discuss your recommendation concern concerning the impact of ARPA on claims? Yes, um, we asked uh, both carriers about the um, introduction of ARPA and how that would impact the morbidity of the population. Um, when we did so, um, we got varying responses, and so we decided to perform a market-wide um, review of how ARPA would impact, and we determined the number of folks who are eligible within this population 
And as that population would be basically um, treated as a possible new entrant into the market, um, we decided that in the event that we had some differences between the two carriers and the enrollment between the two of them, that that would be handled and mostly accounted for within risk adjustment. So we assume that both carriers would be impacted equally from a rating perspective. And we performed an analysis which resulted in a decline of 0.2% in the individual market alone, because it's the only segment that is impacted by ARPA. And uh, does that uh, recommendation remain unchanged? Yes, it does. Thanks. If your recommendations as of today are implemented, do you believe that rates would be excessive? No, I do not. Do you believe they would be inadequate? No, I do not. Do you believe they would be unfairly discriminatory? No, I do not. Okay. Um, I have no further questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Oval. Mr. D'Onofrio or Ms. Acey, do you have questions for Ms. Lee? Uh, very, thank you. Very briefly, just two questions. Um, good morning, Ms. Lee. Good morning. As part of uh, the work that you've been testifying about, did you review Blue Cross's trend calculations um, contained in the rate filing? Yes, we reviewed both medical and pharmacy trends. And did you find them to be reasonable and appropriate? Yes, we did. Thank you. Nothing further. Mr. Ingo. Good morning, Ms. Lee. Good morning, Mr. Ingo. Uh, on page two of your report, uh, the 2021 approved rate changes, again, that's that's that 4.2% in the the bottom number in the third column, that's approved, that's not proposed, correct? That is correct. And proposed was higher, right? I believe so, yes. Okay, and so just could you turn to page five uh, in that chart there that says 20 actual over projected claims experience. Again, that's based on the approved filing, not the filed filing. Correct. Yes, you're talking about the minus 8.3 for that component. I'm sorry, say it again. You're you're talking about the minus 8.3 on line one. Yes. Yes, that is a, a comparison of the from the approved URT last year to what they are proposing this year. And so that number would have been more negative had the uh, had Blue Cross's filing been approved as filed, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, can you just go down to page uh, line 12, changes in contributions to reserves? You see the plus one there? Oh, yes. Yeah. Do you have an estimate or just a rule of thumb of how much difference in the rate a point of contribution to reserves makes? Um, it's roughly 0.1. Um, there are some differences being it's an expense component, but it's it's roughly the same. Oh, OK, so, so a, a, a percent of CTR is would raise the rate by a percent. Yes. OK, and similar type of question. Uh, do you have a, an estimate or a rule of thumb as to how much a point of CTR is worth in the RBC ratio, how much it, how much difference one point of CTR makes with respect to the RBC ratio? Uh, the RBC ratio is a very uh, complicated formula, so I don't know that offhand. Suppose I know there's a range, obviously that's the target range um, by the department. Is there? Let's assume that uh, Blue Cross's uh, RBC was in the middle of the target range, which is 665. Would you be able to give some kind of estimate, uh, assuming that that were their uh, RBC? An impact of uh, assuming in the RBC and then assuming. Yeah, uh, uh, assuming assuming that their RBC ratio is in the middle of the 
commissioner's target range, which is 665. Could you then, given that, could you give some kind of estimate as to how much a point of CTR is worth, how, how much CTR would affect that uh, RDC number? Again, it, it, it didn't, I wasn't confused about kind of the, the starting point. The RBC calculation is very complex and it um, has a lot of moving parts. Uh, so I can't comment um, to that at this time. Okay. Do you have a, any kind of range? As, no, as, I mean, no, there are there are lots of potential outcomes to that. I would I would have to think about what that implies. Um, and again, this also is a small portion. The RBC is not calculated um, for just the individual and small group or QHP filings. So that would also have to be considered in in within that response. I get it. Um, how about this? Can you give any estimate of how much a point of trend is worth in the rate filing? Um, it is not a one to one. Um, are you talking about total trend or, or yeah. annual yes, trend? Total trend. Total trend um, again, it, it's going to only impact claims. Um, so it would only impact that portion. Um, it, therefore, it's not impacting the expense portion of it. So it, it wouldn't be a one to one. It would be a little bit lesser than that. Roughly, I guess, you know, 80 percent. So let me of make one, sure. Of a one you mean a, a point of trend would worth is would be worth about 0.8 in the rate or do I have that backwards? No, I think that's that's a roughly accurate. A point of trend is worth about 0.8 in the rate. Roughly 1.0 of trend would be a 0 0.8 to the rate. Very good. We understand each other. Thank you. Um, what's the difference between utilization and intensity in connection with trend? The difference between you utilization trend and intensity. Is that what you said? Yes. Um, so Utilization trend um, typically ha is just how many services are happening over a period of time. Intensity trend is looking more at the types of services that are being rendered. So um, how I always think about it is, are there more x-rays or are there more MRIs? If you're moving more towards MRIs, your, tr your intensity trend is getting greater. Or if there are more complex procedures that you are moving towards, uh, that would increase your intensity. You don't necessarily have more services. You would just have more extensive ones. Okay. Um, do all, you you have reviewed uh, rate filings for several companies, right? Yes. Okay. And do all the companies whose rate filings you have reviewed include a separate factor for utilization and one and a separate factor for uh, intensity? Um, not all of them specifically call out intensity. Okay. Almost turn, all of them have you all of them have utilization though. Could you turn please to page nine? I'm there. And do you see there in the third paragraph under medical prescription trend, you've got a the second sentence says that the referring to the twelve point four percent says that twelve point four percent is slightly higher than the approximately 10% annual increase observed between 2018 and 2020. You see that? Yes, I do. Okay. Would it be unreasonable to use the 10% rather than the 12.4%? Uh, I don't think it would be unreasonable. I think as we've noted within this um, hearing today, um, there are also um, there's a range of reasonable results, so I think that would be within reason. Very good. Could you turn please to page 11? And this is a question on your, along the same line. You see the first, uh, the, the, in the first full paragraph, the first sentence states the 2020 increase in the number of claims was approximately 2.4% while the 2019 increase was 1.8%. I see that, yes. 
would it be reasonable to use as a the assumed uh, non-specialty utilization trend, which is discussed in that paragraph? Would it be reasonable to use a number in between those two, in between 2.4 and 1.8? Um, just to confirm, uh, this is what is, I, I don't want to sit here and read it. Um, it what is this in? This, sorry. This is, <laughs> sure, this is at the, the top of page 11, and uh, the first full paragraph, your conclusion is Eleni believes the chosen non specialty utilization trend of 3.0% is reasonable. Thank you. And what, oh, okay. Yes, so it's for the non specialty trend. Is that correct? Yes, non specialty. Okay, util okay. sorry. Non specialty <laughs> utilization trend. Um, non specialty utilization trend. Um, I don't know that I would, I, I definitely think it would be okay to be within that range. I'm not sure I would go all the way down to 1.8, though, given that 2020 is closer to 2.4 and there were other methods that were three to four percent so i think going down to 1.8 would be a little bit dangerous and outside of reasonable but i do think that it could be 2.4 slightly there below very good um and then in the next paragraph now you're talking about the unit cost for generic drugs and you say three percent per year is, appears reasonable would i uh, the 2.6 percent which you say is over the last two years would that also be reasonable? That would also be reasonable. And in the next paragraph, um, you talk about a 10.3%, per, 10 uh, I'm sorry, you talk about a 10.3% average over the last two years for brand unit cost trend, and you select a 10%. And my only question there is, did you go back and look at a third year for brand unit cost? And if so, do you know what that was? Um, I do not remember at this time. I would have to look, and I don't know what it is. Okay. Um, could you turn to page 13, please? Okay. And you see just about at the middle of the, of the page, do you see the, set, the sentence? It's the second sentence in the paragraph beginning. It is expected. You see there the sentence, Eleni assumes that this new population will be 10% healthier than the currently covered population? Yes, I see that. Okay, and and that's just, that's within a, a, a range, right? It could be higher, it could be lower. Yes, it could. What do you think would be the top of the, the of a reasonable range? Mm -hmm. I, I'm not really sure I'm equipped to answer that question. I'll give you, you know, I think, when we were doing our testing, um, we looked at 20 and 30 percent um, as as for healthier. Um, certainly, that's going to vary very significantly by individual, but um, that was what we looked at and just decided that we would strike a balance of a conservative number that would be um, potentially achievable. Okay, so so 10 percent is a conservative number. Yes. Uh, could you please go down to paragraph five? And th this is a quibble. I, I think there might be a typo, but it also may be the case that I just misunderstand it. And did you see that last paragraph there that starts with last year's filing? Yes. Okay. And the, the, the first line says that the company assumed a seven, a point seven percent increase in costs, right? That is, that's what it says. Okay, and then the next sentence says that the data suggest that not only was there not a seven percent, point seven percent increase in costs, there was a point one percent decrease in costs, right? Yes. Okay, and then in the next sentence, you say replacing a point, a positive point seven with a positive point one has a combined effect of 0.8%. Uh, but it, you, you mean, don't you, that it's replacing a positive 0.7 with a negative 0.1, right? I believe that is correct, yes. That would yeah, make so, sense. So Blue Cross was wrong both 
both about the size of the delta and the direction of the delta, right? So, so will you rephrase that, please, or ask that again? Yeah, but, so but Blue Cross thought said there'd be an increase. In fact, there was a decrease. Oh, uh, um, yes, um, I would note that um, risk adjustment um, does assist in making a correction there. Uh, could you turn please to page 15? And in the first in the first paragraph below the chart, you say that Blue Cross, you note that Blue Cross applied an adjustment of 4.7 percent to the 2020 experience. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Okay. Is, is that the effect of COVID or is that something else? Um, I believe that is the impact of COVID, though I reserve that to be there might be some other pieces in there, but I believe that is COVID because we're talking about um, them estimating estimating the impact of COVID and that chart is really outlining 2020 and you can see the blue line having the dip during the um, during the time of the shelter in place. So COVID. Very good. Continuing on that page. Uh, paragraph eight changes to risk adjustment. Could you help me understand what year? Let's see. Uh, strike, let, let me ask it this way. Does does what you say in that paragraph, that is that Blue Cross paid less in claims during 2020 than anticipated? Uh, can I pause you? Can you tell me where you're at? Um, you sure. said 18? Page yeah, yeah, page no, page fifteen, the same page we were, we were. Oh, I'm sorry. My last question was on, and it's just the next paragraph, yes. number eight. I'm sorry. Okay. Yes, I'm there now. And is my understanding correct that the thrust of that paragraph eight is that Blue Cross received a double benefit? That is, that it paid less in claims during 2020 than it anticipated and also received more in risk transfers than it did in 2019. Yes, that's what that says. <clears throat> Could you turn page please to page 18 and we're just about done. Uh, I am on page 18. Good. Um, you see the first bullet that is labeled decreasing enrollment, in impact of decreasing enrollment? Yes. Okay. And um, the, the last sentence there is that rather than increasing administrative costs by 5.4% and administrative costs were increased by 3.8%. Yes, I see that. Okay. And, and is that because Blue Cross had less business? Or it, it, it's, let me ask it this way. Is, is that because Blue Cross is projecting less business in this year's rate filing than it did in last year's filing? I know that they are have been experiencing decreased enrollment. Um, I. I'm trying to remember if they I believe that they don't make a direct projection of future members, um, but they've been seeing decreased enrollment throughout this time period. So I, I think it's more of a ref reflection of the decreased enrollment over time that they continue to have less than they than they than they have had in the past. Okay, and so it's it, so it's reasonable to continue to uh, assume an increase administer an increase in in administrative costs based on continuing decreased enrollment for twenty twenty two. Yes. Are you Rick? Are are you saying that? I guess can you restate the question? I, I'm not following what you're yeah, asking. I'm, the that paragraph is entitled impact of decreasing enrollment. And 
it, it's true, isn't it, then, that the assumption in the rate filing is that enrollment will decrease, correct? Yes, from the base period. Okay. Thank you very much, Ms. Lee. That's all the questions I have. Thank you. All right, now we'll go to board questions, starting with member Pelham. Good afternoon, Jackie. It's just it's become afternoon while you've been sitting there. That's right. I um, saw so I have one question. Um, in is it standard procedure um, in 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 the actuarial world relative to uh, hospital budgets? The kind of to take a look at where those budgets might be prospectively, where um, a request for budget increase has been filed. Um, but no decision has been made. I mean, in, in the Vermont market that that happens in every rate uh, filing that we've been a part of, that there's been a submission, but there's been no conclusion of as to that submission. Right. But um, but is is the Vermont approach a, a common approach? Outside um, most, of most most. Uh, the reason I made that caveat about Vermont is there's very few states that have um, hospital regulation. Okay, and so um, Paul Schultz this morning talked about you know looking at the requested increases for 2022 by hospitals and then factoring them back a little bit by some factor that that he determined um, uh, is a you know give some insight into the relationship between the the requested increases and the approved increases. And I thought I heard you say that you were going to take a look back as well. Yes. So will that be by hospital? Yes, it will. And how far back will you go? Uh, I believe we'll go back as we've performed this every year. And so I think we've done three or four years of this. So it, I think we'll end up going back four ish years or so. So it'll be a pretty long time period, but we do take special note because since the board has changed over that time, we do try to tend lean towards the more recent years when we're really making those determinations because the makeup of the board um, impacts that particular change. Uh, so, so do you equally rate yes votes and no votes by board <laughs> members? <laughs> 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 Absolutely, everybody is important here. <laughs> I, I'll look. I'll look forward for to your analysis. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. Board member Lunch, do you have questions for Jackie? I do not. Board member Yusufer. I do not either. Board member Holmes. I do not. Mr. Chair, nor do I. Uh, Mr. D'Onofrio or, or Ms. AC, anything further? Uh, Mr. Hearing Officer, may I have a, a one minute break to uh, consult with Ms. AC on some potential redirect? Sure. Thank you.
I'm ready to proceed, Mr. Hearing Officer, when everybody else is. We all are. Um, so do you have any follow up questions? Just yes, just a, a small handful. Thank you. Um, Ms. Lee, Mr. Angoff took you through a series of examples in um, Eleni's report and asked you whether um, lower assumptions than those chosen by Blue Cross might also be reasonable. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. Is, is it also conceivable that in the in the course of you know put, developing these rates, Blue Cross might have chosen higher assumptions than the ones they chose and still remained within a reasonable range? Yes, that's fair. Um, I think it's also important to note that they should also be reviewed in the aggregate to make sure that the aggregate result is reasonable as well. You you anticipated my next question. Thank you. Um, in in, ter in terms of thinking about aggregate results, would it, in your view, um, if a carrier were to choose the low end of the reasonable range for every single assumption throughout a filing, is it likely that the that that rate would be reasonable when considered in in the aggregate um if you were to choose the low end of the range on every assumption it is likely that it would push towards becoming inadequate okay could you turn to um page 13 of your report which is exhibit 16. yes um and the, the last paragraph on that page, you were asked some questions about that. Do you remember? Yes. By Mr. Uh, regarding the demographic shift? That's right. Yes. Um, so the there's a 0.7% increase that's referenced in that paragraph. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And, it, and is it your understanding that that 0.7% increase measured changes from 2019 to 2021? Yes, that is what that 0.7 represents. OK, and then th that paragraph also refer references a 0.1% a decrease, right? Yes, it does. And that decrease is measuring changes from 2020 to 2022, right? That's correct. So those two numbers are measuring different things, right? Yes, they are different time periods. OK. and. I think you got a question from Mr. Angoff along the lines of, so this this represents some sort of error on Blue Cross's part. Do you remember that? Yes. But but it doesn't, right? It's those two numbers are referencing different things, right? They are referencing two to separate time periods. Okay, thank you. Um, just a couple more. Could you turn to where did I put it? Exhibit one, page forty-seven. And let me know when you're there. I am there. Um, so you see there's a table at the top and then some text. Yes. Would you please read the second sentence in the text below the table? When projecting the 2022 enrollment, we include the observed membership losses in 2021 projected organic growth in 2022 and expected growth due to additional subsidies from the American Rescue Plan and is expected impact on membership. So so what Blue Cross is saying there is that in these rates, they included additional enrollment from observed um, 2021 enrollment, right? Uh, addition, they assumed additional losses in 2021. And that that in turn lowers the admin charge, right? Um, um, I, I guess it, it generally yes, but there are some fixed fixed expenses that it would not. Fixed expenses would not. If you had lesser enrollment. Sorry, did I not answer your question? <laughs> I, 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 um, if I could, if I could have another moment, I may have garbled the question. Okay. I, I apologize. Thank you. That's okay.
Apologies. I, I it's it's difficult for a lawyer to to think like an actuary, and I may have garbled the question. Um, so my que uh, returning your attention to to that sentence from page forty seven. Um, isn't it true that Blue Cross observed um, losses in twenty twenty one? Right. In membership, yes. Yep. Sorry, in membership, but projected membership growth from twenty twenty one to twenty twenty two. Right. Yeah, organic and due to ARPA, yes. And 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 that that and what impact would that dynamic have on the admin charge? So, I, I mean, I think it depends what how if the losses were overcome by growth, but in general, if you have membership growth, your fixed expenses are going to be spread across, across a wider base of people. So membership growth would decrease admin costs. If you have membership declines, that fixed cost would not be among distributed among as many people. So it, expenses would increase. Does that help? Yes. And one final question just to clarify. So so projected membership growth correlates to projected um, lowering of the admin charge. That's correct. Yes. OK, thank you. I have no further questions and I, I appreciate everyone's indulgence on the, the breaks. Mr. Angoff, did you have anything further to? I believe everyone wants to eat lunch. I have no questions. OK, thank you, Miss Lee. Thank you. So at this point, I think it is a good time to take uh, a lunch break. Um, thinking half an hour would be best since there's still a bit to go. Um, and when we return, I understand we're going to hear from Kate Macint Dr. Kate McIntosh. Is that correct? Mike and Bridget. Hi. Uh I think we may be hearing from Ruth Green when we return because of the switch in order. Um, I think that's our expectation at this point. OK, good to know. Um, and I expect that there will be an executive session associated with that testimony. Uh, and in that we would uh, invite Paul uh, in case there are questions for him. So just be prepared for that. Um, so why don't we break? now and reconvene at one o'clock. Okay, okay. Thank, you. thank you. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, Ms. Stacey. Would you please state your full name for the record? Ruth Green. Ms. Green, what is your position with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont? I hold the position of treasurer and CFO. Would you please take a look at Exhibit 19 in your binder? Yep, I'm there. Is that your pre-filed testimony in this matter? It is. Yes, it do you, is. Do you affirm that it is true and correct to the best of your knowledge? I do. Does your pre-filed testimony discuss matters related to Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont's reserves, its proposed contribution to reserves, and the appropriateness of the proposed rates? Yes, it does. In your pre-filed testimony, including attachment C, do you explain the basis for your decision to direct Mr. Schultz to include a 1.5% contribution to reserves in the filed rates? Yes, I do. And in your pre-filed testimony, including attachment C, do you discuss Blue Cross's current risk-based capital or RBC outlook? Yes, I do. In the uh, pre-filed testimony, we included a revised RBC outlook that incorporates changes that uh, happened since the time of the filing in May. In your opinion, Ms. Green, do the proposed rates satisfy the required criteria in terms of affordability, insurer solvency, promoting access to care, and promoting quality care? Yes, I believe they do. 
Are there any points you would like to highlight for the board with respect to these criteria? Yes, there are a couple. Um, one I wanted to focus on was just the um, affordability and access to care. Paul Schultz and the, the discussion that came earlier this morning uh, covered a lot of that ground, but I wanted to just um, bring us back to the point that the parties at these hearings have talked about affordability each and every year. And uh, this year is uh, a bit different in the sense that we have the opportunity um, through the ARPA subsidies to um, have a big step forward in terms of affordability. And I just wanted to um, highlight that in addition to the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association advocating for the um, splitting of the market and the, uh, sorry, of the um, ARPA subsidies, um, we worked hard and in partnership with the healthcare advocate at the state level to additionally uh, ensure that the legislature could find a way to separate the markets such that we could have Vermonters benefit from the full the full value of the, uh, the federal subsidies. So um, feel that together with a, a reduction in the small group um, rates, um, the Blue Cross, and also um, in the individual market, enrollees in the Blue Cross individual plan, the rate that they, rate change that they will feel net of the subsidies, as Paul explained earlier, is actually a decrease. So we, we really feel like that's a, a significant step forward and there was a lot of people involved in that and we appreciate that. I also just uh, had in my um, comments some notes in response to the board um, wanting to know how the progress for the transition from direct enroll to the uh, Vermont Health Connect was going. And I know Robin asked that earlier of Paul, and of course he was right on. It was 506 as of last week. Um, it is up over twice the amount that was uh, um, direct enrollees that had transferred over in the middle of June. Uh, we've been partnering closely with uh, DIVA to get the communications out there. DIVA made the updates to their systems and we do expect that um, pace of transferring over to increase steadily and uh, we'll be working with DIVA to make sure that uh, we continue to, to work on that. The 506 transfers over is about a 10% um, uh, conversion rate, if you will, excuse me, if you will, for the Blue Cross book. I don't know how the other, uh, I don't know how MVP is doing on that. So, um, but with that, with that said, I, I did uh, want to draw, draw out the importance of the affordability. The other piece is uh, with respect to quality. Um, the other criteria around quality health care and, and value health uh, value services. Um, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont has continued in, in um, response to questions in this docket. We've outlined uh, the various things that we have been doing with respect to um, value-based payment programs or other types of quality initiatives. And uh, I just wanted to draw attention to the fact that um, the point was made earlier that uh, in order to continue that work and um, be able to support that, those changes, we do require the uh, sufficient financial resources to do that. So um, clearly we're, as the only Vermont um, domiciled or um, health, you know, independent health insurer in Vermont, um, we want to make sure that we continue to partner with state regulators, providers, and other stakeholders to make sure that um, we're able to achieve our, our vision of a transformed healthcare system. And we really need the financial resources to be able to continue to do that. Ms. Green, continuing on the topic of affordability, um, is Blue Cross expecting to realize any gain in these markets in 2022? The, um, in 2022, the combination of our 1.5% CTR and the um, $11.9 million that Paul testified about earlier um, will result in no gain on this business in 2022 uh, by virtue of 
the combination of the one and a half percent CTR offset by not including the COVID related costs for vaccines, tests and treatments in 2022 in rates and also by the reduction in um, allocated um, expenses to this segment. Um, and we'll continue to um, focus on growing our market share and also um, supporting affordability by having that low cost of insurance um, that is especially low as compared to other insurers. Are there any points regarding Blue Cross's solvency position that you would like to highlight for the board? Yes, so um, I'm sure we're going to have a lot of conversations about that and we have had some so far, but um, we talk about solvency or I talk about solvency every year as um, very, very important. Our reserves are critical to our solvency and as uh, Commissioner Pichek has said that um, solvency is really the number one uh, consumer protection. So um, the, the reserves are the buffer for risk and uncertainties and unexpected events. And um, we know that the last year we've had um, a really prime example of how an unexpected event can have both positive and negative impacts on reserves. And uh, we do have um, the obligation to navigate those short term um, ups and downs. It can have a yo-yo like effect on, on reserves, but we navigate through that and we're committed and confident that our approach to looking at a, a long term contribution to reserve is really um, important so that we protect our members from those shocks. Is there a connection uh, between membership growth and reserves? Yes, um, it's important. The other thing that we talked about earlier, and I think Paul referred um, to me, is that um, when we look at the RBC outlook for um, 2022 and, and understand what that looks like. The projection that we included in the, the um, pre-file testimony um, did not include any assumption for a market share shift as a result of MVP's rates being submitted um, much higher than ours. So um, we have a fair amount of material that's been submitted as part of the docket in the binder that illustrates um, the impact of that, but we we have the outlook as in my pre-file testimony, and then we have to think about um, how membership um, impacts RBC. RBC is a ratio, so it's um, driven. Um, the numerator is our, our member reserves. The denominator is the, the calculation of the risk that we um, hold, if you will, as an insurer. And when we add membership, we add risk. So it, it means that we also have to add reserves. So uh, it's very important that we think about the, um, the forward looking view of membership growth as part of our solvency outlook. And if we were to grow and not have the reserves, it would be fortunate that we, we would not be able to continue to grow in that way. Um, and in uh, discussing the potential for market share shift, you referenced uh, MVP's rates as filed this year. Are you able to provide any um, historical context for uh, the basis for expecting a market share shift this year? Yes, as uh, included in the uh, pre-filed testimony and in Paul's supp supplemental pre-filed testimony, um, we've looked back at history and um, the last time our rates were less than five percent different from MVP's rates uh, we had a market share of 87 percent so if, if our market share at the moment is just under 50 percent it's not unreasonable to think that we'll be looking at some growth in the next year uh, Ms. Green would you please turn to exhibit 21 Um, and it's Exhibit 21, the, pre, the supplemental pre-filed testimony for Mr. Schultz that you were referencing? Yes, it is. And in Exhibit 21, 
uh, in the confidential materials, does Mr. Schultz provide more detail uh, regarding the potential RBC impacts of a market shift? Yes, he does. Uh, we, Paul's team, Mr. Schultz's team, um, modeled the impact if there was a 10 percent um, shift in market share from MVP to Blue Cross, and also a 20 percent shift. And uh, it does show and illustrate um, that it has a significant impact on RBC. Thanks. Um, could you uh, turn now, Ms. Green, to Exhibit 15 on page 6? And there. <clears throat> Could you please uh, briefly describe what the table is on page six? The table on page six was um, prepared at the request in response to one of the, the HCA's questions about how the projection from last July compares to um, what actually happened in 2020. So we, um, the, the projected 730 2020 column is what we knew or the projection that we did based on the information we knew back then and then the RBC actual impact or RBC impact actual 1231 2020 is the um, actual impact and then it just showed where the the major differences came to be. I want to point you to the two items um, in the middle of the page under impact of changes in pension funded status. Do you see those? Yep. Uh, there was been there's been some discussion earlier today uh, regarding these two items. Could you please explain um, those two items and how they are different? Yes. So the uh, change in pension funded status due to the Allianz investment losses um, that was initially estimated at 180 percentage points based on what we knew um, when the first when we first learned of the losses. Um, the actual impact of the losses after the um, complaint was filed in September, uh, the NEBC uh, was able to um, update the estimate of the asset losses based on work that they had done there. So that uh, um, changed to uh, 163 percentage points or a reduction of 17. The other item, the change in the pension funded status due to the impact of year end actuarial assumptions is, is an item that we have every year. Each year the pension is valued uh, as part of the year end accounting and the actuarial assumptions, all of them together collectively will uh, require an adjustment to the pension assets and liabilities. And um, this year we had to uh, increase the liabilities due to a reduction in discount rates, and that was the major driver of the minus 59 percent. But that is that is not related to the Allianz investment losses. It's a um, I call it a normal um, pension adjustment, but it was larger this year than we'd seen in previous years. Maybe, excuse me, excuse me, mainly because of the uh, lower uh, discount rates used for the liabilities. Uh, and focusing on that line of change in pension funded status due to impact of year end actuarial assumptions, uh, would that line be the same or different if the pension losses had not occurred? If the Allianz strategy had not failed, we still would have had that minus 59 in RBC at the end of 2020. That adjustment um, was not caused by the, Allianz, by the um, pension funding losses? It was not. There was, uh, if I could direct you to the last, second to last line, still on page six of exhibit 15, the impact of the net deficiency reserve accrual. Do you see that? Yes, I do. There was some discussion about uh, that figure with Commissioner Pichak. Um, are you able to explain it uh, um, at, a, at least at a fairly high level what that um, reflects? Yes, in, consistent with Commissioner Pichek's testimony, it is a, a year-end reserve that uh, under statutory and gap accounting principles, we have to review 
the following year's contracts and see if there's any um, situations where the premiums or revenue related to those contracts are uh, insufficient to cover the costs. And a good example of uh, a component of that premium deficiency reserve is the 2021 COVID related costs. So the, I'm sorry, the I'm sorry. Excuse me, this is the court reporter. The 2020 what? 2021. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah. So the 2021 um, COVID related costs where um, we did not include in our 2021 rates anything for the additional COVID costs that we thought um, we would incur because of the return of some of the care that had been deferred. Um, that is a, an amount that we will pay in 2021, um, but we had to reflect that in 2020 because we, it was a known loss. So um, that is the, the function of the premium deficiency reserve. We go through that process every year, and um, I'd say in half the years in my history here, we've booked a, a premium deficiency reserve. Um, this year, it was somewhat larger than historic. Historically, it has been. Um, and Ms. Green, if you could turn now to page nine of Exhibit 15. Yep, I'm there. And what is that document? This is the supplemental health care exhibit that was discussed earlier. And I believe earlier that Mr. Angoff had some questions regarding page 10, line 11. So if you could take a look at, at those figures, the underwriting things in the individual and small group. Are you out there? Yes. Do those figures include the um, $10.1 million litigation recovery related to risk orders? It does. Are you able to show um, where that appears on this exhibit? Yes, in, in preparing the exhibit, um, there, what, there wasn't a, a specific line item for this type of uh, litigation recovery, but it is included online about section one on page nine, line 1.1, or I guess 1.10, and it's uh, other adjustments due to MLR calculations that relate to premiums. And if you add the... Um, Four million two two five nine eight eight in the individual column, and the five million eight fifty nine nine eighty eight in the small group column. That is the ten million, just over ten million dollars of the risk corridor that's included in those results. Thank you. Um, to continue with some some other questions related to matters that came up earlier. Um, does Blue Cross's, with respect to Blue Cross's required RBC range of five ninety to seven forty five? Are you able to explain whether that range incorporates the shared risk arrangement with One Care Vermont? Yes, uh, back during the analysis and um, the, very, the two reviews that were done on that, what is the appropriate range for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, um, the range is 590 to 745, and um, the shared risk arrangement for One Care Vermont was, in, was part of that analysis. Said another way, had we not had that shared risk arrangement with One Care Vermont, the the range would have been higher. The 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 um, target range or the required range would have been higher. There was also some discussion with Commissioner Pichak regarding whether um, fixed perspective payment arrangements reduce administrative costs. Are you able to address that issue? Yes, the um, the folks that work on the fixed perspective prospective payment processes, um, the, in the near term, it doesn't reduce operating expenses at all because we're really doing both the old way and the new way at the same time. And until we find ways to um, inform our um, analysis around trend or um, you know, the services that Vermonters use, um, the claims payment process will really stay intact really for the foreseeable future. And then the fixed prospective payment process is layered on top. So it's 
until you get the entire system on a new approach, it, it won't it won't save costs um, in the grand scheme of things because you still have to do things the old way. So you know, if if hypothetically you could get everything onto a new process, that I guess could save costs, but uh, that's not where we're at at all. Are there costs associated for Blue Cross as the payer with developing fixed prospective payment arrangements? Yes, one of the things that I um, called out in my other comments is that all of the payment arrangements, whether it's value-based care programs or looking at certain pilot programs, those um, take our clinical resources and our contracting resources and um, many of our technical resources to figure out how to implement them, not to mention the reporting that's required to the stakeholders, the providers, and, and the state regulators. So um, a lot of these uh, payment processes and new ways of doing things, at least in the short run, um, add on to the administrative expense. There's also a, some discussion earlier with Commissioner Pichek um, regarding whether a, a broad shift in the healthcare system toward fixed prospective payments would reduce the need for reserves. Are you able to comment on that? Yeah, my, my comment on that is the, um, we know that as you share risk with providers and move on to some of these other payment methodologies, the risk in total doesn't really change. It actually just moves from one entity to another because the risk of higher utilization is out there um, no matter no matter what we do. It's just um, the way healthcare is. So, um, and in, in addition, when you divide up the risk into smaller pockets, sometimes it will take more risk because each entity needs a, a little bit of a buffer. So, you know, I don't know scientifically, I haven't done um, the math on that, but my sense is that we, we need to um, think about whether or not that would be a net plus or a net minus um, if we were to uh, move the risk out of one entity into another. Ms. Green, could you turn now to Exhibit 17, please? Okay, I'm there. And what is Exhibit 17? Exhibit 17 is the uh, solvency letter from uh, Commissioner Pichek, the Commissioner of the, the Department of uh, Financial Regulation. It was issued on July 6th, and it has um, an accompanying letter from Oliver Wyman that went along with that, also dated July 6th. Have you uh, reviewed Exhibit 17, including the letter from Oliver Wyman? I have. Um, and could you uh, turn, please, to page 11 of Exhibit 17? Yes. Could you read the last sentence on that page, please? The projected RBC ratio is at a level that does not appear to provide a rationale for reducing the filed individual or small group rates. Do you agree with this opinion from Oliver Wyman? I do. As uh, I included in my pre-filed testimony, our RBC outlook is um, expected to be in the target range at the end of 2022. That outlook does not include anything for uh, membership growth, as I mentioned earlier. And so if we see a large sh shift in market share from MVP to our enrollment, that RBC um, will go down you know, from the outlook. And uh, based on our reserves and our solvency position, I see no basis to cut the CTR. Could you please turn back to page four of exhibit um, 17, which is also page four of the commissioner's opinion? I'm there. Okay. Um, would you please read the first uh, two sentences under impact on solvency of proposed rate? DFR does not expect the proposed rate as filed will have a significant impact on our overall solvency assessment of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont. 
any downward adjustments to the filings rate components are not act that are not actuarially supported, however, will reduce Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont's surplus and negatively impact its solvency. Do you agree with the commissioner's opinion as, as you just read it? I do, and I'd say that we strongly oppose any proposal to reduce rates below the recommended L&E um, rate and, um, or any proposal to reduce our CTR. The both independent actuaries, I should say, the the Oliver Wyman analysis as well as the L and E analysis. Both of these independent actuaries did uh, their own analysis and research on our level of solvency in RBC, and um, all of the measures that you looked at indicated that our RBC and our our reserves were low. Um, in, in fact, we rank near the bottom of um, comparable insurers. Does Oliver Wyman compare Blue Cross's RBC position to other comparable insurers? Yes, they do. Um, on page nine of the exhibit, I guess it's page five of their letter, they say that uh, they include a, a series of um, other insurance companies, and then they say in the paragraph underneath it says, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont's RBC ratio has been the lowest of all the comparative companies since 2018. And um, you can see from the chart that there's also, you know, many of these insurers have um, RBC levels that are well above the high end of our required range. Has Lewis and Ellis provided information comparing Blue Cross's solvency position to that of other insurers? Yes, they they provided um, quite a bit of analysis on that. And the um, what I'd like to point out is that they they looked at our level of reserves from four different directions and four different metrics. And uh, what's important to note is that every single one of those metrics indicated that um, our reserves are low compared to other insurers. Um, that's in Exhibit 16. And are you referring to pages uh, 19 to 20 of Exhibit 16? Yes, I was just uh, going there. So page 19 and 20, it starts on page 19 and moves to page 20. Um, and uh, as I said, they, they look at it four different ways. The first way they look at it is RBC at the bottom of page 19. And they, um, on the comparative uh, 65 insurers, blue, blue plans that they compared to, we ranked 57th out of 65. And then on the second metric that they assessed, it was on a per member per month basis. And that's at the top of page 20. And uh, on that metric, we ranked 53 out of 63 blues plans for the data that was available. The third way they looked at it was um, how much um, surplus do you hold as a percent of your annual premium? And we held 21.6% of annual premium as reserves. And um, it was significantly lower than the median of 39.9%. And then the fourth and last way that they uh, looked at it was on um, how many months of reserves do you hold as measured by how many months of claims could you pay and we held 3.2 months of claims in reserve and that ranked 51 out of 51st sorry out of 65 blue plans and it was significantly lower than the median of 5.4 months so I um, it's important to recognize that a lot of these uh, insurers, even there, um, even if we were to move to the upper half of our range or even to the top end of our range, we would still be relatively low compared to the risk protection that these other insurers have um, provided their consumers. Ms. Green, are you prepared to provide additional testimony and answer questions regarding Blue Cross's RBC projections for 2021 and 2022? 
Yes, I am. Is it appropriate to provide that testimony in public session? It is not. Why not? The, uh, the projections, our financial projections, we believe are confidential and they um, contain commercially sensitive information that gives Blue Cross uh, business advantage. Uh, we take great care to maintain the confidentiality of our projections and therefore um, it would have to be handled in an executive session. Do financial projections also sometimes include items that relate to confidential contract negotiations? Yes, they do. With respect to contracts, are you prepared to answer questions regarding Blue Cross's negotiation of provider contracts? I am. Is that appropriate to do in public session? No, the, the contract uh, details are considered um, uh, business confidential and uh, would be uh, detrimental if, if disclosed in a public setting. And if you look at um, page 22 of exhibit 19, which is your uh, pre-filed testimony, did you further explain that concern there? Yes, I did. Thanks. Uh, hearing officer Barbara, that's the close of our public session direct. So uh, I don't know how we, if we're going to proceed directly into executive session or if there is some public session questioning by others first. Yeah, so I guess my question for you, Bridget, is once we do go into executive session, assuming we do, um, you would have more testimony to elicit from a screen on direct. Is that what I'm understanding? It's very, very brief. It would just be a few a few brief questions about the um, RBC outlook going forward. And then we're, Ms. Green's prepared to answer questions from others um, if it relates to the confidential material. Okay, so I would like to proceed with questions from Mr. Angoff and then from board members on non-confidential stuff before we uh, likely move into an executive session. So if you're done with your direct on the non-confidential stuff, I'll turn it over to Mr. Angoff for questioning. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hearing Officer. Uh, Ms. Green, would you agree with me that uh, line 11 Line 11 of page 10 of the supplemental health care exhibit, which is exhibit 15, shows Blue Cross with a net underwriting, sorry, with an underwriting gain in the individual and small group market of approximately 25 million. Yes, that's what shows up on that line, yes. Okay, could you turn please uh, on exhibit one to page six? I'm there, yes. Okay, and you see the, the number 15, 912, 900, 15 million, 902,962, right? You see that on the bottom right? Yeah. Okay, can you explain the difference between that number and the 25 million on the state hair, state healthcare exhibit? Yes, as we established earlier, um, it's the difference is the risk corridor settlement um, litigation proceeds. So that was about 10.1. So if we add the, the 15 million uh, and the 10.1, that, that's approximately what's in the supplemental health care exhibit. And I think we also discussed this morning that the purpose of this exhibit was to compare how the pricing turned out relative to actual results. And um, early on in the three R's, the risk corridor payments were deemed to not have funding, so they, they were not incorporated into our, our pricing assumptions. It was only much later after many uh, lawsuits at the federal level, et cetera, that the risk corridor payments emerged as uh, something that uh, could be recovered. And so um, the per I think Paul said it well earlier, sorry, Mr. Schultz said it well earlier today that uh, 
depending on what you're using this uh, schedule for, it's important to know um, what's included and, and what wasn't. So that's why the risk orders were left off. Did you also hear Mr. Schultz, Ms. Green, talk about another 3.7 million that was not included in the 15.9 million on exhibit on a the chart on page six? Yes, and as he explained, the um, the filing went in in early May, and the final risk adjustment true up was not known until after that time. So that is an adjustment that uh, could be layered on to this table. Okay, so then is it fair to say that that 3.7 million then is in addition to the additional 10 million that's included in the supplemental health care exhibit, but is not included in this chart on page six of exhibit one? Right, because it's a, a 2021 event, so it'll show up in 2021's supplemental health care exhibit. Okay, could you turn now please to Exhibit 19, your pre-filed testimony. Okay, I've got the exhibit. Okay, and then on page six, the first full paragraph beginning with even on line five, do you see that? I'm on page six, sorry, which line? Yes, page six, starting on line five, even beyond the pandemic. Do you see that? The first full paragraph. Oh, I'm sorry. It's on the, uh, yeah, even beyond the pandemic. Yep. Okay. So there you list several different examples of events causing unusual volatility in RBC. And I just want to make sure that I understand them and, the, and that the board understands them. What is the subscriber lawsuit settlement by the National Blue Cross Association? That is the, uh, there was a class action suit and um, there, the National Blues organization is in the process of um, settling with the subscriber plaintiffs and the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont share of that is something that um, we have to accrue in our financial statements. And for a long time, that was something that we didn't know if it would cost something or not cost, cost something. So um, that was an example of um, something that, uh, it's hard to plan for. And, and what is the lawsuit about? Pardon? What is the lawsuit about? What, what is? Yeah, I'm probably not the best one to um, go into details, but there's two components to the lawsuit. One component is subscribers, um, class action so subscribers nationwide have um, accused the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association of um, sort of tying up the markets uh, to limit competition. And then the other part of the lawsuit is um, a class action group of providers um, accusing the uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield Association of, of companies for um, um, using their, their power to reduce the provider payments. So it's an interesting lawsuit in the sense that um, in some in some ways, both things can't be true. So um, in any way, uh, th that's at a very high level um, what that lawsuit was about. That, that's helpful. And what is Blue Cross's share of the liability? Blue Cross of Vermont's share of the liability in that suit? The settlement liability, our share of the settlement liability is $8.2 million. Okay, then the, the second uh, example you list there is a substantial deficiency reserve driven by extreme competition in the self-funded market, requiring multi-year rate guarantees to retain our largest customers. Could you explain, uh, could you explain how that competition came to be? And if I can just interject to, to note that some of that may be more appropriate for executive session, but I think Ms. Green will tread that line. Yeah, so I I included this one because the um, one of the things we had so many different um, disruptions, I'll call it, uh, coming at us in 2020. That uh, on top of um, market losses and um, the pandemic itself and everything else going on, 
um, some of the large national competitors really um, came to our, our large clients and drove down the, the price, you know, offered a much, much lower price. And um, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont was very much forced into a difficult decision as to whether or not we reduce rates to keep that business because as Paul indicated, uh, sorry, Mr. Schultz indicated earlier today that um, by having those large clients on our books, it significantly contributes to the fixed costs that we have as an entity. Our scale is very um, small relative to these large national competitors. And uh, so we're sort of forced into uh, choosing to keep these clients, but at, at a loss. And so, yeah. Um, could, could you explain why individual and small group customers should pay for Blue Crosses meeting the competition in the large group business? Our small group and individual business is not paying for the losses in our self-funded business. Um, as Commissioner Pichak and Mr. Schultz testified earlier, we have a number of segments of business that we deliver to Vermonters and uh, each one of those stands on its own and we navigate as best we can um, to make sure that it all comes together in the you know, enterprise view of RBC. Well, doesn't the contribution to reserves though that you're asking Blue Cross small group and individual customers to pay help fund that competition in the, in the large group market? Not directly. That's why we have a commitment and um, longstanding view that we, we need a certain amount of contribution to reserves that relates to the growth of the small group and individual medical costs. And it's the minimum required, it's the very minimum required to keep pace with the growth in um, healthcare costs. So um, we're not charging anything um, for losses elsewhere in the business per se. Well, are, are you saying then that the, fund, that the CTR factor in this rate filing is segregated from the money that goes to fund the uh, the uh, multi-year guarantees that you're offering to your largest customers? Yes, each each insured book that we um, submit filings for has a standalone contribution to reserve requirement that that um, its purpose is to uh, sustain that book of business. But you've got indivisible surplus, right? The one for the, the, the CTR factor you're asking for funds indivisible surplus, correct? It funds what? Sorry, I just didn't hear that. Indivisible surplus. You don't have separate surplus accounts for your large group business and your small group business and your individual business, correct? True. Yeah. I mean, the, the surplus is fungible. It, Somebody mentioned earlier that it also includes the investment gains. So, you know, we don't allocate that more to one business versus another. Your third example there is very low discount rates driving higher defined benefit pension liabilities. C could you explain why that is? Why low discount rates drive higher defined benefit pension liabilities? Sure, that's the 59 percentage points I mentioned earlier. So at the end of every year, we have our pension actuaries figure out what, based on the benefit design of the plan, what our future uh, pension liabilities are. And one of the key assumptions there is what, what are the interest rates that um, you'll need to pay in order to um, make good on those liabilities. And so the, the market rates if you think about uh, fixed income rates have been very, very low and they, they decreased significantly during 2020. So that required us to increase the liability because at the lower rates, the liability is higher. And then conversely, if interest rates increase, then you'd be able to decrease that liability, correct? That's correct. And it does happen. Um, I looked back at the history and um, I'd say this year's decrease in rates was significantly larger than what we'd experienced 
previously, but um, each year, um, you know, I'd say we've had as many years, at least since I've been at Blue Cross Blue Shield of, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, we've had as many years with uh, an add to surplus because of higher interest rates as we've had a decrease to surplus because of lower interest rates. Have you ever had a liability this great based on the uh, discount rate driving defined benefit pension liabilities? In my tenure, which is only the last um, eight years, uh, this is the largest one that we've seen. Okay, and how much bigger is it than the next largest? Um, this year's is 12 million. And in 2018, we had an um, increase in liability of 5.4 and then a decrease of 3.6. So then it went back up 12.7. So um, the lowest impact we've ever had is uh, a little less than $2 million. Okay. So did you say then that the second highest is 5.4? Is that what you said? Yeah. Okay. Um, in recent history, since 2014. Could you turn please to page eight? And in the last paragraph, uh, you see the second line, you refer to your decision to change how we allocate overhead among lines of business. Do you see that? Could you just remind me, I, I've been looking at the exhibit pages. Uh, could you just say the page number again? Sorry. It's okay. Yeah, this is page eight of exhibit 19. Yep, I'm with you. Yep, I see it now. We're allocating overhead. Yep. Okay, and uh, could you explain first what that decision was? Your decision, how, to, how we allocate overhead among lines of business. What did you decide? Yeah, so the, there's, when you get to fixed costs and overhead, it's, um, there's no, um, uh, what's the word? There, there's no uh, specific way to allocate costs, and we've we've looked at this a couple of different ways over the years, especially as our business changes and our membership mix shifts. Um, we have seen it where a lot of our um, you can allocate overhead based on where the direct costs are in the business, or you could allocate your overhead where your capital is, or you could allocate your overhead. Um, just straight up based on where your your membership sits. So um, what we did in the interest of uh, recognizing the, the competitive pressures in the marketplace, we wanted to come up with something that was, um, we believe, more appropriate. And so that's what's described here. We're allocating overhead as a consistent percent of premium or premium equivalent going forward, which we think is appropriate. Okay, that, then is it fair to say that there's no prescribed way to allocate costs? When it comes to the indirect fixed costs, I, that's what I'm saying. When we have direct variable costs, which I think uh, is included in the docket somewhere we, we shared um, the expense study that we did. And uh, when it comes to direct costs, we allocate them directly to where they should be. It's written, my comments are really when it comes to the, the most indirect overhead allocations. Okay, so, so, so your decision to change how Blue Cross allocates overhead among lines of business, uh, that, that's something that you had discretion to determine. Yes. Okay. Could you turn now to uh, Well, there's a discussion we don't don't really feel free to, but you don't really need to refer to uh, your testimony. My question is this. You've uh, you've said that if Blue Cross uh, gains business, it will uh, th that that will drive down its RBC ratio, correct? Right. OK, but Blue Cross has lost business for the last five years, correct? Correct. And it, it, from 20 to 21, it even lost a little more business than it lost between 2019 and 2020, correct? 
true. We, we lost a lot of business between 18 and 19. I was getting confused with your, your, uh, the years, but uh, yeah, we have lost in the ACA market, in the small group and individual market, we have been losing business. Okay. So, so why do you think after five years of losing business, it's a reasonable assumption to assume that Blue Cross will now begin gaining business? In my earlier comments, I said that uh, when we, we have um, statistics and research that tell us that when our price differential with MVP is less than 5%, our market share is much higher. And that's very consistent with uh, economic models when you have um, wider price differentials or more narrow price differentials um, that will um, um, cause customers to, to move. And so uh, we've looked at the declines in membership as it relates to the relative price differential um, between our rates and MVP's rates each year. And we can see a, a direct correlation between um, the market share shifting and the rate differential. So it, it's very much a reasonable assumption that um, there will be some shifting from MVP to us going forward. But, but, but your, your statement just then, though, is based on the assumption, isn't it? that the rates as filed by both carriers or as it's filed and adjusted a little bit by l and &E would be approved by the board, correct? True. Yeah, I can so, certainly so, agree to that qualification. If the board found, for example, that M MVP's rate was much too high and found that yours was just a little too high, uh, would your uh, would your conclusion that it's reasonable to assume that Blue Cross would have a gain in enrollment change? Well, I was basing my comments off of the the work of the actuaries and with LNE's um, reporting on both MVP and Blue Cross. I was making an assumption that uh, the actuarial supported rates for each company would remain in some fashion. Um, sort of less different than they have been in the past once those rates are in place. It, you know, I take your point. If that's not how it works, then uh, something else will happen. Okay. Um, and it's also possible, isn't it, that people who uh, who who've switched to MVP like MVP and are going to stay with them because they like MVP, correct? It's always possible. We have a lot of evidence that when the rate differential is 5% um, or even when it was um, wider than 5%, we have a lot of people who um, still stayed with Blue Cross and really appreciate the service and the quality and the, uh, the network that we offer. So um, we do know that um, people change plans for a whole host of reasons. Uh, could you turn to page 11, please, of your pre file testimony? Yeah, I'm there. Uh, at the very bottom, under the uh, bold face type, you say that we expect that this business will yield less than a 1.5% return in 2022. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. That's a, when you say a 1.5 return. Do you mean a 1.5% 1. 1. return? Do you mean a 1.5% re return on premium? Yes. Okay. Um, and you're saying that with knowledge that in 2020, the business returned in the, the, the same business, the com combined individual small group business re had a re rate of return on premium of 8%, correct? because of other extenuating circumstances, a pandemic and a, a uh, risk corridor settlement that uh, was not planned on. This, this statement here, we expect that this business will yield is, is about 2022 and based on our pricing assumptions for 2022. So kind of coming full circle back to Paul, uh, Mr. Schultz's testimony earlier that um, when we are estimating for the coming year that's 18 months out, we really are um, 
very uh, good at making those estimates. The comment here is just to acknowledge that um, with the other COVID costs that we expect in 2022 that we're not including in premiums and um, the short-term nature of the change in allocated costs, that the actual segment, the business financial segment results in 2022 won't be one and a half percent. It'll be um, broadly uh, break even. Could you turn to page 15, please, for your statement? Okay, and there in the, in the middle, of, oh wait, that, that is, um, does the box around it mean that it's, uh, should, it's confidential, right? Yes, it does. Yeah. Okay, then, then I, I will address that. And it's my last question on your, uh, on your pre-filed, Ms. Green. I'll wait for uh, the confidential session then to uh, ask that. Thank you, Ms. Green. Sure. Okay, now we have board questions, starting with member Yusufer. Great, thank you. Hi, Ruth. Um, a few questions uh, before we go into the executive. Um, can you tell us um, for, and, and this may be a follow-up question, um, for the past five years, what the subsidy has been for that large, the large group plan? where we're talking about that they're losing money because of competitive reasons? The, and I'm sorry, could you just repeat the question? Um, we're losing money on some of the plans because of competitive reasons where you're subsidizing the plan. Could you tell us what the losses have been on that for the past five years? Sure, so I, I, can, um, I can provide the board. <clears throat> well, you, in the um, five year history in the stat blank, um, you can see the, the sum total of all the, the segments, but you're interested in um, the segment that we were just talking about in terms of the premium deficiency reserve. Is that the one? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, that, that would be a follow-up. We, we have not had, uh, until this year, we have not have had um, significant losses in that line, but I can get you the data. Okay, great. Um, and when you talked about the impact of RBC with membership growth um, and the potential impact that could have on RBC if the membership grows. Have you offset that with the fixed portion of admin costs? Partially offset it. Um, the, the, are you referring to the membership growth that we've been talking about if there's a shift in share? Error between MVP yeah. and Blue Cross. Yeah, that is not accounted for in our RBC outlook at all. The allocated cost portion is accounted for in our RBC um, outlook. Yeah, I'm looking at you. There was a graph that talked about what the impact could be if there was a shift. Yeah. And we're doing that. It should be offset by the fixed portion, somewhat offset. It's not going to fully offset it, but the fixed portion of admin costs, because if you do have membership growth, only the variable piece will go up. So that fixed part should offset that. So I just want to make sure yes. when we're looking at the numbers that that's included. Yes. Thank you. Sorry, I was not uh, understanding your question, but absolutely. That's why earlier when I said we made this decision to allocate costs differently in the short run, that will um, have an impact on surplus. But if we do grow and have um, more membership, that will be, um, you know, coming back around and, and filling that gap. Um, so you're right. And when you talk about that allocation change, I guess what drove that for the admin allocation change? And where I'm going is, have we historically over allocated these lines of business with admin costs? Because it's yeah, the the catalyst for this had to do um, with um, the pressure on our overall enterprise costs as we're serving <clears throat> all the different segments of business in Vermont. We're finding it very difficult to um, invest in new technologies and capabilities that um, you know, keep us relevant to our customer base. So, um, so we had some increases in our admin costs in 2020 um, to uh, invest in some of those uh, new capabilities. And then we had the 
intense competition that came along and said, okay, not only are you going to not be able to have a, a fee increase, we're going to expect you to lower your fees because of the competition. So it was, it was kind of a, at an enterprise level, we had all of these things kind of converging together. And then we were looking at the, um, you know, at some point, the, the um, competitive um, view of what's included in each of the insured rates for operating expenses can't go too far out of line with, with the market expectations. So it was really us looking at a way <clears throat> to just head something off at the pass and not go there. Um, we also look at um, our administrative costs by segment and benchmark them against a, a benchmark called Sherlock, which is an organization that does a study of blue plans. And uh, we're for the um, small group and individual book of business. We're very much um, comparing well to those benchmarks. And so we, we felt like we couldn't increase costs for these other fixed costs beyond those benchmarks. So that was one of the reasons that we decided that we needed to take a hard look at how we were doing this. Okay. Um, going to exhibit 15, page six. And then I'm going to exhibit toggle. 15. Okay. And I'm also going to be looking at, so kind of to toggle between two, exhibit 23, page 45. And what I'm focusing on is I want to put some dollars behind the change in the pension fund status, uh, both the 163 and the 59%. Um, yep. So when we look at where your pension, it looks like on page 45, exhibit 23, that the fair value of the pension at the beginning of, ye of the year was um, 69,439. Is that correct? That was the fair value of the plan assets, yes. Yeah. At the top of the page. Yeah. And then, I mean, is that where we would look at then the change, the the hundred and sixty-three percent decline, which is about, I think, about thirty-five million? Is that what's captured somewhat in that actual return on plan assets? Yeah. If I may, I can uh, point you to a couple of other lines on the same page. So, if you look at the reconciliation of funded status in section three, you look at the change in the overfunded plan assets and the change in the total liabilities recognized um, for both the post-retirement benefits and the pension benefits, um, that will add up to a total loss of 47.8 million. And okay. that's also shown on page three of the, the, sorry, not page three. It's also shown on the, the change in surplus page in the front part of the book. So page six of exhibit 23, there's something called the change in pension and post-retirement benefit obligations, 47,822,000. So that's the sum total of the two components. And what we've done is just broken out the amount that's due to the Allianz losses, which is about 35 million. And the rest of it is the valuation of 12 million. So um, I, hopefully that, helps. I guess where I'm having some trouble is reconciling if I if I took where you started from and, and just took out the um, the 35 million, right? How, how much would have been left in assets? OK, so it, you, the, go back up to the top where you were. Yeah. And the reconciliation of plan assets. So you can see the actual return on plan assets is a minus 36. Yeah. So the vast majority of that is the failed Allianz strategy. Okay. And then, of course, we put um, cash back into the fund, and the total assets at the end of the period is $42 million. Does that help? A little bit. So the $15 million cash you put back into the fund, right, that is fairly extraordinary, right, because, because of the position of the fund. I mean, I guess we were talking about, is that what's partly in the change in pungent pension funded status to the impact of year end actuarial. So the the 15 
there's a lot of questions in that statement. So the 15 million is unusual. We normally make about a $2 million contribution. And as soon as that money gets into the pension fund, it starts earning money. So it becomes part of the plan asset base and, and earns um, return. The, the additional 13 million was because of the Allianz failed strategy, we had to um, sustain the pension to a minimum level to achieve the, the ERISA funded requirements in order to pay out, to keep the, the, the plan whole. So um, you know, that that's all part of landing on the <clears throat> plan assets at the end of the year. And that combined with the liabilities is what all together adds up to the $47 million. But the, <clears throat> the, um, the actuarial valuation assumptions go beyond just the assets, they take into account the liability. So um, on the page before that, page 44, there's a, um, a number of assumptions that, that show how the liability, the benefit obligation at the beginning of the year um, changes. So that's the other piece of the pension valuation. It's the assets plus the changes in the liabilities. Yeah. And I guess where I'm going at is I, and, and maybe I'm misinterpreting what, um, you know, at the beginning when, when you were being um, questioned by your lawyer, um, the 163 is clearly what we're going after, you know, alliance for, for the losses it, on that was on page 15, exhibit six. And then the additional 59%, I mean, it seems to me one wouldn't have happened without the other. Am I wrong in that? I mean, or or of this 15 million, you wouldn't have put 15 million additionally into this plan if you hadn't lost 35 plus million because of of what happened, you know, that you're suing them for. So I, I, to me, to me, they. I, I just want to make sure we're representing that correctly because I, I think they both do tie to what happened with your your fund administrator. Right. So. So the other the other part of the asset returns contribute to the pension valuation as well. So we because we have a pension valuation every year and every year it's affected by both asset returns and discount rates and other you know retiree rates and so on, um, number of employees and all of that. Um, we we merely looked at the total change and then isolated the Allianz loss. So the um, everything else is as it would have been if we had not had that loss. So um, I, I guess I could I can see where you're getting at that there might be a small portion of the 59% that relates to whether the 13 million relates to um, you know, the timing, how long it took us to get it into the, the pension fund and would we have earned something in the meantime. We I could take it down one more level, but the vast majority of the 59% has to do with the liability change, not the asset change at this point. Okay. I mean, I just want to walk through it one more time, not to beat the dead horse here, but it seems like you had a fair value of assets of about 70 million. You went down about 36 million. Most of that was related to the issue you had with your pension fund administrator. Because you're so low now and because you have fund obligations, you have to put more money into the account, right? So that's that's the 15 million, which is about 13 million higher than you normally would have put in here. Um, and that ultimately, right, comes out of the money left in surplus or out of the RBC. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And as does the changes on the liability side, which is in section one. So there was an $8 million change a little less than $8 million change on the liabilities that's also part of that 59%. Okay, and just so, let me see. Another, just on that same schedule on the financial statements, in 2019, there was an actual return on assets of 15.1 million. Yeah. Um, as we're seeing the 36 million hit the RBC negatively, did that help the RBC in the prior year? Yes, and so it yes. Went through. I, in the last five years, we've had oscillating impacts. One year, it'll be a, a decline between this and the liabilities. 
and then the next year it might be an add to surplus. I think the cumulative on from 2014 through to 2019 was a net negative of about six million dollars. So it 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 does go up and down each year. Okay. And then last year you did testify that the impacts of the pension plan would not impact ratepayers with an increase of rates. And yet um, we did hear Paul talk about, you know, any shortfall in RBC depleted must be replenished for future years by ratepayers. So, you know, if, if this hadn't happened and we know it did happen, you would have been well at the upper end range of your um, requirements uh, for RBC and your forecast for where we might end up in the future would be well even higher than that. So, you know, at some point we would have returned that to ratepayers, correct? I think in looking at a hypothetical situation is difficult for me because if we say, what if that hadn't happened, um, it probably the scenario about the pension loss not happening would have had to have included that the pandemic didn't happen. So then we wouldn't have had the other incomings. And, you know, RBC is affected by a lot of one time items, both positive and negative. So it's difficult for me to set aside uh, one time negative items and not think about the one time positive items. Um, that's why we stick to a long term approach to our CTR so that each of our premium submissions has a consistent um, level of contribution to reserves. And then as we um, weather all of the risks and un unforeseen circumstances, we, we have to navigate that as an enterprise through um, what our total solvency reserve level is. So it's in other exhibits and when we go into executive session, I can illustrate how um, as we sit here today, we, we take a look forward to 2021 and 2022 and um, assess, you know, what does that mean in terms of our solvency position? So it's that long term one and a half percent CTR is really what I believe is, you know, helping us continue to contribute to reserves but protects our, our members from shocks from these unexpected items that come and go. Okay, and then just um, one more thing on the, the impact of the, the deficiency reserve, which is oh, the 138%, which would be what, close to 26 million or something like that? That's about right. I think it's 2028. 20, yep. Yeah, I'm doing a quick, quick. It, when we've talked about COVID, and because we're saying that's somewhat related to COVID, but when we've talked about the gains we're getting from COVID, and then, and then, you know, in 20, um, and that was in the underwriting, I mean, we more than offset that with this 138%. Isn't that correct? And yeah, so if this is what you're getting at, um, the geography of the COVID costs not being in rates is um, if we didn't have a premium deficiency reserve requirement, um, that would come into RBC during 2021 when those vaccinations and tests and treatments and um, the rescheduled care from 2020 happen. But because we didn't include those in rates in 2021, the geography is such that they're already included, if you will, in the 480 at the end of 2020. Isn't that a little like accounting principles <laughs> tells me that it doesn't really line up if it's for, you know, 2021 costs that we didn't put in the premiums for 2021. I'm just are we jumping the gun putting that in this year's RBC because it's for things well, that should occur in 2021? It's the statutory and, and gap accounting principles that for insurance companies, if you have contracts in place, so we had 2021 enrollment that we knew the costs were going to be higher than what we had for premiums. So the, the requirements for our industry is to book those losses because the 
especially on a statutory basis, they want to make sure they understand what your solvency position is. And so there is a tendency to have rules that either don't count assets that other companies can count or to bring losses into the current period that other companies would wait until they're incurred. And since we're mid-year in 21, are we seeing that, that that's occurring at that rate? We are seeing the COVID um, return of deferred care and the, the vaccination costs and the various, um, that, that was what was modeled in um, Mr. Schultz's um, COVID modeling. And we are seeing um, things um, come through as expected. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm done with my questions, thanks. Sure. Okay, then we'll move to board member Lunge. Do you have questions? Um, I have a couple and I'll have more um, if we move into executive session. Um, hi, Ruth, I hope you're doing okay today. Doing good, thanks, hope you are too. Thanks. Um, in exhibit 13, um, I talked with Paul a little bit about this, but in exhibit 13 in the land framework, which is on page four, there's a very small percentage in fee for service foundational payments. Do you know what that consists of? Yeah, when when that question came up earlier, um, we we have Kate Mac and Dr. Kate um, looking into the answer to that question. Okay, thank you. Um, and could you tell me a little bit about how the SVMC fixed payment uh, program is going and? Any hurdles you've seen? At, you know, if it's going well. Yeah, just, I, just an update. Yeah, I don't have a lot of details on that, but I, uh, it's going well. Maybe by virtue of not hearing a, a ton of issues about it, um, I think it's going well, and it was great to have them get out of the gate as as the first facility to join in. Okay, um, and. I was curious if um, you have Blue Cross has a strategic plan for payment reform and healthcare reform. The strategic plan we have, uh, it's a key component of our ongoing um, business strategy to support healthcare and payment reform. In the docket, in the responses in the binder, we walked through a number of the, the things that we're doing and we gave some feedback based on questions the, the, the board asked. I can go there and, and talk through some of those if you like, or um, your specific question is, is it a, a strategic plan? I, I'd say it doesn't stand alone, but it's definitely incorporated, incorporated in our overall business strategic plan. Okay, I was just curious if you had targets for moving forward with payment reform and, and how that looks in your strategic plan. Yeah, I think, it, well, in recent years, our focus has really been on, on the One Care um, shared savings programs and trying to get the, uh, the more of the commercial book into that and, and working on the self-funded. So it's been very focused there. I think we have um, you know, specific measurements that we use to measure whether a program is working or not. So that's that's a measurement. I'd say we don't we don't have an overarching target. Um, in terms of total, but uh, we do have a, a lot of initiatives underway with with um, goals, and a big part of that is partnering with um, the state stakeholders as well as the providers to sort of go where we think the value is. And uh, sometimes that's not always, um, you know, it's certainly not at, at our sole discretion on on where that is. So I, I do think that the setting of overall targets is a little bit difficult in that regard. Okay, thank you. Um, the And thank you for answering my question around the enrollment and updating that, um, that was helpful. Um, in terms, uh, and this may be something that gets into contracting strategy, so if this should be deferred, please just let me know. Uh, but I'm wondering what your strategy is in response to the audio only DFR order and uh, sort of the direction that it provides around audio only payment rates. 
Yeah, you know, I think uh, as Paul, as Mr. Schultz um, testified earlier, of course, we're going to implement the rule as it's uh, prescribed. The jury's still out in terms of how it will impact things, but uh, I think we will be um, working around the fringes of that, but certainly having a rule out there, just like having a hospital um, budget increase approved, uh, the, the provider community will say, okay, well, this is the rule. Um, this is this is what we will get, but our contracting folks will, of course, be be working on that um, as they work across all of our our contracts. Sure, the the DFR order provides for a minimum of seventy five percent. My understanding is that currently it's at a hundred percent. So I, that's why I was asking about a change because it could actually be a decrease from where you are today. Yeah, I think our goal would be to have it be a decrease, but uh, the the goal and the you know, um, there's always interplay between these assumptions and other um, aspects of our contracts. So each negotiation will take on its own pace in terms of how quickly we can get to that that minimum. Okay, thank you. The rest of my questions um, are related to uh, information in the exhibits that is marked confidential. So I will hold those. Okay. Thanks. Right. Board Member Pelham. Ruth, if I could reach through the screen and give, give you a glass of water, I would <laughs> happily do it. You know, I have one. <laughs> there, you, there you go. There you go. Um, I, this Thank you. Um, this is kind of, I mean, my, my question is, I'm trying to walk away in part from this hearing process in a sense of where Blue Cross Blue Shield is on healthcare reform. And so earlier in the day, uh, I think it was when, when Paul was presenting, you know, I, I uh, took from your filings, you know, we, uh, the, the statement um, that Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, is currently working to expand fixed prospect of payments with willing partners. But then when we start to talk about willing partners, we find that they're few and far between um, and tough to come by. Um, and then later on, based on a, an analysis of 2019 results with OneCare, uh, the filing says this filing does not include any adjustment to projected expenditures relating to OneCare program. And then further along, um, looking at the experience index rate, that um, capitation is less than 2% in both the uh, um, individual and um, small group filing. So it's a very small piece of the pie. And then your statement just a, a while ago was about fixed prospective payment was uh, that they don't reduce operating expenses until the entire system must be on a new process. And so I guess that kind of takes me back to Robin's question about a strategic plan um, um, and and healthcare reform. Um, I, you know, I know. I mean, you can say it's hearsay, but I know that the administration has told the world that they are um, uh, totally behind the all payer model, um, et cetera. And um, so, there's a lot of people pushing in this direction. Um, Medicaid is is pretty much 100% all in. We're trying to get Medicare uh, to um, uh, be, be more in and they may, may be willing, we'll see. But I, I, I don't get um, a sense from Blue Cross Blue Shield that, that this is um, at a level of importance as it is to so many other people across state government stakeholders, yet Blue Cross Blue Shield and MVP are the, are the providers and, and actually end up getting cost shifted onto when the existing system doesn't work that well. So. Um, I, I, you know, so should I, I walk away from this with that kind of negative view? I, I want to walk away with an optimistic view that we're all in the boat rowing in the same direction, but I, I can't get there given what I'm hearing and, and reading. Yeah, um, that's unfortunate. I, I do believe that our teams are working every day to find, um, new and better ways to provide value-added care. Um, perhaps Dr. Kate can elaborate a little bit on what some of those are on the ground. Um, I would 
draw our attention to our response to the board's question number four in exhibit 13. Um, sounds like you read it and weren't, weren't um, uh, impressed by it, but uh, it's, the lack of results is, is not for not trying. Um, at the bottom of page four there, we have worked uh, to engage providers and uh, we've been met with a lot of caution. You know, this requires change on the part of the providers. Um, well, most of most that. most of that response is uh, confidential um, and maybe we but, can talk a little bit about that um, yeah. in the executive session. But I, as I said this morning it, it, to Paul, if there's something we can do, I, I understand it takes a payer and a provider to kind of join together and those unions are few and far, far between. So if there's something we can do because we do have a relationship with you folks and we do have a relationship with key providers across the state that if there's something where we can, you know, break a log jam, um, I'd like to hear about it. But, um, you know, I, I, I read, I read, you know, what you just re you referred to, maybe we can talk about it a little bit more in, in executive session. Yeah, I think the, the public portion of that response was intended to kind of give a, a broad overview of, of how hard it is to get change in this in environment. Um, you know, the providers are in concept very aligned with us in terms of what we've described at the top of page five as the triple aim. But when it comes right down to it, you know, they are taking on risk. And, um, you know, that is something that is new in some cases to them and also um, you know some of the programs just aren't as um, um, successful as others so there is an element of, of trial and error so um, you know I do think it is something that you know, the, the overarching motion is probably slower uh, than everybody wants but it's not because we don't have um, providers and Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont and other stakeholders working on this uh, regularly and with knowledge and and understanding of the Vermont healthcare system. We'll keep talking. Sure. Board Member Holmes. Hi. How you doing, Ruth? Hi, Jessica. Um, well, actually, I'm going to build a little bit on Tom's questions. A lot of my some of my other questions have you've already answered through Maureen's questions and Robin's questions. So, um, but I actually want to. I'm interested in your response. I think to Commissioner Pichek's testimony this morning regarding this fixed prospective payment. Um, and so, I think I want to understand your views. I may have misunderstood your remarks, uh, so I just want to check. So, you referenced risk under fixed perspective payment and you referenced both Blue Cross Blue Shield risk and total risk to the system. Um, I just want to, if the majority of contracts held by Blue Cross Blue Shield are fixed perspective payment, which by definition shifts risk from the payer to the provider, what would happen to Blue Cross Blue Shield risk level? Yeah, much like the, the One Care Vermont um, comment that I made earlier, um, the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont risk level um, in theory would go down, especially if there was uh, enough mass there. Um, but okay. The, the, the risk is being shifted. My point was the risk is being shifted to the providers, and so they will then need some mechanism for managing that risk and making sure that it's um, appropriate given utilization trends, et cetera. So that, that was my point is that in total, it, it won't go down. Okay, but but I was, my, my questions of Commissioner Pichek were with respect to the risk and the reserve holdings of the carriers. And so if the risk is shifted, the need for reserves should be lower by the carriers, yes? In theory, yes. Okay, um, and if, if fixed payment achieves its goal of actually changing the delivery system and lowering healthcare costs, that should actually lower the number of claims that are made, lower the value of the claims that are made, lower the need for reserves, and potentially lower the risk to the entire system if the delivery reform works as it's expected. Yes or no? Yes. If I guess I'm 
reading into your comment that you're assuming that the fixed perspective payment causes the health care reform. And if it does and reduces costs, then yes, of course, the, the risk would go down. OK. Um, and if Blue Cross Blue Shield enters significantly more fixed price contracts, say the majority of their contracts or closer to the majority of their contracts, would Blue Cross Blue Shield still invest in the same level of utilization review, care management, pre-authorizations, all of those administrative level expenses that relate to utilization and trying to, you know, ensure that it's appropriate utilization. Would that level of investment change or go down? That's where I, I said earlier that if hypothetically the entire system was in this new world, yes, a lot of those pr processes would change. But um, until if it's only partial, then we still have to do yeah. the same processes that we do today. And and there's cost to getting from here to there. So figuring out what the appropriate monitoring and um, you know measuring results, figuring out that in the new world it doesn't come without costs. Yeah, I, and I understand that. I don't disagree. But it's really important given the potential that fixed perspective payment has for improving health outcomes, reducing costs, reducing premiums, reducing the need for reserves, all of these things. It really would be helpful, and I understand some of this may come in executive session, but I really need to understand what are the obstacles with your providers. Uh, you mentioned in the, you know, in the filing, some of the resistance related to uh, concerns about re-engineering, you know, workflows, challenges with EMRs, unwillingness to be paid less. Um, one, I, I really want to understand those obstacles a little bit more because, frankly, we sometimes hear that the payers are not ready for a fixed perspective payment, not that the providers are not ready. So I, I feel as though I'm hearing different stories from different stakeholders in the system. Um, and I need to understand really where the obstacles are and then what you think can be done about it by the various stakeholders. That includes the Green Mountain Care Board, but it might include the legislature. It might include DFR. It might include the providers. You know, the, it might include the the carriers. I really, it seems so important to understand this. And we've, you know, we've had these conversations for a couple of years, I think, ongoing. And I still cannot wrap my hands around exactly what are the the biggest obstacles and who can overcome them. So, a couple of reflections on your your uh, question. So. One of the biggest ob obstacles is being paid less. But I, I'll be frank. So um, Blue Cross was ready to go with fixed perspective payments in April of 2020, and we could have all of the hospitals facilities sign up and do it. Um, prior to that, we did have a technical barrier to that, but we removed that technical barrier in early 2020. Pandemic kind of changed the, the shape of the landscape shortly thereafter. So um, I, I do think we're ready to go with this um, if we can get the, the facilities to um, um, sign up. The the response in our, our docket for your, you know, in response to your questions, we indicated that um, we're, we're trying to figure this out as well and uh, we're participating in the, the group that AHS is convening to try and understand how to find these uh, barriers, either hidden or not hidden barriers to, to move forward, but we've been ready to go. We did add, I think we said in our response too, we made significant progress in 2021 where we've added 11 professional practices to the fixed perspective payment. So maybe it doesn't sound like a big number, but going from zero to 11 is, is a big deal just to get the thing going. Is there anything in our Green Mountain Care Board rate decision that we could include this year that would help overcome any obstacles? I, when when someone asked that question of Mr. Schultz earlier today, I started to think about sort of things that we could ask the board to to contribute on. But I, I do think it is figuring out um, what is it that. You know, the providers in the last year have had so much on their plate. You know, it's not, it's not 
a mystery as to why no one was um, moving in the last um, 15 months. But um, maybe going forward, it, we should work together to figure out what some of those hidden areas are. Well, if you follow up with any ideas around what could be included this year, that could incent that. And let me just ask one more question around this. You said the biggest obstacle is being uh, paid less. Why not start the capitation or fixed perspective payment with paying them the same? And then, you know, assuming that there might be some delivery system reform under that and opportunities for, for shared savings beneath that, that would be enticing to providers to stay in the game. That is exactly the premise, but I think the, the reluctance, and this is just for, I'm not a hospital finance person, but I do know that there's a whole industry of finance people who um, work on the so-called revenue cycle for hospitals. And so um, the idea that you're going to put a cap on something that maybe previously had been thought of as a place where they could go if they needed to do more of this or less of that to create some revenue, I think, I think that's the, my reference to being paid less is more in that subtlety rather than um, just the idea that you start out with what they currently get paid, because how do you decide what is a normal utilization? Um, it, it, you know, there, there's a little bit more uh, debate about that, I think, when it comes right down to it. Um, do you think that the underpayment by Medicaid um, is impacting the reluctance to take on fixed perspective payment on the promotional side? that it's considered, commercial rates are considered the safety valve to offset the lack of growth in Medicaid reimbursements. And so until we sort of start to solve the cost shift, there will be reluctance on the provider side to engage in these fixed price contracts on the commercial side. Yeah, I personally don't have any experience with that, but that's, that's a reasonable hypothesis. Um, it's an opportunity for us to sort of start there and see if we can sort of think about that more holistically in terms of creating the motivation. And I guess I would ask on that line, you know, given the, uh, you know, the increases in commercial rates, uh, potentially with relationship to the cost shift, does your, I know you have a lobbyist, does your lobbyist speak to the legislature about the cost shift and the impact of Medicaid, you know, uh, growth or lack thereof on the commercial payers and on the insured population? And, and what recent actions has your lobbyist taken in that regard? Yeah, again, when we talk about recent actions, anything recently has been very focused on our response to the pandemic, et cetera. But I do know that in the not too distant history or distant past, we have um, talked a lot about the impact of the, the cost shift and also I think at, at one point, this might be going back a little bit far, um, wouldn't be recent, um, is, you know, we've done some, some op-eds on the topic, but it is, you know, we need to take a look at the whole system. And even in our um, responses in this docket to some of the healthcare advocates' questions about what we expect from One Care Vermont, there's, there's very much a, um, a need to uh, not have, have the balancing factor always be commercial rates. And so um, we really want to make sure that all of the payment for reform activity um, acknowledges that we're, we're trying to reduce the total cost of health care, not just shift, keep shifting it around. So um, yeah, I, do you have any, have you ever tried do to do a lot on the cost shift? Have you, so have you ever tried to quantify uh, the proportion of the rate increase, for example, this year that could be tied to the cost shift? We haven't done it this year. I, I'm going back, um, Paul, Mr. Schultz might be able to tell me how many years back, but we did do some calculations a few years back to see, you know, how much of the commercial rates is attributable to the cost shift. Um, but that's a, that's a, not a small set of uh, analysis and, and uh, something that we, we don't do on a regular basis. Okay, I'm going to shift gears a little bit, uh, but it is related to these commercial rates. Um, do you have access to either national or regional Blue Cross Blue Shield Association data that would help us assess or help you assess the provider reimbursement levels in Vermont 
relative to national or regional benchmarks? You know, could you put Vermont hospital or provider reimbursements on a percentile scale relative to the region or relative to the nation in any way? Is there a way to use your larger network of Blue Cross Blue Shield associations to do that? I personally don't know, but I can follow up on that question for you. That would be great. Um, and my last question also ties to this. Um, you know, in Exhibit 13, most of which has been redacted, and I know we're going to go into executive session to discuss it, but it does give us a glimpse of sort of the relative pricing within Vermont. Um, and Blue Cross Blue Shield offered several caveats, including, you know, we should take into consideration differences in severity and scope of services across hospitals, and it didn't include professional fees and all of that. Uh, I recognize that. I just as you know, the board is in a position each year of having to approve, you know, commercial rates of hospitals, which definitely feed into uh, premium increases for consumers. Um, we don't often have basic information on costs, where they start, right? The hospitals ask us for rate increases, but we don't have as much information on the starting, on the base rates. Your, um, what you've submitted to us confidentially offers us a glimpse at some of that relative, you know, pricing that base. So I want to ask you if you would indulge me for a second and switch seats. You can be in the enviable position, and I put that in quotes for the quarter <laughs> of being a Green Mountain Care Board member. Um, and your job is to ensure that reimbursements are adequately, you know, reflecting underlying costs on delivering high quality, cost effective care, not being excessive, not promoting, you know, high cost, low value care. As you think about, you know, now you're in my shoes, as you think about the levers that we have in insurance rate review, in hospital budgets, even in the ACO budgets, what non-confidential data could we use, should we use, and what actions should we take to ensure that we're funding the healthcare system, right? Maintaining access to quality of care, bending the cost curve, and ensuring that these commercial prices are reasonable, not excessive, appropriate but cover the cost of care. Put yourself in my shoes. What data should we be using that we have access to that's public and what action should we be taking? Gosh. Um, yeah, so that's an intriguing question. The, the thing that, honestly, the thing that comes immediately to mind and I'm going um, gonna to show my naive because I know you you all spend hours on these sorts of things, but you know the I'm going back to your question about the national uh, benchmark or or comparisons. I think you said of, of reimbursement rates. You know there there might be an opportunity to just start start with a certain basket of services and say that um, you know if you're going to do these, then there's a, a reference based price for those, and and think about it next to. Medicare and Medicaid, but uh, I know that uh, as soon as those kinds of words are said, I, I'm sure there's providers out there that uh, would have issues with that. I think Vermont's healthcare system is unique in the sense that you know, we have a very locally oriented um, healthcare system, and that's why we love it. You know, we we want um, the local hospital to be serving the local needs, and we want um, the people in there their local communities to, to have the type of services that they need and, and uh, that just doesn't lend itself well to um, sort of setting prices or, or determining what the what the cost of those things ought to be because that each one kind of comes with a study. So um, as, a, as a quick off the top of my head answer, I think that's where I'd start, but I'm, I'm sure um, you know, looking at the, the, the Medicare and the Medicaid and commercial together um, rather than having the commercial be the balancing item, I think would be where I'd focus my energies. Okay, thank you. Those are all my questions, but if you do have follow-up on the benchmarks with, within the association yeah. nationally or regionally, that would be very helpful. I've got that. Thank one. you. Yeah. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mike. Um, good afternoon, Ms. Green. Um, just to follow up on uh, the beginning of the questioning that uh, uh, Jess just completed with. Um, have you ever run across any um, industry uh, articles that talk about what the premium, the appropriate premium would be for an academic medical center versus other settings? I have not, I personally have not. And to my knowledge, I don't think 
we have that. But uh, I'm sure just like Jess asked about the uh, try to reimbursement comparison nationally, uh, we might be able to to um, see if we have any of that. I can certainly take a follow up on that one as well. There was a recent YouTube uh, video from a physical therapist who practices at Central Vermont Medical Center and uh, part time and also at uh, the private facility in Essex, Vermont. And um, what she said, and I have no other foundation other than what was on that video, if it's accurate or not, but she's saying that um, it's 30 minutes at Central Vermont Medical Center that she's allocated for a patient, and she gets an extra 15 minutes um, when she's at the, the private uh, PT clinic, and yet um, the private clinic is reimbursed at a much lower rate than Central Vermont. And I'm just curious what your thoughts are on those payment differentials. Yeah, as I think Jessica mentioned, and uh, we provided in our uh, response to your questions that the price differentials in each uh, situation is intertwined with um, the collection of services that any particular um, practice or, or facility is, is offering, and they each come at it differently. So it's not surprising that we, we have such um, differing price differentials um, to be redundant. Um, but uh, it, it's sort of like um, these payment uh, levels have grown over time and then they've adapted for each facility's mix of business and volume of business and they they um, really would have to be sort of um, you know, thrown up in the air and start over kind of a thing to, to get some of those things to be exactly the same, especially in, in your comment, Chairman Mullen, I w wasn't sure was was this person comparing um, when you said private, was it Medicaid or Medicare, the public? Uh, commercial pay. So it was all commercial pay. So on that same uh, um, train of thought and uh, uh, say that sometime in the future, um, years from now, the board were to issue an order um, that uh, similarly situated providers. In other words, um, if you were a uh, PPS hospital, um, that you would be treated the same as your peers in Vermont. If the board were to issue an order that there could not be greater than, say, 20% variation um, in reimbursement to those, how hard would that be for a company like Blue Cross to implement that? It's It has to do with the motivation and engagement of the, the people involved in that change. So um, I think you that's a great way to kind of draw a picture of what that that would look like the the markets in Vermont are so unique that you'd have you'd have to have people in one end of the state talking about why resources should go to a, you know a practice or a facility in, at the other end of the state I, I think it would it would be very difficult to implement because of the just the um, getting aligned on what what the actual uh, result is, um, but you know it's an intriguing, intriguing idea. Okay, um, you were talking earlier in your testimony this afternoon about the class action lawsuits, um, both from the consumer end and the provider end, and the fact that the consumer end um, had been settled and that you had an eight point two million dollar obligation. Is that a final number? The settlement is the final number, um, and the uh, settlement itself is still in the process of being finalized legally. The thing that's um, uncertain at this point is the continued legal cost that it takes to to um, complete that work. So um, the, there's a little bit of uncertainty around those costs, but that's nowhere near the amount of money as the settlement itself. Is there in this uh, agreement that everybody has reached, is there any guarantee that Vermonters will receive a similar portion of the proceeds being distributed to consumers? 
that I can't speak to directly. I just know that the, um, the lawsuit process is uh, going through the process of notifying subscribers nationwide of, of this settlement and um, you know, do they do they we get them in the mail for other types of uh, class action lawsuits where you need to sort of check a box and, and sign up for it so I think that process is underway do you know if everyone who did business with Blue Cross Blue Shield during that time period will receive something in the mail I don't personally know the rules for which years and which segments are included in that um, but again, that's something that we can follow up with. It's a timely discussion because um, at lunchtime checking uh, emails, I uh, received an email from a member of the Green Mountain Care Board staff that received a call from a Vermonter who received a communication. I thought um, that it said email, but it might have been snail mail. Um, but in that uh, email that I received and uh, read, um, the Vermonter thought it was um, a scam and uh, wasn't going to uh, respond. Um, how do Vermonters know that um, it's a legitimate um, request of them for information and that they should respond versus doing what I would probably do and just assume it's a scam and just say, no way? Well, we, we can certainly, and I think we have um, made our service folks available. If the person wants to call, we can certainly follow up and see if they are on the list or if it is something that we're unaware of and therefore they should be more wary of it. Can you forward the email address that uh, they should be contacting or a phone number sure. that uh, we could give to people that uh, contact us? I'm sure the healthcare advocate would probably like it as well. It's possible that those are already out there, but I'll confirm um, who what the right email is and uh, who all is in the know about that. Super, I appreciate that. Thank you. That's the only questions I had. I did want to just clarify one um, thing actually before we move to potentially redirect. Ms. Green, this is about the 138-point uh, RBC impact in 2020 for the deficiency reserve accrual. Did I understand correctly that some of that's related to the rate guarantees that you mentioned in your pre-file testimony? Yes. And then did I understand correctly that some of it is also related to expected COVID costs that are not included in 2021 rates? True, yes. Have you calculated or has uh, Blue Cross calculated um, how much each of those components is contributing to that 138 point RBC impact? Yes, I can uh, give you that information in a moment. So the, the total is uh, well, I'll give you the dollar amounts and then we can, we can sort out the percentage uh, split, but the dollar amount is, uh, the total is 29.8 million and that was the number that um, they, Maureen calculated close at 28, but 29.8, 8.9 of that is the COVID um, related deficiency reserve and the balance is the other Okay. Contract thank you. commitments. Ms. AC, do you have any redirect for Ms. Green? Yes, uh, one question. Ms. Green, or one topic. Ms. Green, there was some discussion with board member Yusufer earlier about the um, pension fund contribution that was made by Blue Cross um, in 2020, it, um, as it was reflected in Exhibit 23. And I think you spoke to this in your pre-filed testimony. Um, can you go to your pre-filed testimony, Exhibit 19 at page 16? The exhibit page 16 or? Yes, the exhibit yeah. page 16. Yeah. Uh, the first bold, if you could um, read the first bolded question and the answer um, regarding the contribution. Sure. 
Has Blue Cross made any contributions to the pension fund since sustaining the losses? And if so, how much? The answer is we contributed 13 million to the pension plan on December 23rd. Our pension actuaries estimated those amounts to be sufficient for the plan to maintain its 80% adjusted funding target attainment percentage or AFTAP funding level for its January 1, 2022 valuation. Note that this contribution is a cash flow item with no RDC impact. Our RDC outlook already incorporates our pension funding obligations. The 13 million referenced there is part of the 15 million total contribution shown on exhibit 23, page 45. Right. And can you explain a little further why there's no RBC impact from the contribution itself? So the, the total RBC impact is calculated by looking at the all the asset values and the liability values, and then um, to the extent that there's a total overfunding or underfunding, that's what gets recorded in the balance sheet. So the the 13 million or the 15 million, whatever the cash contributions are that are made in a given period, are already sort of taken into account in that valuation adjustment. So it's it's that 13 million is not on top of the uh, 47 million. It's it's part of it. And the and the 13 million is not part of the 59 percent um, liability adjustment. The 13 million. To take it is not. It is not. Yes, true. I have nothing further at this time. Mr. Angoff, anything further uh, related to the, the redirect? Uh, no, sir. I think at this point uh, we should take a break. Um, come back at. Uh, Three twelve, um, and then talk about an executive session. Okay, so see you all in five minutes. Thank you. Kevin, um, hello. the The audio clipped out when you were telling the story before. I didn't hear what the what the animal was that was in the pipe. It was a chipmunk. Ah, uh, I'm glad it was safely rescued and released. Sounded just like a little puppy, though. We were staying in an Airbnb once in a pretty rural spot and a raccoon got stuck in like a weird crawl space in this house and it sounded like someone was being murdered. Oh, great. Yeah, it was it was nuts. We all like it was three in the morning. We all ran outside. You know, the people who own the Airbnb lived like a quarter mile away. We like ran to their house. We're like, what's going on? I was telling Kevin the other day that about we had two fisher cats kind of <laughs> just outside our backyard uh, screaming <laughs> the other night. It sounded like children being murdered. <laughs> yep. <laughs> One of the neighbors posted on Facebook that they spotted a mountain lion in our area. Oh, wow. Yeah. I feel like that's legitimately dangerous, Kevin, to have a mountain lion roaming around where you live. <laughs> Although it would be neat to see one. That's very true. Okay, so somebody went into the executive session prematurely, I think. Oh, Susan just started it. Never mind. <laughs> On Monday, we had somebody go to the wrong meeting. That's why I brought that up. <laughs> I'm great.
grateful for that, Kevin. <laughs> I didn't mention your name, Tom. <laughs> but every board member knows who you're talking about. <laughs> I don't, do we have Maureen, are you there? Yes. And is Ruth still with us? I am. Okay. And Kim, are you? Yes, us? I'm here. Great. Um, so potential executive session uh, to go into executive session, uh, there would have to be a motion that indicates the nature of the business of the executive session. Uh, I have heard, I think, two potential bases. Um, so let me just talk about those a little bit. The first one is uh, for, this is under, uh, 1 VSA 313 um, A6, which is records that are exempt from access to the public records provisions of uh, the Public Records Act. Um, there is a caveat with that uh, criteria, which is uh, that discussion of the exempt record uh, shall not itself permit an extension of the executive session to the general subject to which the record pertains. Uh, so, for example, you're, you're, we've granted confidentiality for uh, some aspects of RBC projections that would not allow you to discuss the general topic of RBC uh, in an executive session. Um, so, there, I've heard uh, that there are some questions relating to material that has been designated already as confidential in the binders and then I also heard uh, that there sh there would be a um, discussion of contracts uh, so the contracts exception uh, this is one VSA 313 a 1a uh, there needs to be a finding um, that premature general public knowledge would clearly place a person involved at a substantial disadvantage. Uh, I think Ms. AC laid some groundwork for such a finding, uh, as well as Ms. Green, uh, I believe in her pre-filed testimony. So, um, any questions about that before I suggest some potential motions? OK, would any member of the board uh, like to move to find that um, public knowledge of uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont's provider contract negotiations would place the company at a substantial disadvantage? Sure, I move we find that uh, premature public knowledge of Blue Cross Blue Shield's uh, provider contract negotiations would put them at a disadvantage. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Please let the record reflect that that was unanimous. And then I think the second uh, motion that would need to be made would be uh, to go into executive session to take testimony uh, regarding uh, contract negotiations between Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont and providers and uh, testimony about material that has been determined to be confidential in the exhibit binder. So I will move that we go into executive session to take testimony on uh, contract negotiations between Blue Cross and providers and to discuss uh, material that has been determined confidential. Is there a second to the motion? Second. May I ask a question? 
Yes. Since uh, um, the motion is clearly saying that it's been found to be confidential, um, what was the process for the finding? Was it just that somebody claimed that it was confidential or has it been agreed to by everyone that it's confidential? Uh, so material that has been uh, marked in the record as confidential. Um, there have been numerous confidentiality requests from Blue Cross. Each one of those um, have been evaluated by staff, um, legal department here at the board, and we have issued um, written determinations uh, with respect to each one of those items. Uh, and under the board's rules, that means we have a duty to protect the confidentiality of that information um, and that it can't be discussed in a, in a public setting. Does that answer your question? It does. Okay, so I think I heard a second to the motion. Uh, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Any opposed? Again, please let the record reflect that that was unanimous. Uh, I think the next order of business would be to determine who uh, needs to go to the executive session. Uh, the board has discretion uh, on that issue. Um, clearly all the board members, all the attorneys uh, for each of the parties are necessary. Ms. Green is necessary. I think we had discussed Paul Schultz as being necessary. Um, I always forget L and E. Uh, I would think would be necessary. Members of the board's rate review staff would be necessary. Um, Mike Fisher. Nice. Yeah, sorry. Uh, the court reporter. I <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, did I miss anyone? Uh, this is Bridget AC for Blue Cross. Uh, we would just like to have uh, Martine Brisson Lemieux, um, who's part of the actuarial team in the executive session. And I'm, you may have included her in the lawyers, but also Rebecca Heinz, who's the general counsel. Thank you. And I uh, didn't mention Mr. Fisher. Uh, I think that would be appropriate. Mr. Hearing Officer, this is Gavin Boyles in the General Counsel over at DFR, and if I would be permitted in the executive session, I'd appreciate it as well. Any objections to that? None from the HCA. No objection. I think that makes sense. Thank you. Okay, then uh, I would appreciate it if all those people would um, hang up from this call and join uh, the other call. Uh, and if anyone does not have the invite for that, please let me know now. And Christina, could you um, try and put up a, a message on this? Yes. Did we want to? a time roughly i no. don't know that that's, that's okay <laughs> it's okay just wanted to ask i will put up a sign okay thank you